Book Three, Chapter Eleven of Principles of Political Economy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill, abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin, Section 33. Chapter 11 of Excess of Supply, Section 1. The Theory of a General Oversupply of Commodities Stated. After the elementary exposition of the theory of money, contained in the last few chapters, we shall return to a question in the general theory of value, which could not be satisfactorily discussed until the nature and operations of money were in some measure understood, because the errors against which we have to contend mainly originate in a misunderstanding of those operations. Because the phenomenon of oversupply and consequent inconvenience or loss to the producer or dealer may exist in the case of any one commodity whatever, many persons, including some distinguished political economists, have thought it may exist with regard to all commodities, that there may be a general overproduction of wealth a supply of commodities in the aggregate surpassing the demand, and a consequent depressed condition of all classes of producers. The doctrine appears to me to involve so much inconsistency in its very conception that I feel considerable difficulty in giving any statement of it which shall be at once clear and satisfactory to its supporters. They agree in maintaining that there may be, and sometimes is, an excess of productions in general beyond the, the demand for them, that when this happens, purchasers cannot be found at prices which will repay the cost of production with a profit, that there ensues a general depression of prices or values, they are seldom accurate in discriminating between the two, so that producers, the more they produce, find themselves the poorer instead of richer. And Dr. Chalmers accordingly inculcates on capitalists the practice of a moral restraint in reference to the pursuit of gain, while Sismondi deprecate machinery and the various inventions which increase productive power. They both maintain that accumulation of capital may proceed too fast, not merely for the moral, but for the material interest of those who produce and accumulate, and they enjoin the rich to guard against this evil by an ample unproductive consumption. Section 2. The supply of commodities in general cannot exceed the power of purchase. When these writers speak of the supply of commodities as outrunning the demand, it is not clear which of the two elements of demand they have in view, the desire to possess or the means of purchase whether their meaning is that there are, in such cases, more consumable products in existence than the public desires to consume, or merely more than it is able to pay for. In this uncertainty, it is necessary to examine both suppositions. It will be here noticed that Mr. Mill uses demand in the sense for which we contended it should be used, Book 3, Chapter 1, Section 3, and not as quantity demand. The present discussion of overproduction should also be connected by the student with the former reference to it, 
Book One, Chapter Four, Section Two. First, let us suppose that the quantity of commodities produced is not greater than the community would be glad to consume. Is it, in that case, possible that there should be a deficiency of demand for all commodities for want of the means of payment? Those who think so cannot have considered what it is which constitutes the means of payment for commodities. It is simply commodities. Each person's means of paying for the productions of other people consists of those which he himself possesses. All sellers are inevitably and ex v termini buyers. Could we suddenly double the productive powers of the country, we should double the supply of commodities in every market. But we should, by the same stroke, double the purchasing power. Everybody would bring a double demand as well as supply. Everybody would be able to buy twice as much, because everyone would have twice as much to offer in exchange. It is probable, indeed, that there would now be a superfluity of certain things, although the community would willingly double its aggregate consumption. It may already have as much as it desires of some commodities, and it may prefer to do more than double its consumption of others, or to exercise its increased purchasing power on some new thing. If so, the supply will adapt itself accordingly, and the value of things will continue to conform to their cost of production. At any rate, it is a sheer absurdity that all things should fall in value, and that all producers should, in consequence, be insufficiently remunerated. If values remain the same, what becomes of prices is immaterial, since the remuneration of producers does not depend on how much money, but on how much of consumable articles they obtain for their goods. Besides, money is a commodity, and if all commodities are supposed to be doubled in quantity, we must suppose money to be doubled too and then prices would no more fall than values would. Section 3. There can never be a lack of demand arising from lack of desire to consume. A general oversupply, or excess of all commodities above the demand, so far as demand consists in means of payment, is thus shown to be an impossibility. But it may, perhaps, be supposed that it is not the ability to purchase, but the desire to possess that falls short, and that the general produce of industry may be greater than the community desires to consume, the part, at least, of the community which as an equivalent to give. This is much the more plausible form of the doctrine, and does not, like that which we first examined, involve a contradiction. There may easily be a greater quantity of any particular commodity than is desired by those who have the ability to purchase, and it is abstractly conceivable that this might be the case with all commodities. The error is in not perceiving that, though all who have an equivalent to give might be fully provided with every consumable article which they desire. The fact that they go on adding to the production proves that this is not actually the case. Assume the most favorable hypothesis for the purpose that of a limited community, every member of which possesses as much of necessities and of all known luxuries as he desired, and since it is not conceivable that persons whose wants were completely satisfied would labor and economize 
to obtain what they did not desire. Suppose that a foreigner arrives and produces an additional quantity of something of which there was already enough. Here, it will be said, is overproduction. True, I reply, overproduction of that particular article. The community wanted no more of that, but it wanted something. The old inhabitants, indeed, wanted nothing, but did not the foreigner himself want something? When he produced the superfluous article, was he laboring without a motive? He has produced but the wrong thing instead of the right. He wanted, perhaps, food, and has produced watches, with which everybody was sufficiently supplied. The newcomer brought with him into the country a demand for commodities equal to all that he could produce by his industry, and it was his business to see that the supply he brought should be suitable to that demand. If he could not produce something capable of exciting a new want or desire in the community, for the satisfaction of which someone would grow more food and give it to him in exchange, he had the alternative of growing food for himself, either on fresh land, if there was any unoccupied, or as a tenant, or partner, or servant of some former occupier, willing to be partially relieved from labor. He has produced a thing not wanted, instead of what was wanted, and he himself, perhaps, is not the kind of producer who is wanted. But there is no overproduction. Production is not excessive, but merely ill-assorted. We saw before that whoever brings additional commodities to the market brings an additional power of purchase. We see now that he brings also an additional desire to consume, since if he had not that desire, he would not have troubled himself to produce. Neither of the elements of demand, therefore, can be wanting when there is an additional supply, though it is perfectly possible that the demand may be for one thing, and the supply may unfortunately consist of another. It is not sufficiently borne in mind, also, that the whole progress of civilization results in a differentiation of new wants and desires. To take but a single instance, with the growth of the artistic sense, the articles of common use change their entire form, and the advances in the arts disclose new commodities which satisfy the world's desires, and for these new satisfactions people are willing to work and produce in order to attain them. With education also comes a wider horizon and a more refined perception of taste, which creates wants for new things for which the mind before had no desires. A little reflection, therefore, must inevitably lead us to see that no person, no community, ever had, or probably ever will have, all its wants satisfied. So far as we know man, it does not seem possible that there will ever be a falling off in demand because of a satiety of all material satisfactions. Section 4 origin and explanation of the notion of general oversupply. I have already described the state of the markets for commodities which accompanies what is termed a commercial crisis. At such times there is really an excess of all commodities above the money demand. In other words, there is an undersupply of money. From the sudden annihilation of a great mass of credit, everyone dislikes to part with ready money, and many are anxious to procure it at any sacrifice. 
Almost everybody, therefore, is a seller, and there are scarcely any buyers, so that there may really be, though only while the crisis lasts, an extreme depression of general prices from what may be indiscriminately called a glut of commodities or a dearth of money. But it is a great error to suppose, with Sismondi, that a commercial crisis is the effect of a general excess of production. It is simply the consequence of an excess of speculative purchases. It is not a gradual advent of low prices, but a sudden recoil from prices extravagantly high. Its immediate cause is a contraction of credit, and the remedy is not a diminution of supply, but the restoration of confidence. It is also evident that this temporary derangement of markets is an evil only because it is temporary. The fall being solely of money prices, if prices did not rise again, no dealer would lose, since the smaller price would be worth as much to him as the larger price was before. In no matter does this phenomenon answer to the description which these celebrated economists have given of the evil of overproduction. That permanent decline in the circumstances of producers for want of markets, which those writers contemplate, is a conception to which the nature of a commercial crisis gives no support. The other phenomenon from which the notion of a general excess of wealth and the superfluity of accumulation seems to derive countenance is one of a more permanent nature, namely the fall of profits and interest, which naturally takes place with the progression of population and production. The cause of this decline of profit is the increased cost of maintaining labor, which results from an increase of population and of the demand for food, outstripping the advance of agricultural improvement. This important feature in the economical progress of nations will receive full consideration and discussion in the succeeding book. It is obviously a totally different thing from a want of market for commodities, though often confounded with it in the complaints of the producing and trading classes. The true interpretation of the modern or present state of industrial economy is that there is hardly any amount of business which may not be done if people will content to do it on small profits, and this all active and intelligent persons in business perfectly well know. But even those who comply with the necessities of their time grumble at what they comply with, and wish that there were less capital, or, as they express it, less competition, in order that there might be greater profits. Low profits, however, are a different thing from deficiency of demand, and the production and accumulation, which merely reduce profits, cannot be called excess of supply or of production. What the phenomenon really is, and its effects and necessary limits, will be seen when we treat of that express subject. End of Book 3 Chapter 11book three chapter twelve of principles of political economy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill. Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Section 34. Chapter 12 of some peculiar cases of value section one values of commodities which have a joint cost of production the general laws of value in all the more important cases of the interchange of commodities in the same country have now been investigated we examine first the case of monopoly in which the value is determined by either a natural or an artificial limitation of quantity, that is, by demand and supply. Secondly, the case of free competition, when the article can be produced in indefinite quantity at the same cost, in which case the permanent value is determined by the cost of production, and only the fluctuations by supply and demand thirdly a mixed case that of the articles which can be produced in indefinite quantity but not at the same cost in which case the permanent value is determined by the greatest cost which it is necessary to incur in order to obtain the required supply and lastly we have found that money itself is a commodity of the third class, that its value in a state of freedom is governed by the same laws as the values of other commodities of its class, and that prices, therefore, follow the same laws as values. From this, it appears that demand and supply govern the fluctuations of values and prices in all cases and the permanent values and prices of all things of which the supply is determined by any agency other than of free competition but that under the regime of competition things are on the average exchanged for each other at such values and sold at such prices as afford equal expectation of advantage to all classes of producers which can only be when things exchange for one another in the ratio of their cost of production here again is a distinct recognition of the true meaning of cost of production and its ruling influence within the competing group which has been seen in its full significance by mr cairns it sometimes happens, however, that two different commodities have what may be termed a joint cost of production. They are both products of the same operation, or set of operations, and the outlay is incurred for the sake of both together, not part for one and part for the other. The same outlay would have to be incurred for either of the two, if the other were not wanted or used at all. There are not a few instances of commodities thus associated in their production. For example, coke and coal gas are both produced from the same material and by the same operation. In a more partial sense, mutton and wool are an example. Beef, hides, and tallow calves and dairy produce, chickens and eggs. Cost of production can have nothing to do with deciding the value of the associated commodities relative to each other. It only decides their joint value. Cost of production does not determine their prices, but the sum of their prices. A principle is wanting to apportion the expenses of production between the two. Since cost of production here fails us, we must revert to a law of value anterior to the cost of production, and more fundamental, the law 
of demand and supply. The law is that the demand for a commodity varies with its value, and that the value adjusts itself so that the demand shall be equal to the supply. This supplies the principle of repartition, which we are in quest of. Suppose that a certain quantity of gas is produced and sold at a certain price, and that the residuum of coke is offered at a price which, together with that of the gas, repays the expenses with the ordinary rate of profit. Suppose, too, that at the price put upon the gas and coke, respectively, the whole of the gas finds an easy market, without either surplus or deficiency, but that purchasers cannot be found for all the coke corresponding to it. The coke will be offered at a lower price in order to force the market, but this lower price, together with the price of the gas, will not be remunerating. The manufacturer as a whole will not pay its expenses with the ordinary profit and will not, on these terms, continue to be carried on. The gas, therefore, must be sold at a higher price to make up for the deficiency on the coke. The demand consequently contracting the production will be somewhat reduced, and prices will become stationary when, by the joint effect of the rise of gas and the fall of coke, so much less of the first is sold, and so much more of the second, that there is now a market for all the coke which results from the existing extent of the gas manufacture. Or, suppose the reverse case, that more coke is wanted at the present prices than can be supplied by the operations required by the existing demand for gas. Coke, being now in deficiency, will rise in price. The whole operation will yield more than the usual rate of profit, and additional capital will be attracted to the manufacture. The unsatisfied demand for coke will be supplied, but this cannot be done without increasing the supply of gas, too, and as the existing demand was fully supplied already, an increased quantity can only find a market by lowering the price. Equilibrium will be attained when the demand for each article fits so well with the demand for the other that the quantity required of each is exactly as much as is generated in producing the quantity required of the other. When, therefore, two or more commodities have a joint cost of production, their natural values relative to each other are those which will create a demand for each in the ratios of the quantities in which they are sent forth by the productive process. Section 2. Values of the different kinds of agricultural produce. Another case of value which merits attention is that of the different kinds of agricultural produce. The case would present nothing peculiar if different agricultural products were either grown indiscriminately and with equal advantage on the same soils or wholly on different soils. The difficulty arises from two things. First, that most soils are fitter for one kind of produce than another, without being absolutely unfit for any. And secondly, the rotation of crops. For simplicity, we will confine our supposition to two kinds of agricultural produce. For instance, wheat and oats. If all soils were equally adapted for wheat and for oats, both would be grown indiscriminately on all soils, and their relative cost of production, being the same everywhere, would govern their relative value. 
if the same labor which grows three quarters of wheat on any given soil would also grow on that soil five quarters of oats the three and five quarters would be of the same value the fact is that both wheat and oats can be grown on almost any soil which is capable of producing either it is evident that each grain will be cultivated in preference on the soils which are better adapted for it than for the other and if the, if the demand is supplied from these alone the values the two grains will have no reference to one another but when the demand for both is such as to require that each should be grown not only on the soils peculiarly fitted for it but on the medium soils which without being specifically adapted to either are about equally suited for both the cost of production on those medium soils will determine the relative value of the two grains while the rent of the soils specifically adapted to each will be regulated by their productive power considered with reference to that one grain alone to which they are peculiarly applicable thus far the question presents no difficulty to any one to whom the general principles of value are familiar it may happen however that the demand for one of the two as for example wheat may so outstrip the demand for the other as not only to occupy the soils specifically suited for wheat but to engross entirely those equally suitable to both and even encroach upon those which are better adapted to oaks to create an inducement for this unequal apportionment of the cultivation wheat must be relatively dearer and oats cheaper than according to the cost of their production on the medium land their relative value must be in proportion to the cost on that quality of land whatever it may be on which the comparative demand for the two grains requires both of them to be grown if from the state of demand the two cultivations meet on land more favorable to one than to the other that one will be cheaper and the other dearer in relation to each other and to things in general than if the proportional demand were as we at first supposed here then we obtain a fresh illustration in a somewhat different manner of the operation of demand not as an occasional disturber of value but as a permanent regulator of it conjoined with or supplementary to cost of production end of book three chapter twelve book three chapter thirteen of principles of political economy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2018. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill. Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Book 3, Chapter 13 of International Trade. Paragraph 1. Cost of Production Not a Regulator of International Values extension of the word international some things it is physically impossible to produce except in particular circumstances of heat soil water or atmosphere but there are many things which though they could be produced at home without difficulty and in any quantity are yet imported from a distance the explanation which would be popularly given of this would be that it is cheaper to import than to produce them, and this is the true reason. But this reason itself requires that a reason be given for it. 
of two things produced in the same place if one is cheaper than the other the reason is that it can be produced with less labor and capital or in a word at less cost is this also the reason as between things produced in different places are things never imported but from places where they can be produced with less labor or less of the other element of cost time than in the place to which they are brought does the law that permanent value is proportioned to cost of production hold good between commodities produced in distant places as it does between those produced in adjacent places we shall find that it does not a thing may sometimes be sold cheapest by being produced in some other place than that at which it can be produced with the smallest amount of labor and abstinence this could not happen between adjacent places if the north bank of the thames possessed an advantage over the south bank in the production of shoes no shoes would be produced on the south side the shoemakers would remove themselves and their capitals to the north bank or would have established themselves there originally for being competitors in the same market with those on the north side they could not compensate themselves for their disadvantage at the expense of the consumer the amount of it would fall entirely on their profits and they would not long content themselves with a smaller profit when by simply crossing a river they could increase it but between distant places and especially between different countries profits may continue different because persons do not usually remove themselves or their capitals to a distant place without a very strong motive if capital removed to remote parts of the world as readily and for as small an inducement as it moves to another quarter of the same town if people would transport their manufactories to america or china whenever they could save a small percentage in their expenses by it profits would be alike or equivalent all over the world and all things would be produced in the places where the same labor and capital would produce them in greatest quantity and of best quality a tendency may even now be observed towards such a state of things capital is becoming more and more cosmopolitan there is so much greater similarity of manners and institutions than formerly and so much less alienation of feeling among the more civilized countries that both population and capital now move from one of those countries to another on a much less temptation than heretofore but there are still extraordinary differences both of wages and of profits between different parts of the world between all distant places therefore in some degree but especially between different countries whether under the same supreme government or not there may exist great inequalities in the return to labor and capital without causing them to move from one place to the other in such quantity as to level those inequalities the capital belonging to a country will to a great extent remain in the country even if there be no mode of employing it in which it would not be more productive elsewhere yet even a country thus circumstanced might and probably would carry on trade with other countries it would export articles of some sort even to places which could make them with less labor than itself because those countries supposing them to have an advantage over it in all productions would have a greater advantage in some things than in others and would find it their interest to import the articles in which their advantage was smallest that they might employ more of their labor and capital on those in which it was greatest comment it might seem that a special theory of value is required for international trade as compared with domestic trade for the particular reason that in the former there exists no free movement of labor and capital from one trading country to another but we shall see that no new theory is necessary as before pointed out commodities exchange for each other at their relative costs whenever there is that free competition which ensures perfect facility of movement for labor and capital it has been usually assumed that capital and labor move freely as between different parts of the same country but not between different countries this however is not consistent with the facts we saw that there were non-competing industrial groups within the same nation 
Mr. Mill here, in a pointed way, suggests this, when he speaks of distant places. The addition, therefore, made to Mr. Mill's exposition by Mr. Cairns is that the word international, in default of a better term, should be applied to those conditions either within a country or between two countries, which, because of the actual immobility of labor and capital from one occupation to another, furnishes a substantial interference with industrial competition. The obstacles to the free movement of labor and capital which produce the conditions called international are 1. Geographical distance 2. Difference in political institutions 3. Difference in language, religion, and social customs, in a word, in forms of civilization. These differences exist between Maine and Montana, or even between two adjoining states, Ohio and Kentucky, one a free and the other an old slave state. Labor and capital have not in the past moved freely even across Mason and Dixon's line. There is, therefore, no treatment of international trade and values separate from the laws of value already laid down concerning non-competing groups, since there is also no free competition between all the industrial groups within a country. End of comment. Paragraph 2. Interchange of commodities between distant places determined by differences not in their absolute, but in the comparative costs of production. As I have said elsewhere after Ricardo, the thinker who has done most toward clearing up this subject, it is not a difference in the absolute cost of production which determines the interchange, but a difference in the comparative cost. It may be to our advantage to procure iron from Sweden in exchange for cottons, even although the mines of England as well as her manufactories should be more productive than those of Sweden, for if we have an advantage of one half in cottons, and only an advantage of a quarter in iron, and could sell our cottons to Sweden at the price which Sweden must pay for them if she produced them herself, we should obtain our iron with an advantage over Sweden of one half as well as our cottons. We may often, by trading with foreigners, obtain their commodities at a smaller expense of labor and capital than they cost to the foreigners themselves. The bargain is still advantageous to the foreigner, because the commodity which he receives in exchange, though it has cost us less, would have cost him more. Comment. This may be illustrated as follows. Articles interchanged. Cotton. England. Ten days' labor produces X yards. Sweden. Fifteen days' labor produces X yards articles interchanged iron england 12 days labor produces y hundredweights sweden 15 days labor produces y hundredweights here england has the advantage over sweden in both cotton and iron since she can produce x yards of cotton in 10 days labor to 15 days in sweden and y hundredweights of iron in 12 days labor to 15 days in sweden the ship which takes X yards of cotton to Sweden and there exchanges it, as may be done, for Y hundred weights of iron, brings back to England that which cost Sweden fifteen days' labor, while the cotton with which the iron was bought cost England only ten days' labor. So that England also got her iron at an advantage over Sweden of one half of ten days' labor, and yet England had an absolute advantage over Sweden in iron of a less amount, that is, of one-fourth of twelve days' labor. It is to be distinctly understood that by difference in comparative cost we mean a difference in the comparative cost of producing two or more articles in the same country, and not the difference of cost of the same article in the different trading countries. In this example, for instance, it is the difference in the comparative costs in England of both cotton and iron, not the different costs of cotton in England and Sweden, which gives the reason for the existence of the foreign trade. End of comment. 
To illustrate the cases in which interchange of commodities will not, and those in which it will, take place between two countries, the supposition may be made that the United States has an advantage over England in the production both of iron and of corn. It may first be supposed that the advantage is of equal amount in both commodities, the iron and the corn, each of which required 100 days labor in the United States, requiring each 150 days labor in England. It would follow that the iron of 150 days labor in England, if sent to the United States, would be equal to the iron of 100 days labor in the United States. If exchanged for corn, therefore, it would exchange for the corn of only 100 days labor. But the corn of 100 days labor in the United States was supposed to be the same quantity with that of 150 days labor in England. With 150 days labor in iron, therefore, England would only get as much corn in the United States as she could raise with 150 days labor at home, and she would, in importing it, have the cost of carriage besides. In these circumstances, no exchange would take place. In this case, the comparative costs of the two articles in England and in the United States were supposed to be the same, though the absolute costs were different, on which supposition we see that there would be no labor saved to either country by confining its industry to one of the two productions and importing the other. It is otherwise when the comparative and not merely the absolute costs of the two articles are different in the two countries. If, while the iron produced with 100 days labor in the United States was produced with 150 days labor in England, the corn which was produced in the United States with 100 days labor could not be produced in England with less than 200 days labor, an adequate motive to exchange would immediately arise. With a quantity of iron which England produced with 150 days labor, she would be able to purchase as much corn in the United States as was there produced with 100 days labor, but the quantity which was there produced with 100 days labor would be as great as the quantity produced in England with 200 days labor. By importing corn, therefore, from the United States, and paying for it with iron, England would obtain for 150 days labor what would otherwise cost her 200, being a saving of 50 days labor on each repetition of the transaction, and not merely a saving to England, but a saving absolutely, for it is not obtained at the expense of the United States, who, with corn that cost her 100 days labor, has purchased iron, which, if produced at home, would have cost her the same. The United States, therefore, on this supposition, loses nothing, but also she derives no advantage from the trade, the imported iron costing her as much as if it were made at home. To enable the United States to gain anything by the interchange, something must be abated from the gain of England. The corn produced in the United States by 100 days' labor must be able to purchase from England more iron than the United States could produce by that amount of labor more, therefore, than England could produce by 150 days' labor. England, thus obtaining the corn which would have cost her 200 days at a cost exceeding 150, though short of 200. England, therefore, no longer gains the whole of the labor which is saved to the two jointly by trading with one another. Comment the case in which both England and the United States would gain from the trade may be thus briefly shown. Articles interchanged. Corn. United States. 100 days labor produces X bushels. England. 200 days labor produces X bushels. Articles interchanged. Iron. United States. 125 days labor produces Y tons. England, 150 days' labor produces Y tons. The ship, which carries X bushels of corn from the United States to England, can there exchange it for at least Y tons of iron, costing England 150 days' labor, since X bushels in England would cost 200 days' labor, and bring it home, gaining for the United States the difference between the 100 days' labor in corn, paid for the Y tons of iron, 
and the 125 days which the iron would have cost here if produced at home. In this case the United States has an advantage over England in both corn and iron, but still an international trade will spring up, because the United States will derive again owing to the less cost of corn as compared with the cost of iron. Our comparative advantage is in corn. England, also, by sending to the United States y tons of iron, gets in return for it x bushels of corn. To produce the corn herself would have cost her 200 days labor, but she bought that corn by only 150 days labor spent on iron. England's comparative advantage is in iron. Then both countries will gain. Mr. Bowen gives an instance of international trade where one country has the advantage in both of the commodities entering into the exchange. The inhabitants of Barbados, favored by their tropical climate and fertile soil, can raise provisions cheaper than we can in the United States. And yet Barbados buys nearly all her provisions from this country. Why is this so? Because, though Barbados has the advantage over us in the ability to raise provisions cheaply, she has a still greater advantage over us in her power to produce sugar and molasses. If she has an advantage of one-fourth in raising provisions, she has an advantage of one-half in regard to products exclusively tropical, and it is better for her to employ all her labor and capital in that branch of production in which her advantage is greatest. She can thus, by trading with us, obtain our breadstuffs and meat at a smaller expense of labor and capital than they cost ourselves. If, for instance, a barrel of flour costs ten days labor in the United States and only eight days labor in Barbados, the people of Barbados can still profitably buy the flour from this country if they can pay for it with sugar, which costs them only six days labor and the people of this country can profitably sell them the flour, or buy from them the sugar, provided the sugar, if raised in the United States, would cost eleven days' labor. The United States receive sugar, which would have cost them eleven days' labor, by paying for it with flour which cost them but ten days. Barbados receives flour, which would have cost her eight days' labor, by paying for it with sugar, which costs her but six days. If Barbados produced both commodities with greater facility, but greater in precisely the same degree, there would be no motive for interchange. It may be said, however, that in practice no businessman considers the question of comparative cost in making shipments of goods abroad, that all he thinks of is whether the price here, for example, is less than it is in London. And yet, the very fact that the prices are less here implies that gold is of high value relatively to the given commodity, while in London, if money is to be sent back in payment, and if prices are high there, that implies that gold is there of less comparative value than commodities, and consequently that gold is the cheapest article to send to the United States. The doctrine, then, is as true of gold, or the precious metals, as it is of other commodities. It may be stated in the following language of Mr. Cairns. The proximate condition determining international exchange is the state of comparative prices in the exchanging countries as regards the commodities which form the subject of the trade. But comparative prices within the limits of each country are determined by two distinct principles, within the range of effective industrial competition by cost of production, outside that range, by reciprocal demand. End of comment. Paragraph 3. The direct benefits of commerce consist in increased efficiency of the productive powers of the world. From this exposition we perceive in what consists the benefit of international exchange, or, in other words, foreign commerce. Setting aside its enabling countries to obtain commodities which they could not themselves produce at all, its advantage consists in a more efficient employment of the productive forces of the world. If two countries which traded together attempted, as far as was physically possible, 
to produce for themselves what they now import from one another, the labor and capital of the two countries would not be so productive, the two together would not obtain from their industry so great a quantity of commodities as when each employs itself in producing, both for itself and for the other, the things in which its labor is relatively most efficient. The addition thus made to the produce of the two combined constitutes the advantage of the trade. It is possible that one of the two countries may be altogether inferior to the other in productive capacities, and that its labor and capital could be employed to greatest advantage by being removed bodily to the other. The labor and capital which have been sunk in rendering Holland habitable would have produced a much greater return if transported to America or Ireland. The produce of the whole world would be greater, or the labor less, than it is, if everything were produced where there is the greatest absolute facility for its production. But nations do not, at least in modern times, emigrate en masse, and, while the labor and capital of a country remain in the country, they are most beneficially employed in producing, for foreign markets as well as for its own, the things in which it lies under the least disadvantage, if there be none in which it possesses an advantage. Comment the fundamental ground on which all trade or all exchange of commodities rests is division of labor or separation of employments. Beyond the ordinary gain from division of labor arising from increased dexterity, there exist gains arising from the development of the special capacities or resources possessed by particular individuals or localities. International exchanges call out chiefly the special advantages offered by particular localities for the prosecution of particular industry. The only case indeed in which personal aptitudes go for much in the commerce of nations is where the nations concerned occupy different grades in the scale of civilization. The most striking example which the world has ever seen of a foreign trade determined by the peculiar personal qualities of those engaged in ministering to it is that which was furnished by the southern states of the american union previous to the abolition of slavery the effect of that institution was to give a very distinct industrial character to the laboring population of those states which unfitted them for all but a very limited number of occupations but gave them a certain special fitness for these Almost the entire industry of the country was consequently turned to the production of two or three crude commodities, in raising which the industry of slaves was found to be effective, and these were used, through an exchange with foreign countries, as the means of supplying the inhabitants with all other requisites. In the main, however, it would seem that this cause, personal aptitudes, does not go for very much in international commerce. In brief, then, international trade is but an extension of the principle of division of labor, and the gains to increased productiveness, arising from the latter, are exactly the same as those from the former. End of comment. Paragraph 4. Not in event for exports, nor in the gains of merchants. According to the doctrine now stated, the only direct advantage of foreign commerce consists in the imports. A country obtains things which it either could not have produced at all, or which it must have produced at a greater expense of capital and labor than the cost of the things which it exports to pay for them. It thus obtains a more ample supply of the commodities it wants, for the same labor and capital, or the same supply, for less labor and capital, leaving the surplus disposable to produce other things. The vulgar theory disregards this benefit, and deems the advantage of commerce to reside in the exports, as if not what a country obtains, but what it parts with, by its foreign trade, was supposed to constitute the gain to it. An extended market for its produce, an abundant consumption for its goods, a vent for its surplus, are the phrases by which it has been customary to designate the uses and recommendations of commerce with foreign countries. 
this notion is intelligible when we consider that the authors and leaders of opinion on mercantile questions have always hitherto been the selling class it is in truth a surviving relic of the mercantile theory according to which money being the only wealth selling or in other words exchanging goods for money was to countries without minds of their own the only way of growing rich and importation of goods that is to say parting with money was so much subtracted from the benefit the notion that money alone is wealth has been long defunct but it has left many of its progeny behind it adam smith's theory of the benefit of foreign trade was that it afforded an outlet for the surplus produce of a country and enabled a portion of the capital of the country to replace itself with a profit the expression surplus produce seems to imply that a country is under some kind of necessity of producing the corn or cloth which it exports so that the portion which it does not itself consume if not wanted and consumed elsewhere would either be produced in sheer waste or if it were not produced the corresponding portion of capital would remain idle and the mass of productions in the country would be diminished by so much either of these suppositions would be entirely erroneous the country produces an exportable article in excess of its own wants from no inherent necessity but as the cheapest mode of supplying itself with other things if prevented from exporting this surplus it would cease to produce it and would no longer import anything being unable to give an equivalent but the labor and capital which had been employed in producing with a view to exportation would find employment in producing those desirable objects which were previously brought from abroad or if some of them could not be produced in producing substitutes for them these articles would of course be produced at a greater cost than that of the things with which they had previously been purchased from foreign countries but the value and price of the articles would rise in proportion and the capital would just as much be replaced with the ordinary profit from the returns as it was when employed in producing for the foreign market the only losers after the temporary inconvenience of the change would be the consumers of their heretofore imported articles who would be obliged either to do without them consuming in lieu of them something which they did not like as well or to pay a higher price for them than before if it be said that the capital now employed in foreign trade could not find employment in supplying the home market i might reply that this is the fallacy of general overproduction discussed in a former chapter but the thing is in this particular case too evident to require an appeal to any general theory we not only see that the capital of the merchant would find employment but we see what employment there would be employment created equal to that which would be taken away exportation ceasing importation to an equal value would cease also and all that part of the income of the country which had been expended in imported commodities would be ready to expend itself on the same things produced at home or on others instead of them commerce is virtually a mode of cheapening production and in all such cases the consumer is the person ultimately benefited the dealer in the end is sure to get his profit whether the buyer obtains much or little for his money comment a converso if for any reason such as a removal of duties capital should be withdrawn from the production of articles consumed at home and imported commodities should entirely take their place the very importation of the foreign commodities would imply that an increased corresponding production was going on in this country with which to pay for the imported goods the capital thus thrown out of employment in an industry in which we had no comparative advantage when competition became free would necessarily be employed in the industries in which we had an advantage and would supply and the transferred capital would be the only means of supplying the commodities which would be sent abroad to pay for those which by the supposition are now imported but were formerly produced at home the result is a greater productiveness of industry 
and so a greater sum from which both labor and capital may be rewarded. Whenever capital, unrestrained by artificial support, leaves one employment as unprofitable, it means that that employment is naturally, and in itself, less productive than the usual run of other industries in the country, and so less profitable to both labor and capital than the majority of other occupations. End of comment. Paragraph 5. Indirect benefits of commerce, economical and moral, still greater than the direct. Such, then, is the direct economical advantage of foreign trade. But there are, besides, indirect effects, which must be counted as benefits of a high order. 1. One is the tendency of every extension of the market to improve the processes of production. A country which produces for a larger market than its own can introduce a more extended division of labor, can make greater use of machinery, and is more likely to make inventions and improvements in the processes of production. Whatever causes a greater quantity of anything to be produced in the same place tends to the general increase of the productive powers of the world. There is, too, another consideration, principally applicable to an early stage of industrial advancement. The opening of a foreign trade, by making them acquainted with new objects, or tempting them by the easier acquisition of things which they had not previously thought attainable, sometimes works a sort of industrial revolution in a country whose resources were previously undeveloped for want of energy and ambition in the people, inducing those who were satisfied with scanty comforts and little work to work harder for the gratification of their new tastes, and even to save and accumulate capital for the still more complete satisfaction of those tastes at a future time. But, three, the economical advantages of commerce are surpassed in importance by those of its effects which are intellectual and moral. It is hardly possible to overrate the value, in the present low state of human improvement, of placing human beings in contact with persons dissimilar to themselves, and with modes of thought and action unlike those with which they are familiar. Commerce is now, what war once was, the principal source of this contact. Such communication has always been, and is peculiarly in the present age, one of the primary sources of progress. Finally, four, commerce first taught nations to see with goodwill the wealth and prosperity of one another. Before, the patriot, unless sufficiently advanced in culture to feel the world his country, wished all countries weak, poor, and ill-governed but his own. He now sees in their wealth and progress a direct source of wealth and progress to his own country. It is commerce which is rapidly rendering war obsolete by strengthening and multiplying the personal interests which are in natural opposition to it. And it may be said without exaggeration that the great extent and rapid increase of international trade in being the principal guarantee of the peace of the world is the great permanent security for the uninterrupted progress of the ideas, the institutions, and the character of the human race. End of Book 3, Chapter 13Book 3, Chapter 14 of Principles of Political Economy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2018. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill, abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Book 3, Chapter 14 of international values. Paragraph 1. The values of imported commodities depend on the terms of international interchange. The values of commodities produced at the same place, or in places sufficiently adjacent for capital to move freely between them, let us say for simplicity, of commodities produced in the same country, depend, temporarily fluctuations apart, 
upon their cost of production. But the value of a commodity brought from a distant place, especially from a foreign country, does not depend on its cost of production in the place from whence it comes. On what, then, does it depend? The value of a thing in any place depends on the cost of its acquisition in that place, which, in the case of an imported article, means the cost of production of the thing which is exported to pay for it. If, then, the United States imports wine from Spain, giving for every pipe of wine a bale of cloth, the exchange value of a pipe of wine in the United States will not depend upon what the production of the wine may have cost in Spain, but upon what the production of the cloth has cost in the United States. Though the wine may have cost in Spain the equivalent of only ten days' labor, yet, if the cloth costs in the United States twenty days' labor, the wine, when brought to the United States, will exchange for the produce of twenty days' American labor, plus the cost of carriage, including the usual profit on the importer's capital during the time it is locked up and withheld from other employment. The value, then, in any country, of a foreign commodity, depends on the quantity of home produce which must be given to the foreign country in exchange for it. In other words, the values of foreign commodities depend on the terms of international exchange. What, then, do these depend upon? What is it which, in the case supposed, causes a pipe of wine from Spain to be exchanged with the United States for exactly that quantity of cloth? We have seen that it is not their cost of production. If the cloth and the wine were both made in Spain, they would exchange at their cost of production in Spain. If they were both made in the United States, they would, possibly, exchange at their cost of production in the United States. But all the cloth being made in the United States, and all the wine in Spain, they are in circumstances to which we have already determined that the law of cost of production is not applicable. We must accordingly, as we have done before in a similar embarrassment, fall back upon an antecedent law, that of supply and demand, and in this we shall again find the solution of our difficulty. Paragraph 2 the values of foreign commodities depend not upon cost of production, but upon reciprocal demand and supply. Comment It has been previously explained that the conditions called international are those, either within a nation or those existing between two separate nations, which are such as to prevent the free movement of labor and capital from one group of industries to another, or from one locality to another distant one. Even if woolen cloth could be made cheaper in England than in the United States, we know that neither capital nor labor would easily leave the United States for England, although it might go from Rhode Island to Massachusetts under similar inducements. If shoes can be made with less advantage in Providence than in Lynn, the shoe industry will come to Lynn, but it does not follow that the English shoe industry would come to Lynn, even if the advantages of the latter were greater than those in England. If there be no obstacle to the free movement of labor and capital between places or occupations, and if some place or occupation can produce at a less cost than another place or occupation, then there will be a migration of the instruments of production. Since there is no free movement of labor and capital between one country and another, then two countries stand in the same relation as that of two non-competing groups within the same country as before explained. When this fact is once fully grasped, the subject of international values becomes very simple. It does not differ from the question of those domestic values for which we found that the dependence on cost of production would not hold, but that their values were governed by reciprocal demand and supply. Attention should be drawn to the real nature of the present inquiry. It is not here a question as to what causes international trade between two countries. That has been treated in the preceding chapter and has been found to be a difference in the comparative cost. The question now is one of exchange value, that is, for how much of other commodities a given commodity will exchange. The reasons for the trade are supposed to exist, 
but we now want to know what the law is which determines the proportions of the exchange why does one article exchange for more or less of another not as we have seen because one costs more or less to produce than the other in the trade between the united states and england in iron and corn formerly referred to it was seen that a one hundred days labor of corn buys from england iron which would have cost the united states one hundred twenty five days labor england sends one hundred fifty days labor of iron and buys from the united states corn which would have cost her two hundred days labor but what rule fixes the proportions between one hundred and one hundred twenty five for the united states and between one hundred fifty and two hundred for england at which the exchanges will take place the trade increases the productiveness of both countries but in what ratio will the two countries share this gain the answer is briefly in the ratio set by reciprocal demand and supply that is the relative strength as compared with each other of the demands of the two countries respectively for iron and corn this however may be capable of explanation in a simple form a has spades and b has oats to dispose of and each wishes to get the article belonging to the other will a give one spade for one bushel of oats or for two will b give two bushel of oats for one spade that depends upon how strong a desire a has for oats the intensity of his demand may induce him to give two spades for one bushel but the exchange also depends upon b if he has no great need for spades and a has a strong desire for oats b will get more spades for oats than otherwise possibly two spades for one bushel of oats that is oats will have a larger exchange value if on the other hand a cares less for oats than b does for spades then the exchange will result in an increased value of spades relatively to oats when two commodities exchange against each other their exchange values will depend entirely upon the relative intensity of the demand on each side for the other commodity and this simple form of the statement of reciprocal demand and supply is also the law of international values if instead of spades and oats we substitute iron and corn and let the trade be between england and the united states the quantity of corn required to buy a given quantity of iron will depend upon the relative demands of england for corn and of the united states for iron something may cut off england's demand from our breadstuffs and they will then have a less exchange value relatively to iron if we keep up our demand and their prices will fall but if on the other hand england has poor harvests and consequently a great demand for corn and if our demand for iron is not excessive at the same time then our breadstuffs will rise in value and this was precisely what happened from eighteen seventy seven to eighteen seventy nine now in the above illustration of corn and iron how can we know whether or not x bushels of corn the produce of one hundred days labor in the united states will exchange for exactly y tons of english iron that again will depend upon the reciprocal demands of the two countries for corn and iron respectively moreover it will have been already observed that the ratio of exchange is not capable of being ascertained exactly since it varies with changing conditions namely the desires of the people of the two countries together with their means of purchase but yet these variations are capable of ascertainment as regards their extreme limits the reciprocal demand cannot carry the exchange value in either country beyond the line set by the cost of production of the article for instance an urgent need in england for corn if the united states has a light demand for english iron cannot carry the ratio of exchange to a point such that england will offer so much more than one hundred fifty days labor in iron for x bushels of american corn that it will go beyond two hundred days labor in iron it will be seen at once then if that were the case that england would produce the corn herself and that she would then have no gain whatever from the trade the ratio of exchange will thus be limited by the reciprocal demand on one side 
to the cost of production, 200 days' labor, of English corn. On the other hand, if the supposition were reversed, and the United States had a great demand for iron, but England had little need for our corn, then we would not offer more than 125 days' labor of corn for y tons of iron, because for that expenditure of labor we could produce the iron ourselves. In the above examples we have considered the case of a trade in corn and iron only. If corn were to typify all our goods wanted by England, and iron all the English goods wanted by the United States, the conclusions would be exactly the same. The ratios of a myriad of things, each governed by its particular reciprocal demand, exchanging against each other, give a general result by which the goods sent out exchange against the goods brought back at such rates as are fixed by the reciprocal demands acting on all the goods. Goods are payments for goods. The ratio of exchange depends on reciprocal demand and supply. If we now add more countries to the example, we simply increase the number of persons, although in different countries, wanting our goods, as set off against our demands for the goods of this greater number of persons. If France, Germany, and England all want our corn, we must have some demand for the goods of France, Germany, and England also, and the same law of reciprocal demand gives the ratio of interchange. That this explanation is consistent with the facts is to be seen when we notice how eagerly the exporters of American staples watch the conditions which increase or diminish the foreign demand for these commodities, looking at them as the causes which directly affect their interchange value or price. End comment. When cost of carriage is added, it will increase the price of corn to England and of iron to the United States. But, as everyone knows, an increase of price affects the demand, and, as the demand on each side is affected, a new ratio of exchange will finally be reached consistent with the strength of desires on each side. Who, therefore, will pay the most of the cost of carriage, England or the United States? That will, again, depend on whether England has the greatest relative demand for American goods as compared with the demand of the United States for English goods. No absolute rule, therefore, can be laid down for the division of the cost, no more than for the division of the advantage, and it does not follow that, in whatever ratio the one is divided, the other will be divided in the same. It is impossible to say if the cost of carriage could be annihilated whether the producing or the importing country would be most benefited. That would depend on the play of international demand. Cost of carriage has one effect more. But for it, every commodity would, if trade be supposed free, be either regularly imported or regularly exported. A country would make nothing for itself which it did not also make for other countries. But in consequence of cost of carriage, there are many things, especially bulky articles, which every, or almost every, country produces within itself. After exporting the things in which it can employ itself most advantageously, and importing those in which it is under the greatest disadvantage, there are many lying between, of which the relative cost of production in that and in other countries differs so little that the cost of carriage would absorb more than the whole saving in cost of production which would be obtained by importing one and exporting another. This is the case with numerous commodities of common consumption, including the coarser qualities of many articles of food and manufacture, of which the finer kinds are the subject of extensive international traffic. Paragraph 3 As illustrated by trading cloth and linen between England and Germany. Comment Mr. Mill still further illustrates the operation of the law of reciprocal demand by the case of a trade between England and Germany in cloth and linen as follows. End comment. Suppose that 10 yards of broadcloth cost in England as much labor as 15 yards of linen, and in Germany as much as 20. This supposition then being made, 
it would be the interest of england to import linen from germany and of germany to import cloth from england when each country produced both commodities for itself ten yards of cloth exchanged for fifteen yards of linen in england and for twenty in germany they will now exchange for the same number of yards of linen in both for what number if for fifteen yards england will be just as she was and germany will gain all if for twenty yards germany will be as before and england will derive the whole of the benefit if for any number intermediate between fifteen and twenty the advantage will be shared between the two countries if for example ten yards of cloth exchange for eighteen of linen england will gain an advantage of three yards on every fifteen germany will save two out of every twenty the problem is what are the causes which determine the proportion in which the cloth of england and the linen of germany will exchange for each other let us suppose then that by the effect of what adam smith calls the higgling of the market ten yards of cloth in both countries exchange for seventeen yards of linen the demand for a commodity that is the quantity of it which can find a purchaser varies as we have before remarked according to the price in germany the price of ten yards of cloth is now seventeen yards of linen or whatever quantity of money is equivalent in germany to seventeen yards of linen now that being the price there is some particular number of yards of cloth which will be in demand or will find purchasers at that price there is some given quantity of cloth more than which could not be disposed of at that price less than which at that price would not fully satisfy the demand let us suppose this quantity to be one thousand times ten yards let us now turn our attention to england there the price of seventeen yards of linen is ten yards of cloth or whatever quantity of money is equivalent in england to ten yards of cloth there is some particular number of yards of linen which at that price will exactly satisfy the demand and no more let us suppose that this number is one thousand times seventeen yards as seventeen yards of linen are to ten yards of cloth so are one thousand times seventeen yards to one thousand times ten yards at the existing exchange value the linen which england requires will exactly pay for the quantity of cloth which on the same terms of interchange germany requires the demand on each side is precisely sufficient to carry off the supply on the other the conditions required by the principle of demand and supply are fulfilled and the two commodities will continue to be interchanged as we supposed them to be in the ratio of seventeen yards of linen for ten yards of cloth but our suppositions might have been different suppose that at the assumed rate of interchange england had been disposed to consume no greater quantity of linen than eight hundred times seventeen yards it is evident that at the rate supposed this would not have sufficed to pay for the one thousand times ten yards of cloth which we have supposed germany to require at the assumed value germany would be able to procure no more than eight hundred times ten yards at that price to procure the remaining two hundred which she would have no means of doing but by bidding higher for them she would offer more than seventeen yards of linen in exchange for ten yards of cloth let us suppose her to offer eighteen at this price perhaps england would be inclined to purchase a greater quantity of linen she would consume possibly at that price nine hundred times eighteen yards on the other hand cloth having risen in price the demand of germany for it would probably have diminished if instead of one thousand times ten yards she is now contented with nine hundred times ten yards these will exactly pay for the nine hundred times eighteen yards of linen which england is willing to take at the altered price the demand on each side will again exactly suffice to take off the corresponding supply and ten yards for eighteen will be the rate at which in both countries cloth will exchange for linen 
The converse of all this would have happened if, instead of 800 times 17 yards, we had supposed that England, at the rate of 10 for 17, would have taken 1,200 times 17 yards of linen. In this case, it is England whose demand is not fully supplied. It is England who, by bidding for more linen, will alter the rate of interchange to her own disadvantage, and ten yards of cloth will fall, in both countries, below the value of seventeen yards of linen. By this fall of cloth, or, what is the same thing, this rise of linen, the demand of Germany for cloth will increase, and the demand of England for linen will diminish, till the rate of interchange has so adjusted itself that the cloth and the linen will exactly pay for one another, and, when once this point is attained, values will remain without further alteration. Paragraph 4. The conclusion states in the equation of international demand. It may be considered, therefore, as established, that when two countries trade together in two commodities, the exchange value of these commodities relatively to each other will adjust itself to the inclinations and circumstances of the consumers of both sides, in such manner that the quantities required by each country, of the articles which it imports from its neighbour, shall be exactly sufficient to pay for one another. As the inclinations and circumstances of consumers cannot be reduced to any rule, so neither can the proportions in which the two commodities will be interchanged. We know that the limits within which the variation is confined are the ratio between their costs of production in the one country and the ratio between their costs of production in the other. Ten yards of cloth cannot exchange for more than twenty yards of linen, nor for less than fifteen. But they may exchange for any intermediate number. The ratios, therefore, in which the advantage of the trade may be divided between the two nations are various. The circumstances on which the proportionate share of each country more remotely depends admit only of a very general indication. If, therefore, it be asked what country draws to itself the greatest share of the advantage of any trade it carries on, the answer is, the country for whose productions there is in other countries the greatest demand, and a demand the most susceptible of increase from additional cheapness. In so far as the productions of any country possess this property, the country obtains all foreign commodities at less cost. It gets its imports cheaper, the greater the intensity of the demand in foreign countries for its exports. It also gets its imports cheaper, the less the extent and intensity of its own demand for them. The market is cheapest to those whose demand is small. A country which desires new foreign productions, and only a limited quantity of them, while its own commodities are in great request in foreign countries, will obtain its limited imports at extremely small cost, that is, in exchange for the produce of a very small quantity of its labour and capital. The law which we have now illustrated may be appropriately named the equation of international demand. It may be concisely stated as follows. The produce of a country exchanges for the produce of other countries at such values as are required in order that the whole of her exports may exactly pay for the whole of her imports. This law of international values is but an extension of the more general law of value, which we called the equation of supply and demand. We have seen that the value of a commodity always so adjusts itself as to bring the demand to the exact level of the supply. But all trade, either between nations or individuals, is an interchange of commodities, in which the things that they respectively have to sell constitute also their means of purchase. The supply brought by the one constitutes his demand for what is brought by the other. So that supply and demand are but another expression for reciprocal demand, and to say that value will adjust itself so as to equalize demand with supply is, in fact, to say that it will adjust itself so as to equalize the demand on one side with the demand on the other. Comment. 
The tendency of imports to balance exports may be seen from chart number 13 on the next page, which shows the relation between the exports and imports solely of merchandise and exclusive of species to and from the United States. From 1850 to 1860, after the discoveries of the precious metals in this country, we sent great quantities of gold and silver out of the country purely as merchandise, so that, if we should include the precious metals among the exports in those years, the total exports would more nearly equal the total imports. The transmission of gold at that time was effected exactly as that of other merchandise, so that to the date of the Civil War there was a very evident equilibrium between exports and imports. Then came the war, with the period of extravagance and speculation following, which led to great purchases abroad, and which was closed only by the Panic of 1873. Since then, more exports than imports were needed to pay for the great purchases of the former period, and the epoch of great exports, from 1875 to 1883, balanced the opposite conditions in the period preceding. It would seem, therefore, that we had reached a normal period about the year 1882. A fuller statement as to the fluctuation of exports and imports about the equilibrium will be given when the introduction of money in international trade is made. The full statement must also include the financial account. End comment. Paragraph 5. The cost to a country of its imports depends not only on the ratio of exchange, but on the efficiency of its labor. We now pass to another essential part of the theory of the subject. There are two senses in which a country obtains commodities cheaper by foreign trade, in the sense of value and in the sense of cost. One, it gets them cheaper in the first sense by their falling in value relatively to other things, the same quantity of them exchanging in the country for a smaller quantity than before of the other produce of the country. To revert to our original figures of the trade with Germany in cloth and linen, in England all consumers of linen obtained after the trade was opened 17 or some greater number of yards for the same quantity of all other things for which they before obtained only 15. The degree of cheapness, in this sense of the term, depends on the laws of international demand, so copiously illustrated in the preceding sections. 2. But, in the other sense, that of cost, a country gets a commodity cheaper when it obtains a greater quantity of the commodity with the same expenditure of labor and capital. In this sense of the term, cheapness in a great measure depends upon a cause of a different nature. A country gets its imports cheaper in proportion to the general productiveness of its domestic industry, to the general efficiency of its labor. The labor of one country may be, as a whole, much more efficient than that of another. All or most of the commodities capable of being produced in both may be produced in one at less absolute cost than in the other, which, as we have seen, will not necessarily prevent the two countries from exchanging commodities. The things which the more favored country will import from others are, of course, those in which it is least superior, but by importing them it acquires, even in those commodities, the same advantage which it possesses in the articles it gives in exchange for them. What her imports cost to her is a function of two variables. One, the quantity of her own commodities which she gives for them, and two, the cost of those commodities. Of these, the last alone depends on the efficiency of her labor. The first depends on the law of international values, that is, on the intensity and extensibility of the foreign demand for her commodities, compared with her demand for foreign commodities. Comment. The great productiveness of any industry in our country has thus two results. One, it gives a larger total out of which labor and capital at home can receive greater rewards, and two, the commodities being cheaper in comparison than other commodities not so easily produced, furnish the very articles which are most likely to be sent abroad, 
in accordance with the doctrine of comparative cost. In the United States, those things in the production of which labor and capital are most efficient, and so earn the largest rewards, are precisely the articles entering most largely into our foreign trade. That is, we get foreign articles cheaper, precisely because these exports cost us less in labor and capital. These, of course, since we inhabit a country whose natural resources are not yet fully worked, are largely the products of the extractive industries, as may be seen by the following table of the value of goods entering to the greatest extent into our foreign export trade in 1883. Raw cotton, $247,328,721. Breadstuffs, $208,040,850. Provisions and animals, one hundred eighteen million one hundred seventy seven thousand five hundred fifty five dollars mineral oils forty million five hundred fifty five thousand four hundred ninety two dollars wood twenty six million seven hundred ninety three thousand seven hundred and eight dollars tobacco twenty two million ninety five thousand two hundred twenty nine dollars these six classes of commodities are arranged in the order in which they enter into our export trade and are the six which come first and highest in the list end comment end of book three chapter fourteen book three chapter fifteen of principles of political economy this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Decker. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill, abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Of Money Considered as an Imported Commodity. Section 1. Money Imported on Two Modes. As a Commodity and as a medium of exchange. The degree of progress to which we have now made in the theory of foreign trade puts it in our power to supply what was previously deficient in our view of the theory of money. And this, when completed, will in its turn enable us to conclude the subject of foreign trade. Money, or the material of which it is composed, is, in Great Britain, and in most other countries, a foreign commodity. Its value and distribution must therefore be regulated, not by the law of value which obtains in adjacent places, but by that which is applicable to imported commodities, the law of international values. In the discussion into which we are now about to enter, I shall use the terms money and the precious metals indiscriminately. This may be done without leading to any error, it having been shown that the value of money, when it consists of the precious metals or of a paper currency convertible into them on demand, is entirely governed by the value of the metals themselves, from which it never permanently differs except by the expense of coinage, when this is paid by the individual and not by the state. Money is brought into a country in two different ways. It is imported, chiefly in the form of bullion, like any other merchandise, as being an advantageous article of commerce. It is also imported in its other character of a medium of exchange to pay some debt due to the country either for goods exported or in any other account. The existence of these two distinct modes in which money flows into a country, while other commodities are habitually introduced only in the first of these modes, occasions somewhat more of complexity and obscurity than exist in the case of other commodities, and for this reason only is any special and minute exposition necessary. Section 2. As a commodity, it obeys the same laws of value as other imported commodities. Insofar as the precious metals are imported in the ordinary way of commerce, their value must depend on the same causes and conform to the same laws as the value of any other foreign production. It is in this mode chiefly that gold and silver diffuse themselves from the mining countries into all other parts of the commercial world. They are the staple commodities of those countries, or at least are among their great articles of regular export, and are shipped on speculation in the same manner as other exportable commodities. 
The quantity, therefore, which a country, say England, will give of its own produce for a certain quantity of bullion will depend, if we suppose only two countries and two commodities, upon the demand in England for bullion, compared with the demand in the mining country, which we will call the United States, for what England has to give. The bullion required by England must exactly pay for the cottons or other English commodities required by the United States. If, however, we substitute for this simplicity the degree of complication which really exists, the equation of international demand must be established not between the bullion wanted in England and the cottons or broadcloth wanted in the United States, but between the whole of the imports of England and the whole of her exports. The demand in foreign countries for English products must be brought into equilibrium with the demand in England for the products of foreign countries, and all foreign commodities, bullion among the rest, must be exchanged against English products in such proportion as will, by the effect they produce on the demand, establish this equilibrium. There is nothing in the peculiar nature or uses of the precious metals which should make them an exception to the general principles of demand. So far as they are wanted for purposes of luxury or the arts, the demand increases with the cheapness in the same irregular way as the demand for any other commodity. So far as they are required for money, the demand increases with the cheapness in a perfectly regular way, the quantity needed being always in inverse proportion to the value. This is the only real difference in respect to demand between money and other things. Money then, if imported solely as a merchandise, will, like other imported commodities, be of lowest value in the countries for whose exports there is the greatest foreign demand, and which have themselves the least demand for foreign commodities. To these two circumstances it is, however, necessary to add two others, which produce their effect through the cost of carriage. The cost of obtaining bullion is compounded of two elements, the goods given to purchase it and the expense of transport of which last the bullion countries will bear a part, though an uncertain part, in the adjustment of international values. The expense of transport is partly that of carrying the goods to the bullion countries and partly that of bringing back the bullion. Both of these items are influenced by the distance from the mines, and the former is also much affected by the bulkiness of the goods. Countries whose exportable produce consists of the finer manufacturers obtain bullion, as well as all other foreign articles, Caterus paribus at less expense than countries which export nothing but bulky raw produce. To be quite accurate, therefore, we must say, the countries whose exportable productions, one, are most in demand abroad, and two, contain greatest value in smallest bulk, three, which are nearest to the mines, and four, which have the least demand for foreign productions, are those in which money will be of lowest value, or in other words, in which prices will habitually range the highest. If we are speaking not of the value of money, but of its cost, that is, the quantity of the country's labor which must be expended to obtain it, we must add five to these four conditions of cheapness a fifth condition, namely, whose productive industry is the most efficient. This last, however, does not at all affect the value of money estimated in commodities. It affects the general abundance and facility with which all things, money and commodities together, can be obtained. The accompanying chart, number 15, on the next page, gives the excess of exports from the United States of gold and silver coin and bullion over imports, and the excess of imports over exports. The movement of the line above the horizontal baseline shows distinctly how largely we have been sending the precious metals abroad from our mines simply as a regular article of export, like merchandise. From 1850 to 1879, the exports are clearly not in the nature of payments for trade balances, since it indicates a steady movement out of the country, with the exception of the first year of the war, when gold came to this country. The phenomenal increase of specie imports during the war, and until 1879, was due to the fact that we had a depreciated paper currency, which sent the metals out of the country as merchandise. This chart should be studied in connection with Chart 13. Chart 15 chart showing the excess of exports and imports of gold and silver coin and bullion from and into the United States from 1835 to 1883. The line when above the baseline shows the excess of exports when below the excess of imports. From the preceding considerations, it appears that those are greatly in error who contend that the value of money 
in countries where it is an imported commodity must be entirely regulated by its value in the countries which produce it, and cannot be raised or lowered in any permanent manner unless some change has taken place in the cost of production at the mines. On the contrary, any circumstance which disturbs the equation of international demand with respect to a particular country not only may, but must, affect the value of money in that country, its value at the mines remaining the same. The opening of a new branch of export trade from England, an increase in the foreign demand for English products, either by the natural course of events or by the obligation of duties, a check to the demand in England for foreign commodities by the laying on of import duties in England or of export duties elsewhere. These and all other events of similar tendency would make the imports of England, bullion, and other things taken together, no longer an equivalent for the exports, and the countries which take her exports would be obliged to offer their commodities and bullion among the rest on cheaper terms in order to re-establish the equation of demand, and thus England would obtain money cheaper and would acquire a generally higher range of prices. A country which, from any of the causes mentioned, gets money cheaper, obtains all its other imports cheaper likewise. It is by no means necessary that the increased demand for English commodities, which enables England to supply herself with bullion at a cheaper rate, should be a demand in the mining countries. England might export nothing whatever to those countries, and yet might be the country which obtained bullion from them on the lowest terms, provided there were sufficient intensity of demand in other foreign countries for English goods, which would be paid for circuitously with gold and silver from the mining countries. The whole of its exports are what a country exchanges against the whole of its imports, and not its exports and imports to and from any one country. End of Book 3, Chapter 15「Principles of Political Economy » by John Stuart Mill, abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Chapter 16. Of the Foreign Exchanges. Section 1. Money passes from country to country as a medium of exchange through the exchanges. We have thus far considered the precious metals as a commodity, imported like other commodities in the common course of trade, and have examined what are the circumstances which would in that case determine their value. But those metals are also imported in another character, that which belongs to them as a medium of exchange, not as an article of commerce to be sold for money, but as themselves money to pay a debt or effect a transfer of property. Money is sent from one country to another for various purposes. The most usual purpose, however, is that of payment for goods. To show in what circumstances money actually passes from country to country for this or any of the other purposes mentioned, it is necessary briefly to state the nature of the mechanism by which international trade is carried on, when it takes place not by barter, but through the medium of money. In practice, the exports and imports of a country not only are not exchanged directly against each other, but often do not even pass through the same hands. Each is separately bought and paid for with money. We have seen, however, that even in the same country, money does not actually pass from hand to hand each time that purchases are made with it. And still less does this happen between different countries. The habitual mode of paying and receiving payment for commodities between country and country is by bills of exchange. A merchant in the United States, A, has exported American commodities, consigning them to his correspondent B in England. Another merchant in England, C, has exported English commodities, suppose of equivalent value, to a merchant, D, in the United States. It is evidently unnecessary that B in England should send money to A 
in the United States, and that D in the United States should send an equal sum of money to C in England. The one debt may be applied to the payment of the other, and the double cost and risk of carriage be thus saved. A draws a bill on B for the amount which B owes to him. D, having an equal amount to pay in England, buys this bill from A and sends it to C, who at the expiration of the number of days which the bill has to run presents it to B for payment. Thus the debt due from England to the United States and the debt due from the United States to England are both paid without sending an ounce of gold or silver from one country to the other. This implies, if we exclude for the present any other international payments than those occurring in the course of commerce, that the exports and imports exactly pay for one another or in other words that the equation of international demand is established when such is the fact the international transactions are liquidated without the passage of any money from one country to the other but if there is a greater sum due from the united states to england than is due from england to the united states or vice versa the debts cannot be simply written off against one another after the one has been applied, as far as it will go, toward covering the other, this balance must be transmitted in the precious metals. In point of fact, the merchant who has the amount to pay will even then pay for it by a bill. When a person has a remittance to make to a foreign country, he does not himself search for someone who has money to receive from that country and ask him for a bill of exchange. In this, as in other branches of business, there is a class of middlemen, or brokers, who bring buyers and sellers together, or stand between them, buying bills from those who have money to receive, and selling bills to those who have money to pay. When a customer comes to a broker for a bill on Paris or Amsterdam, the broker sells to him perhaps the bill he may himself have bought that morning from a merchant perhaps a bill on his own correspondent in the foreign city, and to enable his correspondent to pay when due all the bills he has granted, he remits to him all those which he has bought and has not resold. In this manner, these brokers take upon themselves the whole settlement of the pecuniary transactions between distant places, being remunerated by a small commission or percentage on the amount of each bill which they either sell or buy. Now, if the brokers find that they are asked for bills on the one part, to a greater amount than bills are offered to them on the other, they do not on this account refuse to give them, but since in that case they have no means of enabling the correspondents on whom their bills are drawn to pay them when due, except by transmitting part of the amount in gold or silver, they require from those to whom they sell bills an additional price, sufficient to cover the freight and insurance of the gold and silver, with a profit sufficient to compensate them for their trouble, and for the temporary occupation of a portion of their capital. This premium, as it is called, the buyers are willing to pay, because they must otherwise go to the expense of remitting the precious metals themselves and it is done cheaper by those who make doing it a part of their especial business. But though only some of those who have a debt to pay would have actually to remit money, all will be obliged by each other's competition to pay the premium, and the brokers are for the same reason obliged to pay it to those whose bills they buy. The reverse of all this happens if, on the comparison of exports and imports, the country, instead of having a balance to pay, has a balance to receive. The brokers find more bills offered to them than are sufficient to cover those which they are required to grant. Bills on foreign countries consequently fall to a discount, and the competition among the brokers 
which is exceedingly active, prevents them from retaining this discount as a profit for themselves, and obliges them to give the benefit of it to those who buy the bills for purposes of remittance. When the United States had the same number of dollars to pay to England, which England had to pay to her, one set of merchants in the United States would want bills, and another set would have bills to dispose of for the very same number of dollars, and consequently, a bill on England for a thousand dollars would sell for exactly a thousand dollars, or, in the phraseology of merchants, the exchange would be at par. As England also, on this supposition, would have an equal number of dollars to pay and to receive, bills on the United States would be at par in England, whenever bills on England were at par in the United States. If, however, the United States had a larger sum to pay to England than to receive from her, there would be persons requiring bills on England for a greater number of dollars than there were bills drawn by persons to whom money was due. A bill on England for a thousand dollars would then sell for more than a thousand dollars, and bills would be said to be at a premium. The premium, however, could not exceed the cost and risk of making the remittance in gold together with a trifling profit, because, if it did, the debtor, would send the gold itself in preference to buying the bill. If, on the contrary, the United States had more money to receive from England than to pay, there would be bills offered for a greater number of dollars than were wanted for remittance, and the price of the bills would fall below par. A bill for a thousand dollars might be bought for somewhat less than a thousand dollars, and bills would be said to be at a discount. When the United States has more to pay than to receive, England has more to receive than to pay, and vice versa. When, therefore, in the United States, bills on England bear a premium, then in England, bills on the United States are at a discount. And when bills on England are at a discount in the United States, bills on the United States are at a premium in England. If they are at par in either country, they are so, as we have already seen, in both. Thus do matters stand between countries, or places which have the same currency. So much of barbarism, however, still remains in the transactions of the most civilized nations, that almost all independent countries choose to assert their nationality by having to their own inconvenience and that of their neighbors a peculiar currency of their own to our present purpose this makes no other difference than that instead of speaking of equal sums of money we have to speak of equivalent sums by equivalent sums when both currencies are composed of the same metal are meant sums which contain exactly the same quantity of the metal in weight and fineness Comment. The quantity of gold in the English pound is equivalent to 4.8666 plus dollars of our gold coins. If the bills offered are about equal to those wanted, a claim to a pound in England will sell for $4.86. If many are wanted, and but few to be had, their price will go up, of course but it cannot go more than a small fraction beyond four dollars and ninety cents, since about three and a quarter cents is sufficient to cover the brokerage insurance and freight per pound sterling in a shipment of gold to London. Therefore, in order to get money to a creditor in London, no one will pay more for a pound in the form of a bill than he will be obliged to pay for sending it across in the form of bullion. Bills of exchange, then, cannot rise in price beyond the point of four dollars and ninety cents plus since rather than pay a higher sum for a bill gold will be sent this point is called the shipping point of gold when the exchanges are at four dollars and ninety cents it will be found that gold is going abroad on the other hand when the supply of bills is greater than the demand their price will fall a man having a bill on London to sell, 
that is, a claim to a pound in London, will not sell it at a price here lower than $4.86 by more than the expense of bringing the gold itself across. Since this expense is about three and a quarter cents, bills cannot fall below about $4.83. When exchange is at that price, it will be found that gold is coming to the United States from England. The price is the shipping point for imports of gold. This, of course, applies to the site bills only. Formerly, we computed exchange on a scale of percentages, the real par being about 109. This was given up after the war. End of comment. When bills on foreign countries are at a premium, it is customary to say that the exchanges are against the country or unfavorable to it. In order to understand these phrases, we must take notice of what the exchange, in the language of merchants, really means. It means the power which the money of the country has of purchasing the money of other countries. Supposing $4.86 to be the exact par of exchange, then when it requires more than $1,000 to buy a bill of 205 pounds, $1,000 of American money are worth less than their real equivalent of English money, and this is called an exchange unfavorable to the United States. The only persons in the United States, however, to whom it is really unfavorable are those who have money to pay in England, for they come into the bill market as buyers and have to pay a premium. But to those who have money to receive in England, the same state of things is favorable, for they come as sellers and receive the premium. The premium, however, indicates that a balance is due by the United States, which must be eventually liquidated in the precious metals. And since, according to the old theory, the benefit of a trade consisted in bringing money into the country, this prejudice introduced the practice of calling the exchange favorable when it indicated a balance to receive and unfavorable when it indicated one to pay, and the phrases in turn tended to maintain the prejudice. Section 2. Distinction between variations in the exchanges, which are self-adjusting and those which can only be rectified through prices. It might be supposed at first sight that when the exchange is unfavorable, or, in other words, when bills are at a premium, the premium must always amount to a full equivalent for the cost of transmitting money. But a small excess of imports above exports, or any other small amount of debt to be paid to foreign countries, does not usually affect the exchanges to the full extent of the cost and risk of transporting bullion. The length of credit allowed generally permits, on the part of some of the debtors, a postponement of payment, and in the meantime the balance may turn the other way, and restore the equality of debts and credits without any actual transmission of the metals. And this is more likely to happen, as there is a self-adjusting power in the variations of the exchange itself. Bills are at a premium because a greater money value has been imported then exported, but the premium is itself an extra profit to those who export. Besides the price they obtain for their goods, they draw for the amount and gain the premium. It is, on the other hand, a diminution of profit to those who import. Besides the price of the goods, they have to pay a premium for remittance. So that what is called an unfavorable exchange is an encouragement to export, and a discouragement to import. And if the balance due is of a small amount, and is the consequence of some merely casual disturbance in the ordinary course of trade, it is soon liquidated in commodities, and the account adjusted by means of bills, without the transmission of any bullion. Not so, however, when the excess of imports above exports which has made the exchange unfavorable, arises from a permanent cause. In that case, what disturbed the equilibrium must have been the state of prices, 
and it can only be restored by acting on prices. It is impossible that prices should be such as to invite to an excess of imports, and yet that the exports should be kept permanently up to the imports by the extra profit on exportation derived from the premium on bills. For, if the exports were kept up to the imports, bills would not be at a premium, and the extra profit would not exist. It is through the prices of commodities that the correction must be administered. Disturbances, therefore, of the equilibrium of imports and exports, and consequent disturbances of the exchange, may be considered as of two classes, the one casual or accidental, which, if not on too large a scale, correct themselves through the premium on bills without any transmission of the precious metals. The other, arising from the general state of prices, which cannot be corrected without the subtraction of actual money from the circulation of one of the countries, or an annihilation of credit equivalent to it. It remains to observe that the exchanges do not depend on the balance of debts and credits with each country separately, but with all countries taken together. The United States may owe a balance of payments to England, but it does not follow that the exchange with England will be against the United States, and that bills on England will be at a premium, because a balance may be due to the United States from Holland or Hamburg and she may pay her debts to england with bills on those places which is technically called arbitration of exchange there is some little additional expense partly commission and partly loss of interest in settling debts in this circuitous manner and to the extent of that small difference the exchange with one country may vary apart from that with others comment a common use of bills of exchange is that by which, when three countries are concerned, two of them may strike a balance through the third, if both countries have dealings with that third country. New York merchants may buy of China, but China may not be buying of New York, and although both may have dealings with London. End of comment. A we will suppose, is a buyer of a thousand pounds worth of tea from F in Hong Kong. B is an exporter of wheat, a thousand pounds to C in London. D has sent a thousand pounds worth of cotton goods to E in Hong Kong. A can now pay F through London without the transmission of coin. A buys B's claim on C for a thousand pounds and sends it to F. E wishes to pay D in London for the cotton goods he bought of him. Therefore, he buys from F for a thousand pounds the claim he now holds, that is, a bill of exchange on London, against C for a thousand dollars. E sends it to D, and when D collects it from C, the whole circle of exchanges is completed without the transmission of the precious metals. End of Book 3, Chapter 16。Book 3, Chapter 17 of Principles of Political Economy。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill. Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Book 3, Chapter 17. Of the Distribution of Precious Metals Through the Commercial World. Section 1. The Substitution of Money for Barter makes no difference in exports and imports, nor in the law of international values. Having now examined the mechanism by which the commercial transactions between nations are actually conducted, we have next to inquire whether this mode of conducting them makes any difference in the conclusions respecting international values, 
which we previously arrived at on the hypothesis of barter. The nearest analogy would lead us to presume the negative. We need not find that the intervention of money and its substitutes made any difference in the law of value as applied to adjacent places, things which would have been equal in value if the mode of exchange had been by barter, are worth equal sums of money. The introduction of money is a mere addition of one more commodity, of which the value is regulated by the same laws as that of all other commodities. We shall not be surprised, therefore, if we find that international values are also determined by the same causes under a money and bill system as they would be under a system of barter, and that money has little to do in the matter except to furnish a convenient mode of comparing values. All interchange is, in substance and effect, barter. Whoever sells commodities for money, and with that money buys other goods, really buys those goods with his own commodities. And so of nations, their trade is a mere exchange of exports for imports, and whether money is employed or not, things are only in their permanent state when the exports and imports exactly pay for each other. When this is the case, equal sums of money are due from each country to the other, and debts are settled by bills, and there is no balance to be paid in the precious metals. The trade is in a state like that which is called in mechanics a condition of stable equilibrium. But the process by which things are brought back to this state, when they happen to deviate from it, is at least outwardly not the same in a barter system and in a money system. Under the first, the country which wants more imports than its exports will pay for must offer its exports at a cheaper rate, as the sole means of creating a demand for them sufficient to re-establish the equilibrium. When money is used, the country seems to do a thing totally different. She takes the additional imports at the same price as before, and, as she exports no equivalent, the balance of payments turns against her. The exchange becomes unfavorable, and the difference has to be paid in money. This is, in appearance, a very distinct operation from the former. Let us see if it differs in its essence or only in its mechanism. Let the country which has the balance to pay be the United States, and the country which receives it, England. By this transmission of the precious metals, the quantity of the currency is diminished in the United States, and increased in England. This I am at liberty to assume. We are now supposing that there is an excess of imports over exports arising from the fact that the equation of international demand is not yet established, that there is, at the ordinary prices, a permanent demand in the United States for more English goods than the American goods required in England at the ordinary prices will pay for. When this is the case, if a change were not made in the prices, there would be a perpetually renewed balance to be paid in money. The imports require to be permanently diminished, or the exports to be increased, which can only be accomplished through prices. And hence, even if the balances are at first paid from hoards, or by the exportation of bullion, then they will reach the circulation at last, for until they do, nothing can stop the drain. When, therefore, the state of prices is such that the equation of international demand cannot establish itself. The country requiring more imports than can be paid for by the exports, it is a sign that the country has more of the precious metals or their substitutes in circulation than can permanently circulate and must necessarily part with some of them before the balance can be restored. Currency is accordingly contracted. Prices fall, and among the rest, 
the prices of exportable articles which accordingly there arises in foreign countries a greater demand while imported commodities have possibly risen in price from the influx of money into foreign countries and at all events have not participated in the general fall but until the increased cheapness of american goods induces foreign countries to take a greater pecuniary value or until the increased dearness positive or comparative of foreign goods makes the united states take a less pecuniary value the exports of the united states will be no nearer to paying for the imports than before and the stream of the precious metals which had begun to flow out of the united states will still flow on this efflux will continue until the fall of prices in the united states brings within reach of the foreign market some commodity which the united states did not previously send thither or until the reduced price of the things which she did send has forced a demand abroad for a sufficient quantity to pay for the imports aided perhaps by a reduction of the american demand for foreign goods through their enhanced price either positive or comparative now this is the very process which took place on our original supposition of barter not only therefore does the trade between nations tend to the same equilibrium between exports and imports whether money is employed or not but the means by which this equilibrium is established are essentially the same the country whose exports are not sufficient to pay for her imports offers them on cheaper terms until she succeeds in forcing the necessary demand in other words the equation of international demand under a money system as well as under a barter system is the law of international trade every country exports and imports the very same things and in the very same quantity under the one system as under the other in a barter system the trade gravitates to the point at which the sum of the imports exactly exchanges for the sum of the exports in a money system it gravitates to the point at which the sum of the imports and the sum of the exports exchange for the same quantity of money and since things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another the exports and imports which are equal in money price would if money were not used precisely exchange for one another footnote the subjoined extract from the separate essay some unsettled questions of political economy previously referred to will give some assistance in following the course of the phenomena it is adapted to the imaginary case used for illustration throughout that essay the case of a trade between england and germany in cloth and linen we may at first make whatever supposition we will with respect to the value of money let us suppose therefore that before the opening of the trade the price of cloth is the same in both countries namely six shillings per yard as ten yards of cloth were supposed to exchange in england for fifteen yards of linen in germany for twenty we must suppose that linen is sold in england at four shillings per yard in germany at three cost of carriage and importer's profit are left as before out of consideration in this state of prices cloth it is evident cannot yet be exported from england into germany but linen can be imported from germany into england it will be so and in the first instance the linen will be paid for in money the efflux of money from england and its influx into germany will raise money prices in the latter country and lower them in the former linen will rise in germany above three shillings per yard and the cloth above six shillings linen in england being imported from germany will since cost of carriage is not reckoned sink to the same price as in that country while cloth 
will fall below six shillings. As soon as the price of cloth is lower in England than in Germany, it will begin to be exported, and the price of cloth in Germany will fall to what it is in England. As long as the cloth exported does not suffice to pay for the linen imported, money will continue to flow from England into Germany, and prices generally will continue to fall in England and rise in Germany. By the fall, however, of cloth in England, cloth will fall in Germany also, and the demand for it will increase. By the rise of linen in Germany, linen must rise in England also, and the demand for it will diminish. As cloth fell in price and linen rose, there would be some particular price of both articles at which the cloth exported and the linen imported would exactly pay for each other. At this point, prices would remain because money would then cease to move out of England into Germany. What this point might be would entirely depend upon the circumstances and inclinations of the purchasers on both sides. If the fall of cloth did not much increase the demand for it in Germany, and the rise of linen did not diminish very rapidly the demand for it in England, much money must pass before the equilibrium is restored. Cloth would fall very much, and linen would rise, until England perhaps had to pay nearly as much for it as when she produced it for herself. But, if on the contrary, the fall of cloth caused a very rapid increase of the demand for it in Germany, and the rise of linen in Germany reduced very rapidly the demand in England from what it was, under the influence of the first cheapness produced by the opening of the trade, the cloth would very soon suffice to pay for the linen. Little money would pass between the two countries, and England would derive a large portion of the benefit of the trade. We have thus arrived at precisely the same conclusion, in supposing the employment of money which we found to hold under the supposition of barter. In what shape the benefit accrues to the two nations from the trade is clear enough. Germany, before the commencement of the trade, paid six shillings per yard for broadcloth. She now obtains it at a lower price. This, however, is not the whole of her advantage. As the money prices of all her other commodities have risen, the money incomes of all her producers have increased. There is no advantage to them in buying from each other, because the price of what they buy has risen in the same ratio with their means of paying for it. But it is an advantage to them in buying anything which has not risen, and still more, anything which has fallen. They therefore benefit as consumers of cloth, not merely to the extent to which cloth has fallen, but also to the extent to which other prices have risen. Suppose that this is one-tenth. The same proportion of their money incomes as before will suffice to supply their other wants, and the remainder, being increased one-tenth in amount, will enable them to purchase one-tenth more cloth than before, even though cloth had not fallen. But it has fallen, so that they are doubly gainers. They purchase the same quantity with less money, and have more to expand upon their other wants. In England, on the contrary, general money prices have fallen. Linen, however, has fallen more than the rest, having been lowered in price by importation from a country where it was cheaper, whereas the others have fallen only from the consequent efflux of money. Notwithstanding, therefore, the general fall of money prices, the English producers will be exactly as they were in all other respects, while they will gain as purchasers of linen. The greater the efflux of money required to restore the equilibrium, the greater will be the gain of Germany, both by the fall of cloth and by the rise of her general prices. The less the efflux of money requisite, the greater will be the gain of England, because the price of linen will continue lower, and her general prices will not be reduced so much. It must not, however, be imagined that high money prices are a good, and lower money prices an evil, in themselves, but the higher the general money prices in any country, the greater will be that country's means of purchasing those commodities, which, being imported from abroad, are independent of the causes which keep prices high at home. In practice, 
the cloth and the linen would not as here supposed be at the same price in england and in germany each would be dearer in money price in the country which imported than in that which produced it by the amount of the cost of carriage together with the ordinary profit on the importer's capital for the average length of time which elapsed before the commodity could be disposed of but it does not follow that each country pays the cost of carriage of the commodity it imports for the addition of this item to the price may operate as a greater check to demand on one side than on the other and the equation of international demand and consequent equilibrium of payments may not be maintained money would then flow out of one country into the other until in the manner already illustrated the equilibrium was restored and then when this was effected one country would be paying more than its own cost of carriage and the other less mill End of footnote. section two the preceding theorem further illustrated let us proceed to examine to what extent the benefit of an improvement in the production of an exportable article is participated in by the countries importing it. The improvement may either consist in the cheapening of some article, which was already a staple production of the country, or in the establishment of some new branch of industry, or of some process rendering an article exportable which had not till then been exported at all it will be convenient to begin with the case of a new export as being somewhat the simpler of the two the first effect is that the article falls in price and a demand arises for it abroad this new exportation disturbs the balance turns the exchanges money flows into the country which we shall suppose to be the united states and continues to flow until prices rise. This higher range of prices will somewhat check the demand in foreign countries for the new article of export, and will diminish the demand which existed abroad for the other things which the United States was in the habit of exporting. The exports will thus be diminished, while at the same time the American public, having more money, Will have a greater power of purchasing foreign commodities if they make use of this increased power of purchase there will be an increase of imports and by this and the check to exportation the equilibrium of imports and exports will be restored the result to foreign countries will be that they have to pay dearer than before for their other imports and obtain the new commodity cheaper than before but not so much cheaper as the United States herself does. I say this being well aware that the article would be actually at the very same price, cost of carriage accepted, in the United States and in other countries. The cheapness, however, of the article is not measured solely by the money price, but by that price compared with the money incomes of the consumers. The price is the same to the American and to the foreign consumers but the former pay that price from money incomes which have been increased by the new distribution of the precious metals while the latter have had their money incomes probably diminished by the same cause the trade therefore has not imparted to the foreign consumer the whole but only a portion of the benefit which the american consumer has derived from the improvement while the united states has also benefited in the prices of foreign commodities. Thus, then, any industrial improvement which leads to the opening of a new branch of export trade benefits a country not only by the cheapness of the article in which the improvement has taken place, but by a general cheapening of all imported products. Let us now change the hypothesis and suppose that the improvement, instead of creating a new export from the United States, cheapens an existing one let the commodity in which there is an improvement be cotton cloth the first effect of the improvement is that its price falls and there is an increased demand for it in the foreign market but this demand is of uncertain amount suppose the foreign consumers to increase their purchases in the exact ratio of the cheapness or in other words 
to lay out in cloth the same sum of money as before. The same aggregate payment as before will be due from foreign countries to the United States. The equilibrium of exports and imports will remain undisturbed, and foreigners will obtain the full advantage of the increased cheapness of cloth. But if the foreign demand for cloth is of such a character as to increase in a greater ratio than the cheapness, a larger sum than formerly will be due to the United States for cloth, and when paid, will raise American prices, the price of cloth included. This rise, however, will affect only the foreign purchaser, American incomes being raised in a corresponding proportion, and the foreign consumer will thus derive a less advantage than the United States from the improvement. If, on the contrary, the cheapening of cloth does not extend the foreign demand for it in a proportional degree, a less sum of debts than before will be due to the United States for cloth, while there will be the usual sum of debts due from the United States to foreign countries. The balance of trade will turn against the United States. Money will be exported. Prices, that of cloth included, will fall, and cloth will eventually be cheapened to the foreign purchaser in a still greater ratio than the improvement has cheapened it to the United States. These are the very conclusions which would be deduced on the hypothesis of barter. The result of the preceding discussion cannot be better summed up than in the words of Ricardo. Quote, Gold and silver having been chosen for the general medium of circulation, they are, by the competition of commerce, distributed in such proportions among the different countries of the world as to accommodate themselves to the natural traffic, which would take place if no such metals existed, and the trade between countries were purely a trade of barter. Unquote. Of this principle, so fertile in consequences, previous to which the theory of foreign trade was an unintelligible chaos, Mr. Ricardo, though he did not pursue it into its ramifications, was the real originator. Comment. On the principles of trade, which we have before explained, the same rule will apply to the distribution of money in different parts of the same country, especially of a large country with various kinds of production like the United States. The medium of exchange will, by the competition of commerce, be distributed in such proportions among the different parts of the United States by natural laws, as to accommodate itself to the number of transactions which would take place if no such medium existed. For this reason, we find more money in the so-called great financial centers, because there are more exchanges of goods there. In sparsely settled parts of the West, there will be less money, precisely because there are fewer transactions than in the older and more settled districts, so that there could be no worse folly than the following legislation of Congress to distribute the national bank circulation that $150 million of the entire amount of circulating notes authorized to be issued shall be apportioned to associations in the states in the District of Columbia, and in the territories, according to representative population. From the Act of March 3rd, 1865. End of comment. Section 3. The precious metals as money are of the same value and distribute themselves according to the same law with the precious metals as a commodity. It is now necessary to inquire in what manner this law of the distribution of the precious metals by means of the exchanges affects the exchange value of money itself and how it tallies with the law by which we found that the value of money is regulated when imported as a mere article of merchandise. The causes which bring money into or carry it out of a country through the exchanges to restore the equilibrium of trade, and which thereby raise its value in some countries and lower it in others, are the very same causes on which the local value of money would depend, 
if it were never imported except as merchandise, and never except directly from the mines. When the value of money in a country is permanently lowered as a medium of exchange by an influx of it through the balance of trade, the cause, if it is not diminished cost of production, must be one of those causes which compel a new adjustment more favorable to the country, of the equation of international demand, namely, either an increased demand abroad for her commodities or a diminished demand on her part for those of foreign countries. Now an increased foreign demand for the commodities of a country, or a diminished demand in the country for imported commodities, are the very causes which on the general principles of trade enable a country to purchase all imports, and consequently the precious metals at a lower value. There is therefore no contradiction but the most perfect accordance in the results of the two different modes, one as a medium of exchange, and two as merchandise, in which the precious metals may be obtained. When money, as a medium of exchange, flows from country to country, in consequence of changes in the international demand for commodities, and by so doing alters its own local value, it merely realizes by a more rapid process the effect which would otherwise take place more slowly by an alteration in the relative breadth of the streams by which the precious metals as merchandise flow into different regions of the earth from the mining countries as therefore we before saw that the use of money as a medium of exchange does not in the least alter the law on which the values of other things, either in the same country or internationally, depend, so neither does it alter the law of the value of the precious metals itself. And there is in the whole doctrine of international values, as now laid down, a unity and harmony which are a strong collateral presumption of truth. Section 4 international payments entering into the financial account before closing this discussion it is fitting to point out in what manner and degree the preceding conclusions are affected by the existence of international payments not originating in commerce and for which no equivalent in either money or commodities is expected or received such as a tribute or remittances, or interest to foreign creditors, or a government expenditure abroad. To begin with the case of barter, the supposed annual remittances being made in commodities, and being exports for which there is to be no return, it is no longer requisite that the imports and exports should pay for one another. On the contrary, there must be an annual excess of exports over imports equal to the value of the remittance. If before the country became liable to the annual payment, foreign commerce was in its natural state of equilibrium, it will now be necessary for the purpose of effecting the remittances, that foreign countries should be induced to take a greater quantity of exports than before, which can only be done by offering those exports on cheaper terms, or in other words, by paying dearer for foreign commodities. The international values will so adjust themselves that either by greater exports or smaller imports or both, the requisite excess on the side of exports will be brought about and this excess will become the permanent state. The result is that a country which makes regular payments to foreign countries, besides losing what it pays, loses also something more, by the less advantageous terms on which it is forced to exchange its production for foreign commodities. The same results follow on the supposition of money. Commerce being supposed to be in a state of equilibrium when the obligatory remittances begin, the first remittance is necessarily made in money. This lowers prices in the remitting country and raises them in the receiving. The natural effect is that more commodities are exported than before, 
and fewer imported, and that, on the score of commerce alone, a balance of money will be constantly due from the receiving to the paying country. When the debt thus annually due to the tributary country becomes equal to the annual tribute or other regular payment due from it, no further transmission of money takes place. The equilibrium of exports and imports will no longer exist, but that of payments will. The exchange will be at par. The two debts will be set off against one another, and the tribute of remittance will be virtually paid in goods. The result to the interests of the two countries will be as already pointed out. The paying country will give a higher price for all that it buys from the receiving country, while the latter, besides receiving the tribute, obtains the exportable produce of the tributary country at a lower price. Comment. It has been seen, as in chart number 13, that considering the exports and imports merely as merchandise, there is in fact no actual equilibrium at any given time in accordance with the equation of international demand. Another element, the financial account between the United States and foreign countries, must be considered before we can know all the factors necessary to bring about the equation. If we had been borrowing largely of England, Holland, and Germany, we should owe a regular annual sum as interest, and our exports must, as a rule, be exactly that much more under right and normal conditions, than the imports. Or take another case. If capital is borrowed in Europe for railways in the United States, this capital generally comes over in the form of imports of various kinds. But if our exports are not sufficient at once to balance the increased imports, we go in debt for a time, or in other words, in order to establish the balance, we send United States securities abroad instead of actual exports. The shipment of securities is not seen and recorded as among the exports, and so we find a period, like that during and after the war from 1862 to 1873, of a vast excess of imports. Since 1873, the country has been practically paying the indebtedness occurred in the former period, and there has been a vast excess of exports over imports, and an apparent discrepancy in the equilibrium. But our government bonds and other securities have been coming back to us, producing a return current to balance the excessive exports. In brief, the use of securities and various forms of indebtedness permit the period of actual payment to be deferred, so that an excess of imports at one time may be offset by an excess of exports at another, and generally a later time. Moreover, the large expenses of people traveling in Europe will require us to remit abroad in the form of exports more than would ordinarily balance our imports, by the amount spent by the travelers. The financial operations, therefore, between the United States and foreign countries must be well considered in striking the equation between our exports and imports. As formulated by Mr. Cairns, the equation of international demand should be stated more broadly as follows. The state of international demand, which results in commercial equilibrium, is realized when the reciprocal demand of trading countries produces such a relation of exports and imports among them as enables each country, by means of her exports, to discharge all her foreign liabilities. If we were a great lending instead of a great borrowing country, we should have, as a rule, a permanent excess of imports. End of comment. End of Book 3, Chapter 17。Three, chapter 18 of Principles of Political Economy。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill.
Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Book Three, Chapter Eighteen Influence of the Currency on the Exchanges and on Foreign Trade. Section One Variations in the Exchange which Originate in the Currency. In our inquiry into the laws of international trade, we commenced with the principles which determine international exchanges and international values on the hypothesis of barter. We next showed that the introduction of money as a medium of exchange makes no difference in the laws of exchanges and of values between country and country, no more than between individual and individual, since the precious metals under the influence of those same laws distribute themselves in such proportions among the different countries of the world as to allow the very same exchanges to go on and at the same values, as would be the case under a system of barter. We lastly considered how the value of money itself is affected by those alterations in the state of trade which arise from alterations either in the demand and supply of commodities, or in their cost of production. It remains to consider the alterations in the state of trade which originate not in commodities, but in money. Gold and silver may vary like other things, though they are not so likely to vary as other things in their cost of production. The demand for them in foreign countries may also vary. It may increase by augmented employment of the metals for purposes of art and ornament, or because the increase of production of transactions has created a greater amount of business to be done by the circulating medium. It may diminish for the opposite reasons, or from the extension of the economizing expedients by which the use of metallic money is partially dispensed with. These changes act upon the trade between other countries and the mining countries, and upon the value of the precious metals, according to the general laws of the value of imported commodities, which have been set forth in the previous chapters with sufficient fullness. What I propose to examine in the present chapter is not those circumstances affecting money which alter the permanent conditions of its value, but the effects produced on international trade by casual or temporary variations in the value of money, which have no connection with any causes affecting its permanent value. Section 2. Effect of a sudden increase of a metallic currency, or of the sudden creation of banknotes or other substitutes for money. Let us suppose in any country a circulating medium purely metallic, and a sudden casual increase made to it, for example, by bringing into circulation hordes of treasure which had been concealed in a previous period of foreign invasion or internal disorder. The natural effect would be a rise of prices. This would check exports and encourage imports. The imports would exceed the exports. The exchanges would become unfavorable, and a newly acquired stock of money would diffuse itself over all countries with which the supposed country carried on trade, and from them progressively through all parts of the commercial world. The money which thus overflowed would spread itself to an equal depth over all commercial countries, for it would go on flowing until the exports and imports again balanced one another, and this, as no change is supposed in the permanent circumstances of international demand, could only be when the money had diffused itself so equally that the prices had risen in the same ratio in all countries, so that the alteration of price would be for all practical purposes ineffective, and the exports and imports, though at a higher monetary valuation, would be exactly the same as they were originally. This diminished value of money throughout the world, at least if the diminution was considerable, would cause a suspension or at least a diminution of the annual supply from the mines, since the metal would no longer command a value equivalent to its highest cost of production. The annual waste would, therefore, not be fully made up, and the usual causes of destruction would gradually reduce the aggregate quantity of the precious metals to its former amount, after which their production would recommence on its former scale. The discovery of the treasure would thus produce only temporary effects, namely a brief disturbance of international trade until the treasure had disseminated itself through the world, and then a temporary depression in the value of the metal below that which corresponds to the cost of producing or obtaining it, which depression would gradually be corrected by a temporarily diminished production in the producing countries and importation in the importing countries. The same effects which would thus arise from the discovery of a treasure accompany the process by which banknotes or any of the other substitutes for money take the place of the precious metals. Footnote. The illustrations in this chapter have been also changed, but only so far as to make them apply to the United States. In footnote. 
Suppose that the United States possessed a currency wholly metallic of $200 million, and that suddenly $200 million of banknotes were sent into circulation. If these were issued by bankers, they would be employed in loans or in the purchase of securities, and would therefore create a sudden fall in the rate of interest, which would probably send a great part of the $200 million of gold out of the country, as capital, to seek a higher rate of interest elsewhere before there had been time for any action on prices. But we will suppose that the notes are not issued by bankers or money lenders of any kind, but by manufacturers in the payment of wages and the purchase of materials, or by the government, as, for example, greenbacks, in ordinary expenses, so that the whole amount would be rapidly carried into the markets for commodities. The following would be the natural order of consequences. All prices would rise greatly, exportation would almost cease, importation would be prodigiously stimulated, a great balance of payments would become due, the exchanges would turn against the United States to the full extent of the cost of exporting money, and the surplus coin would pour itself rapidly forth over the various countries of the world in order of their proximity geographically and commercially to the United States. Comment. A study of chart number 14 will show how exactly this description fits the case of our country when the rise of prices stimulated the imports of merchandise. See chart number 13 in 1862 and sent gold out of the country. The afflux would continue until the currencies of all countries had come to a level, by which I do not mean until money became of the same value everywhere, but until the differences were only those which existed before and which corresponded to permanent differences in the cost of obtaining it. When the rise of prices had extended itself in an equal degree to all countries, exports and imports would everywhere revert to what they were at first, would balance one another, and the exchanges would return to par. If such a sum of money as $200 million, when spread over the whole surface of the commercial world, were sufficient to raise the general level in a perceptible degree, the effect would be of no long duration, no alteration having occurred in the general conditions under which the metals were procured, either in the world at large or in any part of it, the reduced value would no longer be remunerating, and the supply from the mines would cease partially or wholly, until the two hundred million dollars were absorbed. Footnote. I am here supposing a state of things in which gold and silver mining are a permanent branch of industry carried on under known conditions and not the present state of uncertainty, in which gold gathering is a game of chance, prosecuted for the present in the spirit of an adventure, not in that of a regular industrial pursuit. Mill. It is, however, worth recalling that gold and silver mining have not been, for large effects on the value of the metals, anything like a permanent branch of industry, but that in the main great additions have been obtained suddenly and by chance discoveries. J. L. L. End footnote. Effects of another kind, however, will have been produced. Two hundred million dollars, which formerly existed in the unproductive form of metallic money, have been converted into what is or is capable of becoming productive capital. This gain is at first made by the United States at the expense of other countries who have taken her superfluity of this costly and unproductive article off her hands, giving for it an equivalent value in other commodities. By degrees the loss is made up to those countries by diminished influx from the mines, and finally the world has gained a virtual addition of two hundred million dollars to its productive resources. Adam Smith's illustration, though so well known, deserves for its extreme aptness to be once more repeated. He compares the substitution of paper in the room of the precious metals to the construction of a highway through the air, by which the ground now occupied by roads would become available for agriculture. As in that case a portion of the soil, so in this case a part of the accumulated wealth of the country, would be relieved from a function in which it was only employed in rendering other soils and capitals productive, and would itself become applicable to production. The office it previously fulfilled being equally well discharged by a medium which costs nothing. The value saved to the community by thus dispensing with metallic money is a clear gain to those who provide the substitute. They have the use of two hundred million dollars of circulating medium which have cost them only the expense of an engraver's plate. If they employ this accession to their fortunes as productive capital, the produce of the country is increased and the community benefited as much as by any other capital of equal amount. Whether it is so employed or not depends in some degree upon the mode of issuing it. 
If issued by the government and employed in paying off debt, it would probably become productive capital. The government, however, may prefer employing this extraordinary resource in its ordinary expenses, may squander it uselessly, or make it a mere temporary substitute for taxation to an equivalent amount, in which last case the amount is saved by the taxpayers at large who either add it to their capital or spend it as income. When a part of the paper currency is supplied, as in our own country, by banking companies, the amount is almost wholly turned into productive capital, for the issuers, being at all times liable to be called upon to refund the value, are under the strongest inducements not to squander it, and the only cases in which it is not forthcoming are cases of fraud or mismanagement. A banker's profession being that of a money-lender, his issue of notes is a simple extension of his ordinary occupation. He lends the amount to farmers, manufacturers, or dealers who employ it in their several businesses. So employed, it yields, like any other capital, wages of labor and profits of stock. The profit is shared between the banker who receives interest and a succession of borrowers, mostly for short periods, who after paying the interest gain a profit in addition or a convenience equivalent to profit. The capital itself in the long run becomes entirely wages, and when replaced by the sale of the produce becomes wages again, thus affording a perpetual fund of the value of $200 million for the maintenance of productive labor, and increasing the annual produce of the country by all that can be produced through the means of a capital of that value. To this gain must be added a further saving to the country of the annual supply of the precious metals necessary for repairing the wear and tear and other waste of a metallic currency. The substitution, therefore, of paper for the precious metals should always be carried as far as is consistent with safety, no greater amount of metallic currency being retained than is necessary to maintain, both in fact and in public belief, the convertibility of the paper. But since gold wanted for exportation is almost invariably drawn from the reserves of the banks, and is never likely to be taken directly from the circulation while the banks remain solvent, the only advantage which can be obtained from retaining partially a metallic currency for daily purposes is that the banks may occasionally replenish their reserves from it. Section 3. Effect of the Increase of an Inconvertible Paper Currency, Real and Nominal Exchange. When metallic money has been entirely superseded and expelled from circulation by the substitution of an equal amount of banknotes, any attempt to keep a still further quantity of paper in circulation must, if the notes are convertible into gold, be a complete failure. Comment. This brings up the whole question at issue between the currency principle and the banking principle. The latter, maintained by Fullerton, Wilson, Price, and Took in his later writings, held that if notes were convertible, the value of notes could not differ from the value of the metal into which they were convertible. While the former, advocated by Lord Overstone, G. W. Norman, Colonel Torrens, took in his earlier writings, and Sir Robert Peel, implied that even a convertible paper was liable to over-issues. This last school brought about the Bank Act of 1844. End comment. A new issue would again set in motion the same train of consequences by which the gold coin had already been expelled. The metals would, as before, be required for exportation, and would be for that purpose demanded from the banks, to the full extent of the superfluous notes, which thus could not possibly be retained in circulation. If indeed the notes were inconvertible, there would be no such obstacle to the increase in their quantity. An inconvertible paper acts in the same way as a convertible, while there remains any coin for it to supersede. The difference begins to manifest itself when all the coin is driven from circulation, except what may be retained for the convenience of small change, and the issues still go on increasing. When the paper begins to exceed in quantity the metallic currency which it superseded, prices of course rise. Things which were worth $25 in metallic money become worth $30 in inconvertible paper, or more as the case may be. But this rise of price will not, as in the cases before examined, stimulate import and discourage export. The imports and exports are determined by the metallic prices of things, not by the paper prices. And it is only when the paper is exchangeable at pleasure for the metals that paper prices and metallic prices must correspond. Let us suppose that the United States is the country which has the depreciated paper. Suppose that some American production could be bought while the currency was still metallic for $25 and sold in England for $27.50.
the difference covering the expense and risk and affording a profit to the merchant. On account of the depreciation, this commodity will now cost in the United States thirty dollars, and cannot be sold in England for more than twenty-seven fifty, and yet it will be exported as before. Why? Because the twenty-seven fifty which the exporter can get for it in England is not depreciated paper but gold or silver, and since in the United States bullion has risen in the same proportion with other things, if the merchant brings the gold or silver to the United States, he can sell his twenty-seven fifty in coin for thirty-three dollars in paper, and obtain as before ten per cent for profit and expenses. It thus appears that a depreciation of the currency does not affect the foreign trade of the country. This is carried on precisely as if the currency maintained its value. But though the trade is not affected, the exchanges are. When the imports and exports are in equilibrium, the exchange in a metallic currency would be at par. A bill on England for the equivalent of $25 would be worth $25. But $25, or the quantity of gold contained in them, having come to be worth in the United States $30, it follows that a bill on England for $25 will be worth $30. When therefore the real exchange is at par, there will be a nominal exchange against the country of as much percent as the amount of the depreciation. If the currency is depreciated 10, 15, or 20 percent, then in whatever way the real exchange, arising from the variations of international debts and credits, may vary, the quoted exchange will always differ 10, 15, or 20 percent from it. However high this nominal premium may be, it has no tendency to send gold out of the country for the purpose of drawing a bill against it and profiting by the premium, because the gold so sent must be procured not from the banks and at par, as in the case of a convertible currency, but in the market at an advance of price equal to the premium. In such cases, instead of saying that the exchange is unfavorable, it would be a more correct representation to say that the par has altered. Since there is now required a larger quantity of American currency to be equivalent to the same quantity of foreign. The exchanges, however, continue to be computed accordingly to the metallic par. The quoted exchanges, therefore, when there is a depreciated currency are compounded of two elements or factors. One, the real exchange, which follows the variations of international payments, and two, the nominal exchange, which varies with the depreciation of the currency, but which, while there is any depreciation at all, must always be unfavorable. Since the amount of depreciation is exactly measured by the degree in which the market price of bullion exceeds the mint valuation, we have a sure criterion to determine what portion of the quoted exchange, being referable to depreciation, may be struck off as nominal, the result so corrected expressing the real exchange. The same disturbance of the exchanges and of international trade which is produced by an increased issue of convertible banknotes is in like manner produced by those extensions of credit which was so fully shown in a preceding chapter, have the same effect on prices as an increase of the currency. Whenever circumstances have given such an impulse to the spirit of speculation as to occasion a great increase of purchases on credit, money prices rise, just as much as they would have risen if each person who so buys on credit had bought with money. All the effects, therefore, must be similar. As a consequence of high prices, exportation is checked and importation stimulated, though in fact the increase of importation seldom waits for the rise of prices, which is the consequence of speculation. Inasmuch as some of the great articles of import are usually among the things in which speculative overtrading first shows itself. There is, therefore, in such periods usually a great excess of imports over exports, and when the time comes at which these must be paid for, the exchanges become unfavorable, and gold flows out of the country. This efflux of gold takes effect on prices, by withdrawing gold from the reserves of the banks, and so by stopping loans in the use of credit or purchasing power. Its effect is to make them recoil downward. The recoil, once begun, generally becomes a total rout, and the unusual extension of credit is rapidly exchanged for an unusual contraction of it. Accordingly, when credit has been imprudently stretched, and the speculative spirit carried to excess, the turn of the exchanges and consequent pressure on the banks to obtain gold for exportation are generally the proximate cause of the catastrophe. Comment. A glance at chart number 13 will give illustration to the situation here described. After the war and until 1873, while the United States was under the influence of high prices and a speculation which has seldom been equaled in our history, 
the resulting great excess of imports became very striking. It was an unhealthy and abnormal condition of trade. The sudden reversal of the trade by the crisis in 1873 is equally striking, and as prices fell, exports began to increase. The effect on international trade of a collapse of credit is thus clearly marked by lines on the chart. End comment. End of Book 3, Chapter 18 Recording by Philip Gould Book 3, Chapter 19 of Principles of Political Economy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin Chapter 19 Of the Rate of Interest Section 1 The Rate of Interest Depends on the Demand and Supply of Loans The two topics of currency and loans, though in themselves distinct, are so intimately blended in the phenomenon of what is called the money market, that it is impossible to understand the one without the other, and in many minds the two subjects are mixed up in the most inextricable confusion. In the preceding book we defined the relation in which interest stands to profits. We found that the gross profit of capital might be distinguished into three parts, which are respectively the remuneration for risk, for trouble, and for the capital itself, and may be termed insurance, wages of superintendence, an interest. After making compensation for risk, that is, after covering the average losses to which capital is exposed either by the general circumstances of society or by the hazards of the particular employment, there remains a surplus, which partly goes to repay the owner of the capital for his abstinence, and partly the employer of it for his time and trouble. How much goes to the one and how much to the other is shown by the amount of the remuneration which, when the two functions are separated, the owner of capital can obtain from the employer for its use. This is evidently a question of demand and supply. Nor have demand and supply any different meaning or effect in this case from what they have in all others. The rate of interest will be such as to equalize the demand for loans with the supply of them. It will be such that, exactly as much as some people are desirous to borrow at that rate, others shall be willing to lend. If there is more offered than demanded, interest will fall. If more is demanded than offered, it will rise, and in both cases to the point at which the equation of supply and demand is re-established. The desire to borrow and the willingness to lend are more or less influenced by every circumstance which affects the state or prospects of industry or commerce, either generally or in any of their branches. The rate of interest, therefore, on good security, which alone we have here to consider, for interest in which considerations of risk bear a part may swell to any amount, is seldom, in the great centers of money transactions, precisely the same for two days together, as is shown by the never-ceasing variations in the quoted prices of the funds and other negotiable securities. Nevertheless there must be, as in other cases of value, some rate which, in the language of Adam Smith and Ricardo, may be called the natural rate some rate about which the market rate oscillates and to which it always tends to return. This rate partly depends on the amount of accumulation going on in the hands of persons who cannot themselves attend to the employment of their savings, and partly on the comparative taste existing in the community for the active pursuits of industry, or for the leisure, ease, and independence of an annuitant. Section 2. Circumstances which determine the permanent demand and supply of loans. In ordinary circumstances, the more thriving producers and traders have their capital fully employed, and many are able to transact business to a considerably greater extent than they have capital for. These are naturally borrowers, and the amount which they desire to borrow and can give security for constitutes the demand for loans on account of productive employment. To these must be added the loans required by government, and by landowners or other unproductive consumers who have good security to give. This constitutes the mass of loans for which there is an habitual demand. Now it is conceivable that there might exist in the hands of persons disinclined or disqualified for engaging personally in business, one, a mass of capital equal to and even exceeding this demand. In that case there would be an habitual excess of competition on the part of lenders, 
and the rate of interest would bear a low proportion to the rate of profit. Interest would be forced down to the point which would either tempt borrowers to take a greater amount of loans than they had a reasonable expectation of being able to employ in their business, or would so discourage a portion of the lenders as to make them either forbear to accumulate or endeavor to increase their income by engaging in business on their own account and incurring the risks, if not the labors, of industrial employment. Comment. The low rates of interest rather tempt people to take some additional risk and enter into investments which offer a higher rate of dividends, so that a period of low interest is a time when speculative enterprises find victims, and then by bad and worthless investments much of the loanable funds is actually lost, thereby reducing the total quantity of loans more nearly to that demand which will give an ordinary rate of interest. In comment. 2. On the other hand, the capital owned by persons who prefer lending it at interest, or whose avocations prevent them from personally superintending its employment, may be short of the habitual demand for loans. It may be in great part absorbed by the investments afforded by the public debt and by mortgages, and the remainder may not be sufficient to supply the wants of commerce. If so, the rate of interest will be raised so high as in some way to re-establish the equilibrium. When there is only a small difference between interest and profit, many borrowers may no longer be willing to increase their responsibilities and involve their credit for so small a remuneration, or some who would otherwise have engaged in business may prefer leisure and become lenders instead of borrowers, or others under the inducement of high interest and easy investment for their capital may retire from business earlier and with smaller fortunes than they otherwise would have done. Or lastly, instead of capital being afforded by persons not in business, the affording it may itself become a business. A portion of the capital employed in trade may be supplied by a class of professional money lenders. These money lenders, however, must have more than a mere interest. They must have the ordinary rate of profit on their capital, risk and all other circumstances being allowed for. For it can never answer to any one who borrows for the purposes of his business to pay a full profit for capital from which he will only derive a full profit in money lending as an employment for the regular supply of trade cannot therefore be carried on except by persons who, in addition to their own capital, can lend their credit, or, in other words, the capital of other people. A bank which lends its notes lends capital which it borrows from the community and for which it pays no interest. Comment. Of late years, however, banks are generally not permitted to issue notes on their simple credit. That privilege has been so often abused in this country that now in the national banking system, a separate part of the resources are set aside for the security of the circulating notes, as is also true of the Bank of England since 1844. It is not generally true, then, that banks now create the means to make loans by issuing notes by which they borrow capital from the community without paying interest. They do, however, depend almost entirely on deposits. A bank of deposit lends capital which it collects from the community in small parcels, sometimes without paying any interest, and, if it does pay interest, it still pays much less than it receives, for the depositors who in any other way could mostly obtain for such small balances no interest worth taking any trouble for, are glad to receive even a little. Having this subsidiary resource, the bankers are enabled to obtain, by lending at interest, the ordinary rate of profit on their own capital. The disposable capital deposited in banks, together with the funds belonging to those who either from necessity or preference live upon the interest of their property, constitute the general loan fund of the country, and the amount of this aggregate fund when set against the habitual demands of producers and dealers, and those of the government and of unproductive consumers, determines the permanent or average rate of interest which must always be such as to adjust these two amounts to one another. But while the whole of this mass of lent capital takes effect upon the permanent rate of interest, the fluctuations depend almost entirely upon the portion which is in the hands of bankers, for it is that portion almost exclusively which being lent for short times only is continually in the market seeking an investment. The capital of those who live on the interest of their own fortunes has generally sought and found some fixed investment such as the public funds, mortgages, or the bonds of public companies, which investment, except under peculiar temptations or necessities, is not changed. Section 3. Circumstances which determine the fluctuations. Fluctuations in the rate of interest arise from variations either in the demand for loans or in the supply. The supply is liable to variation, though less so than the demand. The willingness to lend is greater than usual at the commencement of a period of speculation, 
and much less than usual during the revulsion which follows. In speculative times money lenders, as well as other people, are inclined to extend their business by stretching their credit. They lend more than usual. Just as other classes of dealers and producers employ more than usual, of capital which does not belong to them. Accordingly these are the times when the rate of interest is low, though for this too, as we shall immediately see, there are other causes. During the revulsion, on the contrary, interest always rises inordinately, because while there is a most pressing need on the part of many persons to borrow, there is a general disinclination to lend. Footnote. The rate of interest at such crises in New York has several times risen to 400 or 500 per cent per annum. End footnote. This disinclination, when at its extreme point, is called a panic. It occurs when a succession of unexpected failures has created in the mercantile, and sometimes also in the non-mercantile public, a general distrust in each other's solvency, disposing every one not only to refuse fresh credit, except on very onerous terms, but to call in, if possible, all credit which he has already given. Deposits are withdrawn from banks, notes are returned on the issuers in exchange for specie, bankers raise their rate of discount and withhold their customary advances, merchants refuse to renew mercantile bills. At such times the most calamitous consequences were formerly experienced from the attempt of the law to prevent more than a certain limited rate of interest from being given or taken. Persons who could not borrow at five per cent had to pay not six or seven, but ten or fifteen per cent, to compensate the lender for risking the penalties of the law, or had to sell securities or goods for ready money at a still greater sacrifice. Comment. The pernicious and hurtful custom exists in various states in this country of making any interest beyond a certain rate illegal. When it is remembered that legitimate business is often largely done on credit until the proceeds of goods sold on credit are collected, the rate of interest from day to day is very important to trade. So, when there is a sudden demand for loans, a rate higher than the legal one will certainly be paid, and the law violated if the getting of a loan is absolutely necessary to save the borrower from commercial ruin. The effect of a legal rate is to stop loans at the very time when loans are most essential to the business public. It would be far better to adopt such a sliding scale as exists at great European banks, which allows the rate of interest to rise with the demand. No one then with good security need want loans if he is willing to pay the high rates, and those not really in need will defer their demand until the sudden emergency is passed. Already in New York the legal penalty has been removed for loaning at higher than the legal rates when charged upon call loans and it has mitigated the extreme fluctuations of the rate in a market when financial necessity is contending against the law. End comment. Except at such periods, the amount of capital disposable on loan is subject to little other variation than that which arises from the gradual process of accumulation, which process, however, in the great commercial countries is sufficiently rapid to account for the almost periodical recurrence of these fits of speculation since when a few years have elapsed without a crisis and no new and tempting channel for investment has been opened in the meantime there is always found to have occurred in those few years so large an increase of capital seeking investment as to have lowered considerably the rate of interest whether indicated by the prices of securities or by the rate of discount on bills and this diminution of interest tempts the possessors to incur hazards in hopes of a more considerable return the demand for loans varies much more largely than the supply, and embraces longer cycles of years and its aberrations. A time of war, for example, is a period of unusual drafts on the loan market. The government at such times generally incurs new loans, and as these usually succeed each other rapidly as long as the war lasts, the general rate of interest is kept higher in war than in peace, without reference to the rate of profit and productive industry extended of its usual supplies. Comment. The United States during the late war found that it could not borrow at even six or seven per cent. By receiving depreciated paper at par for its bonds, it really agreed to pay six gold dollars on each loan of one hundred dollars in paper, worth perhaps at the worst only forty gold dollars, which was equivalent to fifteen per cent. This high rate was largely due to the weakened credit of the government, but still it remains true that the rate was higher because the United States was in the market as a competitor for large loans. Now the government can refund its bonds at 3%. Nor does the influence of these loans altogether cease when the government ceases to contract others. 
for those already contracted continue to afford an investment for a greatly increased amount of the disposable capital of the country, which if the national debt were paid off would be added to the mass of capital seeking investment, and, independently of temporary disturbance, could not but to some extent permanently lower the rate of interest. Comment the rapid payment of the public debt by the United States, $137,823,253 in 1882 and 1883, and more than $100,000,000 in 1883-1884, has taken away the former investment for enormous sums of loanable funds, and to the same extent increased the supply in the market. Without doubt this aids in making the present rate of interest a very low one. Whether the rate will remain permanently lower, however, will depend upon whether the field of investment in the United States is already practically occupied. We believe it is not. End comment. The same effect on interest which is produced by government loans for war expenditure is produced by the sudden opening of any new and generally attractive mode of permanent investment. The only instance of the kind in recent history, on a scale comparable to that of the war loans, is the absorption of capital in the construction of railways. This capital must have been principally drawn from the deposits in banks, or from savings which would have gone into deposit, and which were destined to be ultimately employed in buying securities from persons who would have employed the purchase money in discounts or other loans at interest. In either case it was a draft on the general loan fund. It is in fact evident that unless savings were made expressly to be employed in railway adventure, the amount thus employed must have been derived either from the actual capital of persons in business or from capital which would have been lent to persons in business. Section 4. The rate of interest not really connected with the value of money but often confounded with it. From the preceding considerations it would be seen, even if it were not otherwise evident, how great an error it is to imagine that the rate of interest bears any necessary relation to the quantity or value of the money in circulation. An increase of the currency has in itself no effect, and is incapable of having any effect on the rate of interest. A paper currency issued by the government in the payment of its ordinary expenses, in however great excess it may be issued, affects the rate of interest in no manner whatever. It diminishes indeed the power of money to buy commodities, but not the power of money to buy money. If a hundred dollars will buy a perpetual annuity of four dollars a year, a depreciation which makes the hundred dollars worth only half as much as before, has precisely the same effect on the four dollars, and therefore cannot alter the relation between the two. Unless indeed it is known and reckoned upon that the depreciation will only be temporary, for people certainly might be willing to lend the depreciated currency on cheaper terms if they expected to be repaid in money of full value. In considering the effect produced by the proceedings of banks in encouraging the excesses of speculation, an immense effect is usually attributed to their issues of notes. But until of late hardly any attention was paid to the management of their deposits, though nothing is more certain than that their imprudent extensions of credit take place more frequently by means of their deposits than of their issues, says Mr. Took. Supposing all the deposits received by a banker to be in coin, is he not, just as much as the issuing banker, exposed to the importunity of customers, whom it may be impolitic to refuse for loans or discounts, or to be tempted by a high interest, and may he not be induced to encroach so much upon his deposits as to leave him, under not improbable circumstances, unable to meet the demands of his depositors. Comment. In truth, the most difficult questions of banking center around the functions of discount and deposit. The separation of the issue from the banking department by the Act of 1844, which renewed the charter of the Bank of England, makes this perfectly clear. After entirely removing from their effect on credit all influences due to issues, England has had the same difficulties to encounter as before, which shows that the real question is concerned with the two essential functions of banking, discount and deposit. Since 1844 there have been the commercial disturbances of 1847, 1857, 1866, and 1873. Although no expansion of notes without a corresponding deposit of specie is possible. End comment. Section 5. The rate of interest determines the price of land and of securities. Before quitting the general subject of this chapter, I will make the obvious remark that the rate of interest determines the value and price of all those saleable articles which are desired and bought, not for themselves, 
but for the income which they are capable of yielding. The public funds, shares in joint stock companies, and all descriptions of securities are at a high price in proportion as the rate of interest is low. They are sold at the price which will give the market rate of interest on the purchase money, with allowance for all differences in the risk incurred or in any circumstance of convenience. The price of land, mines, and all other fixed sources of income depends in like manner on the rate of interest. Land usually sells at a higher price in proportion to the income afforded by it than the public funds, not only because it is thought even in England to be somewhat more secure, but because ideas of power and dignity are associated with its possession. But these differences are constant, or nearly so, and in the variations of price land follows, coteris paribus, the permanent, though of course not the daily variations of the rate of interest. When interest is low, land will naturally be dear. When interest is high, land will be cheap. Comment. A lot of land which fifty years ago gave an annual return of one hundred dollars, if ten per cent was then the common rate of interest, would sell for one thousand dollars. If the return from the land remains the same, one hundred dollars today, and if the usual rate of interest is now five per cent, the same piece of land, therefore, would sell for two thousand dollars, since one hundred dollars is five per cent of two thousand. The price of a bond, it may be said, also varies with the time it has to run. At the same rate of interest, a bond running for a long term of years is better for an investment than one for a short term. The lumberman who looks at two trees of equal diameter at the base estimates the total value of each according to the height of the tree. Then again a bond running for a short term may be worth less than one for a long term even though the first bears a higher rate of interest. That is, to resume the illustration, one tree not rising very high, although larger at the bottom, may not contain so many square feet as another with perhaps a less diameter at the bottom, but which stretches much higher up into the air. In comment. End of chapter 19. Recording by Philip Gould. Book Three, Chapter Twenty of Principles of Political Economy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill. Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Section Forty Two. Book Three, Chapter Twenty of the competition of different countries in the same market. Section 1. Causes which enable one country to undersell another. In the phraseology of the mercantile system, there is no word of more frequent recurrence or more perilous import than the word underselling. To undersell other countries not to be undersold by other countries, were spoken of, and are still very often spoken of, almost as if they were the sole purposes for which production and commodities exist. Note. Nations may, like individual dealers, be competitors, with opposite interests, in the markets of some commodities while in others they are in the more fortunate relation of reciprocal customers. The benefit of commerce does not consist, as it was once thought to do, in the commodities sold. But since the commodities sold are the means of obtaining those which are bought, a nation would be cut off from the real advantage of commerce, the imports, if it could not induce other nations to take any of its commodities in exchange, and in proportion, as the competition of other countries compels it to offer its commodities on cheaper terms, on pain of not selling them at all, the imports, which it obtains by its foreign trade, are procured at greater cost. End of note. One country, A, can only undersell another b in a given market to the extent of entirely expelling her from it on two conditions one in the first place she a must have a greater advantage than the second country b 
in the production of the article exported by both meaning by a greater advantage as has been already so fully explained not absolutely but in comparison with other commodities and two in the second place she must be her a's relation with the customer country in respect to the demand for each other's products and such the consequent state of international values as to give away to the customer country more than the whole advantage possessed by the rival country b otherwise the rival will still be able to hold her ground in the market note let us suppose a trade between england and the united states in iron and wheat england being capable of producing ten hundred weights of iron at the same cost of fifteen bushels of wheat the united states at the same cost as twenty bushels and the two commodities being exchanged between the two countries cost of carriage apart at some intermediate rate say ten for seventeen the united states could not be permanently undersold in the english market and expelled from it unless by a country such as india which offered not merely more than seventeen but more than twenty bushels of wheat for ten one hundred weights of iron short of that the competition would only oblige the united states to pay dearer for iron but would not disable her from exporting wheat the country therefore which could undersell the united states must in the first place be able to produce wheat at less cost compared with iron than the united states herself and in the next place must have such a demand for iron or other english commodities as would compel her even when she became sole occupant of the market to give a greater advantage to england than the united states could give by resigning the whole of hers to give for example twenty-one bushels for ten hundredweights for if not if for example the equation of international demand after the united states was excluded gave a ratio of eighteen for ten the united states would now be the underselling nation and there would be a point perhaps nineteen for ten at which both countries would be able to maintain their ground and to sell in england enough wheat to pay for the iron or other english commodities for which on these newly adjusted terms of interchange they had a demand in like manner england as an exporter of iron could only be driven from the american market by some rival whose superior advantages in the production of iron enabled her and the intensity of whose demand for american produce compelled her to offer ten hundred weights of iron not merely for less than seventeen bushels of wheat but for less than fifteen in that case england could no longer carry on the trade without loss but in any case short of this she would be merely obliged to give to the united states more iron for less wheat than she had previously given End of note. it thus appears that the alarm of being permanently undersold may be taken much too easily may be taken when the thing really to be anticipated is not the loss of the trade but the minor inconvenience of carrying it on at a diminished advantage an inconvenience chiefly falling on the consumers of foreign commodities and not on the producers or sellers of the exported article it is no sufficient ground of apprehension to the american producers to find that some other country can sell wheat in foreign markets at some particular time a trifle cheaper than they can themselves afford to do in the existing state of prices in the united states suppose them to be temporarily unsold and their exports diminished the imports will exceed the exports there will be a new distribution of the precious metals prices will fall and as all the money expenses of the american producers will be diminished they will be able if the case falls short of that stated in the preceding paragraph again to compete with their rivals 
the loss which the united states will incur will not fall upon the exporters but upon those who consume imported commodities who with money incomes reduced in amount will have to pay the same or even an increased price for all things produced in foreign countries note but the business world would regard what was going on under economic laws as a great and dreaded disaster if it means that prices were to fall and gold leave the country those holding large stocks of goods would for that time suffer and so at first it might really happen that exporters in the sense of exporting agents not the producers perhaps of the exportable article would incur a loss in the end of course the consumers of imports suffer but temporarily and on the face of it exporters do lose end of note section two high wages do not prevent one country from underselling another according to the preceding doctrine a country cannot be undersold in any commodity unless the rival country has a stronger inducement than itself for devoting its labor and capital to the production of the commodity arising from the fact that by doing so it occasions a greater saving of labor and capital to be shared between itself and its customers a greater increase of the aggregate produce of the world the underselling therefore though a loss to the undersold country is an advantage to the world at large the substituted commerce being one which economizes more of the labor and capital of mankind and adds more to their collective wealth than the commerce superseded by it the advantage of course consists in being able to produce the commodity of better quality or with less labor compared with other things or perhaps not with less labor but in less time with a less prolonged detention of the capital employed this may arise from greater natural advantages such as soil climate richness of mines superior capability either natural or acquired in the laborers better division of labor and better tools or machinery but there is no place left in this theory for the case of lower wages this however in the theories commonly current is a favorite cause of underselling we continually hear of the disadvantage under which the american producer labors both in foreign markets and even in his own through the lower wages paid by his foreign rivals these lower wages we are told enable or are always on the point of enabling them to sell at lower prices and to dislodge the american manufacturers from all markets in which he is not artificially protected note it will be remembered that as we have before seen international trade in actual practice depends on comparative prices within the same country even though the exporter may not consciously make a comparison we send wheat abroad because it is low in price relatively to certain manufactured goods that is we send the wheat but we do not send the manufactured goods but so far this is considering only the comparative prices in the same country yet we shall fail to realize in actual practice the application of the above principles when we use the terms prices and money if we do not admit that there is in the matter of underselling a comparison also between the absolute price of the goods in one country and the absolute price of the same goods in the competing country for example wheat is not shipped to england unless the price is lower here than there if india or morocco were to send wheat into the english market in close competition with the united states and the price were to fall in london it would mean that if we continued our shipments of wheat to england we must part with our wheat at a less advantage in the international exchange in the illustration already used we must for example offer more than seventeen bushels of wheat for ten hundredweights of iron 
the fall in the price of wheat without any change in that of iron implies the necessity of offering a greater quantity of wheat for the same quantity of iron perhaps nineteen or twenty bushels for ten one hundred weights of iron if the price went so low as to require twenty-one bushels to pay for ten one hundred weights of iron then we should be entirely undersold and the price here as compared with the price in london would be an indication of the fact so that the comparison of prices here with prices abroad is merely a register of the terms at which our international exchanges are performed but not the cause of the existence of the international trade if the price falls so low in a foreign market that we cannot sell wheat there it simply means that we have reached in the exchange ratios the limit of our comparative advantages in wheat and iron so that we are obliged to offer twenty or more bushels of wheat for ten hundredweights of iron but in all this it must be noted that this price must include the return to capital also and that it must be equal to the usual reward for capital in other competing industries that is the ordinary rate of profit in exporting wheat from the united states the capital engaged will insist on getting the rate of profit to be found in other occupations to which the capital can go in the united states now the price if it stands for the value which is supposed to be governed by cost of production in this case is the sum out of which wages and profits are paid if the price were to fall in the foreign market then there might not be the means with which to pay the usual rate of wages and the usual rate of profit also then we should probably hear of complaints by the shippers that there is no profit in the exportation of wheat and of a falling off in the trade in other words as the capitalist is the one who manages the operation and is the one first affected the diminution of advantage in foreign trade arising from competition generally shows itself first in lessened profits the price then is the means by which we determine whether a certain article gives us that comparative advantage which will ensure a gain from international trade an exportable article whose price in this country is low since it is for this reason selected as an export is one whose cost is low if the cost be low it means that the industry is very productive that the same capital and labor produce more for their exertion in this than in other industries and yet it is precisely in this most productive industry that higher wages and profits can be and are paid although each article is sold at a low price the great quantity produced makes the total sum or value out of which the industrial rewards profits and wages are paid large that is the price may be very low lower also in direct comparison with prices abroad and yet pay the rate of wages and profits current in this country consequently although wages and profits may be very high relatively to older countries in those industries of the united states whose productiveness is great yet the very fact of this low cost and consequently this low price where competition is effective is that which fits the commodity for exportation we are therefore inevitably led to a position in which we see that high wages and low prices naturally go together in an exportable commodity in practice certainly the high wages do not by raising the price prevent us by comparing our price with english prices from sending goods abroad because we send goods abroad from our most productive employments as an illustration of this principle it is found that the leading exports of the united states in eighteen eighty three were cotton breadstuffs provisions tobacco mineral oils and wood but since a direct comparison is in practice made between prices here and prices in england for example 
in order to determine whether the trade can be a profitable one, we constantly hear it is said that we cannot send goods abroad because our labor is so dear. It need scarcely be observed that we do not hear this from those engaged in any of the extractive industries just mentioned as furnishing large exports, which are admittedly very productive. It is generally heard in regard to certain kinds of manufactured goods. The difficulty arises not with regard to articles in which we have the greatest advantage in productiveness, but those in which we have a less advantage if the majority of occupations are so productive as to assure a generally high reward to labor and capital throughout the country these less advantageously situated industries not being so productive as others either from lack of skill or good management or high cost of machinery and materials or peculiarities of climate or heavy taxation cannot pay the usual high reward to labor and at the same time get for the capitalist the same high reward he can everywhere else receive at home for at a price low enough to warrant an exportation the quantity made by a given amount of labor and capital does not yield a total value so great as is given in the majority of other occupations to the same amount of labor and capital and out of which the usual high wages and profits can be paid. The less productiveness of an industry, compared with other industries in the same country, then, is the real cause which prevents it from competing with foreign countries, consistently with receiving the ordinary rate of profit. It is the high rate of profits, as well as the high rate of wages common in the country, which prevents selling abroad. It is absurd to say that it is only high wages. It is just as much high profits. Of course, if the less productive industries wish to compete with England, and if they pay, as we know they must, the high rate of wages due to the general productiveness of our country's industries, they must submit to less profits for the pleasure of having that particular desire. It is not possible that we should produce everything equally well here, nor is it possible that England should produce everything equally well. If we wish to send any goods at all to England, we must receive some goods from her. In order to get the gain arising from our productiveness, we must earnestly wish that England should have some commodity also in which she has a comparative advantage in order that any trade whatever may exist. It is not, however, worth while, in my opinion, to go on in this discussion to consider the position of those who would shut us off from any and all foreign trade. Our present high wages should be a cause for congratulation, because they are due to the generally high productiveness of our resources, or, in other words, due to low cost, and it is to be hoped that they may long continue high. We do not seem to be in imminent danger of not having goods, which we can export, in quantities which will buy for us all we may wish to import from abroad. So long as wages continue high, we may possibly be unwilling to see gratified that false and ignorant desire which leads some people to think that we ought to produce equally well with any competitor in the world everything that is made if as was pointed out under the discussion of cost of labor we must necessarily connect with efficiency of labor all natural advantages under which labor works it is easy to see that high wages are entirely consistent with low prices and that high wages do not prevent us today from having an hitherto unequaled export trade even if all wages and all profits were lower, it would, however, affect all industries alike. Some would still be more productive relatively to others, and the same inequality would remain. If, however, we learn to use our materials better, use machinery with more effect on the quantity produced, adapt our industries to our climate, 
get the raw products more cheaply, free ourselves from excessive and unreasonable taxation, it would be difficult to say what commodities we might not be able eventually to manufacture in competition with the rest of the world. For we have scarcely ever, as a country, had the advantage of such conditions to aid us in our foreign trade. Mr. Mill now goes on to consider the suggestive fact that wages are higher in England than on the continent, and yet that the English have no difficulty in underselling their continental rivals. End of note. Before examining this opinion on grounds of principle, it is worth while to bestow a moment's consideration upon it as a question of fact. Is it true that the wages of manufacturing labor are lower in foreign countries than in England, in any sense in which low wages are an advantage to the capitalist? The artisan of Ghent or Lyons may earn less wages in a day, but does he not do less work? Degrees of efficiency considered, does his labor cost less to his employer? Though wages may be lower on the continent, is not the cost of labor, which is the real element in the competition, very nearly the same? That it is so seems the opinion of competent judges, and is confirmed by the very little difference in the rate of profit between England and the continental countries. But if so, the opinion is absurd that English producers can be undersold by their continental rivals from this cause. It is only in America that the supposition is prima facie admissible. In America, wages are much higher than in England, if we mean by wages the daily earnings of a laborer. But the productive power of American labor is so great its efficiency combined with the favorable circumstances in which it is exerted makes it worth so much to the purchaser that the cost of labor is lower in america than in england as is provided by the fact that the general rate of profits and of interest is very much higher section three low wages enable a country to undersell another when peculiar to certain branches of industry. But is it true that low wages, even in the sense of low cost of labor, enable a country to sell cheaper in the foreign market? I mean, of course, low wages which are common to the whole productive industry of the country. If wages in any of the departments of industry which supply exports are kept artificially or by some accidental cause below the general rates of wages in the country, this is a real advantage in the foreign market. It lessens the comparative cost of production of those articles in relation to others, and has the same effect as if their production required so much less labor. Take, for instance, the case of the United States in respect to certain commodities. In that country, tobacco and cotton, two great articles of export, are produced by slave labor, while food and manufacturers generally are produced by free laborers, who either work on their own account or are paid by wages. In spite of the inferior efficiency of slave labor, there can be no reasonable doubt that in a country where the wages of free labor are so high, the work executed by slaves is a better bargain to the capitalist. To whatever extent it is so, the smaller cost of labor, being not general, but limited to those employments, is just as much a cause of cheapness in the products, both in the home and in the foreign market, as if they had been made by a less quantity of labor. If the slaves in the southern states were emancipated, and their wages rose to the general level of the earnings of free labor in America, that country might be obliged to erase some of the slave-grown articles from the catalog of its exports, and would certainly be unable to sell any of them in the foreign markets at the present price. Their cheapness is partly an artificial cheapness, which may be compared to that produced by a bounty on production or on exportation, 
or considering the means by which it is obtained, an apter comparison would be with the cheapness of stolen goods. Note. How far Mr. Mill was in error may be seen by chart number 15, which shows the enormous increase of cotton production under the regime of free labor as compared with that of the slave labor in the United States. The abolition of slavery has been an economic gain to the South. Moreover, the exports of raw cotton have increased from 644 million 327,921 pounds in 1869 to 2,288,075,062 pounds in 1883, while for corresponding years the exports of tobacco increased from 181,527,630 to 235,628,360 pounds. In other words, exports of tobacco were increased by 30%, and those of raw cotton by no less than 255%. Besides, the prices of cotton and tobacco are no higher now than before 1850. End of note. An advantage of a similar economical, though of a very different moral character, is that possessed by domestic manufacturers. Fabrics produced in the leisure hours of families partially occupied in other pursuits, who, not depending for subsistence on the produce of the manufacture, can afford to sell it at any price, however low, for which they think it worth while to take the trouble of producing. The workman of Zurich is today a manufacturer, tomorrow again an agriculturalist, and changes his occupations with the seasons in a continual round manufacturing industry and tillage advance hand in hand in inseparable alliance and in this union of the two occupations the secret may be found why the simple and unlearned swiss manufacturer can always go on competing and increasing in prosperity in the face of those extensive establishments fitted out with great economic and what is still more important intellectual resources in the case of these domestic manufacturers, the comparative cost of production on which the interchange between countries depends is much lower than in proportion to the quantity of labor employed. The work people, looking to the earnings of their loom for a part only, if for any part, of their actual maintenance, can afford to work for a less remuneration than the lowest rate of wages which can permanently exist in the employments by which the laborers has to support the whole expense of a family. Working as they do, not for an employer but for themselves, they may be said to carry on the manufacture at no cost at all, except the small expense of a loom and of the material and the limit of possible cheapness is not the necessity of living by their trade, but that of earning enough by the work to make that social employment of their leisure hours not disagreeable. Section 4. But not when common to all. These two cases, of slave labor and of domestic manufactures, exemplify the conditions under which low wages enable a country to sell its commodities cheaper in foreign markets and consequently to undersell its rivals or to avoid being undersold by them but no such advantage is conferred by low wages when common to all branches of industry general low wages never caused any country to undersell its rivals nor did general high wages ever hinder it from doing so. To demonstrate this, we must turn to an elementary principle which was discussed in a former chapter. General low wages do not cause low prices, nor high wages high prices within the country itself. General prices are not raised by a rise of wages, any more than they would be raised by an increase of the quantity of labor required in all production. Expenses which affect all commodities equally have no influence on prices. If the maker of broadcloth or cutlery, and nobody else, had to pay higher wages, the price of his commodity would rise, just as it would if he had to employ more labor, 
because otherwise he would gain less profit than other producers, and nobody would engage in the employment. But if everybody has to pay higher wages, or everybody to employ more labor, the lost must be submitted to. As it affects everybody alike, no one can hope to get rid of it by a change of employment. Each, therefore, resigns himself to a diminution of profits, and prices remain as they were. In like manner, general low wages, or a general increase in the productiveness of labor, does not make prices low, but profits high. If wages fall, meaning here by wages the cost of labor, why on that account should the producer lower his price? He will be forced, it may be said, by the competition of other capitalists who will crowd into his employment. But other capitalists are also paying lower wages, and by entering into competition with them, they would gain nothing but what they are gaining already. The rate, then, at which labor is paid, as well as the quantity of it which is employed, affects neither the value nor the price of the commodity produced, except in so far as it is peculiar to that commodity, and not common to commodities generally. Note. However, without there being any change in the productiveness of any industry, if the price of the article should rise, for instance, from an increased demand, that would make the total value arising from the products of the industry larger in its purchasing power, and so there will be a larger sum to be divided among labor and capital. If there be free competition, more capital would move into this one industry under the hope of a larger profit, and so wages would rise. Therefore, it is possible that high wages and high prices may go together, but not as cause and effect. In fact, the change in price generally precedes the change in wages. On the other hand, while low wages are not the cause of low prices, nor high wages of high prices, yet the two may be found together, as both do to a common cause, namely, the small or great value of the total product. End of note. Since low wages are not a cause of low prices in the country itself, so neither do they cause it to offer its commodities in foreign markets at a lower price. It is quite true that if the cost of labor is lower in America than in England, America could sell her cottons to Cuba at a lower price than England, and still gain as high a profit as the English manufacturer. But it is not with the profit of the English manufacturer that the American cotton spinner will make his comparison. It is with the profits of the other American capitalists. These enjoy, in common with himself, the benefit of a lower cost of labor, and have accordingly a high rate of profit. This high profit the cotton spinner must also have. He will not content himself with the English profit. It is true he may go on for a time at that lower rate rather than change his employment, and trade may be carried on some time for a long period, at a much lower profit than that for which it would have been originally engaged in. Countries which have a low cost of labor and high profits do not for that reason undersell others, but they do oppose a more obstinate resistance to being undersold, because the producers can often submit to a diminution of profit without being unable to live, and even to thrive by their business. But this is all which their advantage does for them, and in this resistance they will not long persevere, when a change of times, which may give them equal profits with the rest of their countrymen, has become manifestly hopeless. Section 5 low profits as affecting the carrying trade. It is worth while also to notice a third class of small, but in this case mostly independent communities, which have supported and enriched themselves almost without any productions of their own, except ships and marine equipments, by a mere carrying trade and commerce of entrepot by buying the produce of one country to sell it at a profit in another. Such were Venice and the Hansa towns. When the Venetians became the agents of the general commerce of southern Europe, 
they had scarcely any competitors the thing would not have been done at all without them and there was really no limit to their profits except the limit to what the ignorant feudal nobility could and would give for the unknown luxuries then first presented to their sight at a later period competition arose and the profit of this operation like that of others became amenable to natural laws the carrying trade was taken up by holland a country with productions of its own and a large accumulated capital the other nations of europe also now had capital to spare and were capable of conducting their foreign trade for themselves but holland having from the variety of circumstances a lower rate of profit at home could afford to carry for other countries at a smaller advance on the original cost of the goods than would have been required by their own capitalists and holland therefore engrossed the greatest part of the carrying trade of all those countries which did not keep it to themselves by navigation laws constructed like those of england for the express purpose note in the united states early in the century a retaliatory policy against england gave us a body of navigation laws copied after the medieval statutes of england and the continent which still remain on the statute book they do not permit an american to buy a vessel abroad and sail it under our flag without paying enormous duties a provision which is intended to foster shipbuilding in the united states even with this legislation ships as a fact are not built here for the foreign trade and our shipbuilders practically supply the coasting trade only which is not open to foreigners the ability to buy ships anywhere and enter them to the registry under our flag free of duty is what is meant by the demand for free ships this however has to do with ship building but ship owning or ship sailing is quite distinct from it the ability to get as great a return from capital and labor invested in a ship as from other occupations open to americans is another thing even if we had free ships the higher returns in other industries in our country particularly as regards profits might cause capitalists naturally to neglect a less for a more productive business in eighteen eighty four congress has very properly taken away many vexatious restrictions upon ships which diminished the returns from ship sailing and it remains to be seen whether we can thereby regain any of our foreign carrying trade at present we have a very small tonnage even in that part of the shipping engaged in carrying our own goods end of note end of section forty two Book three, chapter twenty one of Principles of Political Economy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill. Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Book three, chapter twenty one of Distribution is Affected by Exchange. Section one exchange and money make no difference in the law of wages the division of the produce among the three classes laborers capitalists and landlords when considered without any reference to exchange appeared to depend on certain general laws it is fit that we should now consider whether these same laws still operate when the distribution takes place through the complex mechanism of exchange and money or whether the properties of the mechanism interfere with and modify the presiding principles the primary division of the produce of human exertion and frugality is as we have seen into three shares wages profits and rents and these shares are portioned out to the persons entitled to them in the form of money and by a process of exchange or rather the capitalist with whom in the usual arrangements of society the produce remains pays in money to the other two sharers the market value of their labor and land 
if we examined on what the pecuniary value of labor and the pecuniary value of the use of land depend, we shall find that it is on the very same causes by which we found that wages and rent would be regulated if there were no money and no exchange of commodities. It is evident in the first place that the law of wages is not affected by the existence or non-existence of exchange or money. Wages depend on the ratio between population and capital, taking into account the nature of a country's industries, and would do so if all the capital in the world were the property of one association, or if the capitalists among whom it is shared maintained each an establishment for the production of every article consumed in the community, exchange of commodities having no existence. As the ratio between capital and population everywhere but in new colonies depends on the strength of the checks by which the too rapid increase of population is restrained, it may be said, popularly speaking, that wages depend on the checks to population, that when the check is not death by starvation or disease, wages depend on the prudence of the laboring people, and that wages in any country are habitually at the lowest rate to which, in that country, the laborer will suffer them to be depressed, rather than put a restraint upon multiplication. What is here meant, however, by wages is the laborer's real scale of comfort, the quantity he obtains of the things which nature or habit has made necessary or agreeable to him. Wages in the sense in which they are of importance to the receiver. In the sense in which they are of importance to the payer, they do not depend exclusively on such simple principles. Wages in the first sense, the wages on which the laborer's comfort depends, we will call real wages or wages in kind. Wages in the second sense we may be permitted to call for the present money wages, assuming, as it is allowable to do, that money remains for the time an invariable standard, no alteration taking place in the conditions under which the circulating medium itself is produced or obtained. If money itself undergoes no variation in cost, the money price of labor is an exact measure of the cost of labor, and may be made use of as a convenient symbol to express it, if the efficiency of labor also be supposed to remain the same. The money wages of labor are a compound result of two elements. First, real wages or wages in kind, or in other words, the quantity which the laborer obtains of the ordinary articles of consumption, and secondly, the money prices of those articles. In all old countries, all countries in which the increase of population is in any degree checked by the difficulty of obtaining subsistence, the habitual money price of labor is that which will just enable the laborers, one with another, to purchase the commodities without which they either cannot or will not keep up the population at its customary rate of increase. Their standard of comfort being given, and by the standard of comfort in a laboring class is meant that rather than forego which they will abstain from multiplication, money wages depend upon the money price and therefore on the cost of production of the various articles which the laborers habitually consume. Because if their wages cannot procure them a given quantity of these, their increase will slacken and their wages rise. Of these articles, food and other agricultural produce are so much the principal as to leave little influence to anything else. It is at this point that we are enabled to invoke the aid of the principles which have been laid down in this third part, the cost of production of food and agricultural produce has been analyzed in a preceding chapter. It depends on the productiveness of the least fertile land, or of the least productively employed portion of capital, which the necessities of society have as yet put in requisition for agricultural purposes. The cost of production of the food grown in these least advantageous circumstances determines, as we have seen, the exchange value and money price of the whole. In any given state, therefore, of the laborer's habits, their money wages depend on the productiveness of the least fertile land, or least productive agricultural capital, on the point which cultivation has reached in its downward progress, in its encroachment on the barren lands, and its gradually increased strain upon the powers of the more fertile. Now the force which urges cultivation in this downward course is the increase of people, while the counterforce which checks the descent is the improvement of agricultural science and practice, enabling the same soil to yield to the same labor more ample returns. The costliness of the most costly part of the produce of cultivation is an exact expression of the state at any given moment of the race which population 
and agricultural skill are always running against each other. Comment. It will be noted in this exposition that Mr. Mill has in view an old country, with a population so dense that numbers are always pressing close upon subsistence, that their wages are so low as to give the laborers little more than the necessary wants of life, that these are not the economic conditions in the United States goes without saying. First of all, the margin of cultivation is high. Only soils of high productiveness are in cultivation, and the returns to labor and capital are, consequently, very large. High wages are found together with low prices of food. The existing population is not so numerous as to require for the cultivation of food any but lands of a very high grade of fertility. The ability to command a high reward for labor, as compared with European industries, owing to the general prevalence of high returns in the United States, has resulted in the establishment of a higher standard for our laborers. The standard being relatively so high, there is no intimate connection between the increase of population here and the price of food. For as a rule, wages are not so low that any change in the cost of producing food would require checks upon population. There is a considerable margin above necessaries in the laborers' real wages in the United States, which may go for comforts, decencies, and amusements. Section 2. In the Law of Rent. The degree of productiveness of this extreme margin is an index to the existing state of the distribution of the produce among the three classes of laborers, capitalists, and landlords. When the demand of an increasing population for more food cannot be satisfied without extending cultivation to less fertile land or incurring additional outlay with a less proportional return on land already in cultivation, it is a necessary condition of this increase of agricultural produce that the value and price of that produce must first rise. The price of food will always, on the average, be such that the worst land and the least productive installment of the capital employed on the better lands shall just replace the expenses with the ordinary profit. If the least favored land and capital just do thus much, all other land and capital will yield an extra profit equal to the proceeds of the extra produce due to their superior productiveness, and this extra profit becomes, by competition, the prize of the landlords. Exchange and money, therefore, make no difference in the law of rent. It is the same as we originally found it. Rent is the extra return made to agricultural capital when employed with peculiar advantages, the exact equivalent of what those advantages enable the producers to economize in the cost of production, the value and price of the produce being regulated by the cost of production, to those producers who have no advantages by the return to that portion of agricultural capital the circumstances of which are the least favorable. Section 3. Nor in the Law of Profits. Wages and rent being thus regulated by the same principles when paid in money, as they would be if apportioned in kind, it follows that profits are so likewise. For the surplus, after replacing wages and paying rent, constitutes profits. We found in the last chapter of the second book that the advances of the capitalist, when analyzed to their ultimate elements, consist either in the purchase or maintenance of labor, or in the profits of former capitalists, and that therefore profits in the last resort depend upon the cost of labor, falling as that rises and rising as it falls. Let us endeavor to trace more minutely the operation of this law. There are two modes in which the cost of labor, which is correctly represented, money being supposed invariable as well as efficiency, by the money wages of the laborer may be increased. The laborer may obtain greater comforts, wages in kind, real wages, may rise, or the progress of population may force down cultivation to inferior soils and more costly processes, thus raising the cost of production, the value, and the price of the chief articles of the laborer's consumption. On either of these suppositions the rate of profit will fall. If the laborer obtains more abundant commodities only by reason of their greater cheapness, if he obtains a greater quantity but not on the whole a greater cost, real wages will be increased but not money wages, and there will be nothing to affect the rate of profit. But if he obtains a greater quantity of commodities of which the cost of production is not lowered, he obtains a greater cost, his money wages are higher. The expense of these increased money wages falls wholly on the capitalist. There are no conceivable means by which he can shake it off. It may be said, it used formerly to be said, 
that he will get rid of it by raising his price. But this opinion we have already and more than once fully refuted. The doctrine indeed that a rise of wages causes an equivalent rise of prices is, as we formerly observed, self-contradictory. For if it did so it would not be a rise of wages. The laborer would get no more of any commodity than he had before. Let his money wages rise ever so much, a rise of real wages would be an impossibility. This being equally contrary to reason and to fact, it is evident that a rise of money wages does not raise prices. That high wages are not a cause of high prices. A rise of general wages falls on profits. There is no possible alternative. Having disposed of the case in which the increase of money wages and of the cost of labor arises from the laborers obtaining more ample wages in kind, let us now suppose it to arise from the increased cost of production of the things which he consumes, owing to an increase of population unaccompanied by an equivalent increase of agricultural skill. The augmented supply required by the population would not be obtained unless the price of food rose sufficiently to remunerate the farmer for the increased cost of production. The farmer, however, in this case, sustains a twofold disadvantage. He has to carry on his cultivation under less favorable conditions of productiveness than before. For this, as it is a disadvantage belonging to him only as a farmer, and not shared by other employers, he will, on the general principles of value, be compensated by a rise of the price of his commodity. Indeed, until this rise has taken place, he will not bring to market the required increase of produce. But this very rise of price involves him in another necessity, for which he is not compensated. He must pay higher money wages to his laborers if they retain the same quantity of real wages. This necessity being common to him with all other capitalists forms no ground for a rise of price. The price will rise until it has placed him in as good a situation, in respect of profits, as other employers of labor. It will rise so as to indemnify him for the increased labor which he must now employ in order to produce a given quantity of food. But the increased wages of that labor are a burden common to all, and for which no one can be indemnified. It will be paid wholly from profits. Thus we see that increased wages, when common to all descriptions of productive laborers, and when really representing a greater cost of labor, are always and necessarily at the expense of profits. And by reversing the cases, we should find in like manner that diminished wages, when representing a really diminished cost of labor, are equivalent to a rise of profits. But the opposition of pecuniary interest thus indicated between the class of capitalists and that of laborers is to a great extent only apparent. Real wages are a very different thing from the cost of labor, and are generally highest at the times and places where, from the easy terms on which the land yields all the produce as yet required from it, the value and price of food being low, the cost of labor to the employer, notwithstanding its ample remuneration, is comparatively cheap, and the rate of profit consequently high, as at present in the United States. We thus obtain a full confirmation of our original theorem that profits depend on the cost of labor, or to express the meaning with still greater accuracy, the rate of profit and the cost of labor vary inversely as one another, and are joint effects of the same agencies, or causes. End of Book 3, Chapter 21 Recording by Philip Gould Book 4, Chapter 1 of Principles of Political Economy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josip. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin Book 4 Influence of the Progress of Society on Production and Distribution Chapter 1 Influence of the Progress of Industry and Population on Values and Prices Section 1 Tendency of the Progress of Society Toward Increased Command Over the Powers of Nature increased security and increased capacity of cooperation in the leading countries of the world and in all others as they come within the influence of those leading countries there is at least one progressive movement 
which continues with little interruption from year to year and from generation to generation, a progress in wealth, an advancement in what is called material prosperity. All the nations which we are accustomed to call civilized increase gradually in production and in population, and there is no reason to doubt that not only these nations will for some time continue so to increase, but that most of the other nations of the world, including some not yet founded, will successively enter upon the same career. It will, therefore, be our first object to examine the nature and consequences of this progressive change, the elements which constitute it, and the effects it produces on the various economical facts of which we have been tracing the laws, and especially on wages, profits, rents, values, and prices. Of the features which characterize this progressive economical movement of civilized nations, that which first excites attention, through its intimate connection with the phenomena of production, is the perpetual, and so far as human foresight can extend, one, the unlimited growth of man's power over nature. Our knowledge of the properties and laws of physical objects shows no sign of approaching its ultimate boundaries. It is advancing more rapidly, and in a greater number of directions at once, than in any previous age or generation, and affording such frequent glimpses of unexplored fields beyond, as to justify the belief that our acquaintance with nature is still almost in its infancy. Another change, which has always hitherto characterized, and will assuredly continue to characterize, the progress of civilized society, is, too, a continual increase of the security of person and property. Of this increased security, one of the most unfailing effects is a great increase both of production and of accumulation. Industry and frugality cannot exist where there is not a preponderant probability that those who labor and spare will be permitted to enjoy. One of the changes which most infallibly attend the progress of modern society is, 3. An improvement in the business capacities of the general mass of mankind. I do not mean that the practical sagacity of an individual human being is greater than formerly. What is lost in the separate efficiency of each is far more than made up by the greater capacity of united action. Works of all sorts, impracticable to the savage or the half-civilized, are daily accomplished by civilized nations, not by any greatness of faculties in the actual agents, but through the fact that each is able to rely with certainty on the others for the portion of the work which they respectively undertake. The peculiar characteristic, in short, of civilized beings is the capacity of cooperation, and this, like other faculties, tends to improve by practice and becomes capable of assuming a constantly wider sphere of action. This progress affords space and scope for an indefinite increase of capital and production, and for the increase of population which is its ordinary accompaniment. That the growth of population will overpass the increase of production, there is not much reason to apprehend. It is, however, quite possible that there might be a great progress in industrial improvement, and in the signs of what is commonly called national prosperity, a great increase of aggregate wealth, and even, in some respects, a better distribution of it, that not only the rich might grow richer, but many of the poor might grow rich, that the intermediate classes might become more numerous and powerful, and the means of enjoyable existence be more and more largely diffused, while yet the great class at the base of the whole might increase in numbers only, and not in comfort nor in cultivation. We must, therefore, in considering the effects of the progress of industry, admit as a supposition, however greatly we deprecate as a fact, an increase of population as long continued as indefinite and possibly even as rapid as the increase of production and accumulation. Section 2. Tendency to a decline of the value and cost of production of all commodities. The changes which the progress of industry causes or presupposes in the circumstances of production 
are necessarily attended with changes in the values of commodities. The permanent values of all things, which are neither under a natural nor under an artificial monopoly, depend, as we have seen, on their cost of production. 1. But the increasing power which mankind are constantly acquiring over nature increases more and more the efficiency of human exertion, or, in other words, diminishes cost of production. All inventions by which a greater quantity of any commodity can be produced with the same labor, or the same quantity with less labor, or which abridge the process, so that the capital employed needs not be advanced for so long a time, lessen the cost of production of the commodity. As, however, value is relative, if inventions and improvements in production were made in all commodities, and all in the same degree, there would be no alteration in values. As for prices, in these circumstances they would be affected or not, according as the improvements in production did or did not extend to the precious metals. If the materials of money were an exception to the general diminution of cost of production, the values of all other things would fall in relation to money. That is, there would be a fall of general prices throughout the world. But if money, like other things, and in the same degree as other things, were obtained in greater abundance and cheapness, prices would be no more affected than values would. Comment. As regards to precious metals, it is to be said that since 1850 there has been a vast increase in their amount, and probably in greater proportion than the need arising from increased transactions. This is certainly true of silver, and it is admitted to be true of gold as late as about 1865. It has been asserted by Mr. Goshen that since then, especially since 1873, gold has not existed in a quantity that would permit it to keep its former proportions to commodities, and that it had appreciated. An appreciation, of course, would show itself in lower gold pieces. On the other hand, gold has, as I think, not appreciated. Prices, even in the collapse of credit after the panic of 1873 down to 1879, were not quite so low as in 1845 to 1850, as is seen by the following table, taken from the London Economist, 2200, indicating the price of a given number of articles in 1845 to 1850, as the basis of the table with which the prices of other years are compared. Here, the author provides a table with two columns, column 1, year, column 2, index numbers. Year, 1845 to 1850, index numbers, 2200. 1857, July 1st, 2996. 1858, January 1st, 2612. 1865, 3575. 1866, 3564. 1867, 3024. 1868, 2682. 1869, 2666. 1870, 2689. 1871, 2590. 1872, 2835. 1873, 2947. 1874, Depression. 2891. 1875, Depression. 2778. 1876, Depression. 2711. 1877, Depression. 2723. 1878, Depression, 
2,529. 1879, Depression, 2,202. 1880, 2,538. 1881, 2,376. 1882, 2,435. 1883, 2,343. But the progress of society, particularly in the direction of improved and cheapened processes of manufacturing, has vastly lowered the cost of a great number of articles of common consumption. The process has been already seen in the diminished charge for railway transportation, see chart number 5. Moreover, the years of a depression are exactly those in which there is always a forced economy and generally form a period in which cheapening goes on at its best. Hence, if prices have had a tendency to fall, owing to the lowered cost of production consequent on improvements, and if they are not, as a rule, lower than in 1850, it shows that they are still supported by the high tide of the great gold production of this century. And even the access to more fertile land in the world has acted to prevent an increase in the prices of agricultural products such as would offset the fall of manufactured goods. That is, the fact that prices have not fallen as much as might be expected indicates that the gold has prevented the lower costs due to the progress of industry from being fully seen. End of comment. Improvements in production are not the only circumstance accompanying the progress of industry, which tends to diminish the cost of producing, or at least of obtaining commodities. 2. Another circumstance is the increase of intercourse between different parts of the world. As commerce extends, and the ignorant attempts to restrain it by tariffs become obsolete, commodities tend more and more to be produced in the places in which their production can be carried on at the least expense of labor and capital to mankind. 3. Much will also depend on the increasing migration of labor and capital to unoccupied parts of the earth, of which the soil, climate, and situation are found, by the ample means of exploration now possessed, to promise not only a large return to industry, but great facilities of producing commodities suited to the markets of old countries. Much as the collective industry of the earth is likely to be increased in efficiency by the extension of science and of the industrial arts, a still more active source of increased cheapness of production will be found, probably for some time to come, in the gradually unfolding consequences of free trade and in the increasing scale on which emigration and colonization will be carried on. From the causes now enumerated, unless counteracted by others, the progress of things enables a country to obtain, at less and less of real cost, not only its own productions, but those of foreign countries. Indeed, Whatever diminishes the cost of its own productions, when of an exportable character, enables it, as we have already seen, to obtain its imports at less real cost. Section 3. Except the products of agriculture and mining, which have a tendency to rise. Are no causes of an opposite character brought into operation by the same progress sufficient, in some cases, not only to neutralize, but to overcome the former, and convert the descending movement of cost of production into an ascending movement, we are already aware that there are such causes, and that, in the case of the most important classes of commodities, food and materials, there is a tendency diametrically opposite to that of which we have been speaking. The cost of production of these commodities tends to increase. This is not a property inherent in the commodities themselves. If population were stationary, and the produce of the earth never needed to be augmented in quantity, 
there would be no cause for greater cost of production. The only products of industry which, if population did not increase, would be liable to a real increase of cost of production, are those which, depending on a material which is not renewed, are either wholly or partially exhaustible, such as coal, and most if not all metals. For even iron, the most abundant as well as most useful of metallic products, which forms an ingredient of most minerals and of almost all rocks, is susceptible of exhaustion so far as regards its richest and most tractable ores. When, however, population increases, as it has never yet failed to do, then comes into effect that fundamental law of production from the soil on which we have so frequently had occasion to expatiate. The law that increased labor in any given state of agricultural skill is attended with a less than proportional increase of produce. The cost of production of the fruits of the earth increases, ceteris paribus, with every increase of the demand. Comment. Mr. Cairns has made some essential contributions to the discussion of changes of value arising from the progress of society. When a colony establishes itself in a new country, the course of its industrial development naturally follows the character of the opportunities offered to industrial enterprise by the environment. These will, of course, vary a great deal, according to the part of the world in which the new society happens to be placed. But speaking broadly, they will be such as to draw the bulk of the industrial activity of the new people into some one or more of those branches of industry which have been conveniently designated extractive. Agriculture, pastoral and mining pursuits, and the cutting of lumber are among the principal of such industries. To these pursuits apply that law of political economy, or more properly, of physical nature, which Mr. Mill has rightly characterized as the most important proposition in economic science, the law, as he phrased it, of diminishing productiveness. It may be thus briefly stated, in any given state of the arts of production, the returns to human industry employed upon natural agents will, up to a certain point, be the maximum which those natural agents cultivated with a degree of skill brought to bear upon them, are capable of yielding. But after this point has been passed, though an increased application of labor and capital will obtain an increased return, it will not obtain a proportionally increased return. On the contrary, every further increase of outlay, always assuming that the skill employed in applying it continues the same as before, will be attended with a return constantly diminishing. What I am now concerned to show is the manner in which, with the progress of society, the law in question affects the course of normal values in all commodities coming under its influence. The class of commodities in the production of which the facilities possessed by new communities, as compared with old, attain their greatest height are those of which timber and meat may be taken as the type, and comprises such articles as wool, game, furs, hides, horns, pitch, resin, etc. The circumstance which most powerfully affects the course of values in the products of extracted industry, and in the commodities just referred to among the rest, is the degree in which they admit of being transported from place to place, that is to say their portableness, depending, as it does, partly on their durability and partly on their bulk. It is found that, taking timber and meat as a type, one possessing portableness in a vastly greater degree than the other, in the early settlement of a new country, the portable article, like timber, at once rises in price to a level lower than that prevailing in old countries only by the cost of transport. On the other hand, perishable articles like meat are confined for a market, if not to the immediate locality where it is produced, at least to the bordering countries. 
and being raised in new countries as very low cost. Their value during the early stages of their growth is necessarily low. But as population advances and agriculture encroaches on the natural pasture lands originally available for the rearing of cattle, still more as it becomes necessary to cultivate land for the purpose of pasture, the cost of meat constantly rises. As population increases, there will be an increased demand for dairy products, eggs, small fruits, fresh vegetables, milk, etc., and thereby it becomes more profitable to employ land near populous centers for such perishable products than for the products of large farming. Almost everyone who knows the high prices of butter, eggs and vegetables in large cities as compared with their prices in country districts is familiar with the phenomena which illustrate this principle. Moreover, as a denser population settles on our western prairies, now given over to ranches and vast pasturing grounds for cattle, since cattle in general require a large extent of land, the cost of meat will rise. The prices of perishable articles, therefore, will rise without any limit except that set by increasing numbers, and cannot be kept down by the force of competition from other distant places, as is the case with such easily transportable things as timber and wool. What has been said of the transportableness of meat, however, is to be modified somewhat by the introduction of improved processes of transporting meat in refrigerator cars, but there still exist commodities of which meat was only taken as a type. End of comment. No tendency of a like kind exists with respect to manufactured articles. The tendency is in the contrary direction. The larger the scale on which manufacturing operations are carried on, the more cheaply they can in general be performed. As manufacturers, however, depend for their materials either upon agriculture, or mining, or the spontaneous produce of the earth, manufacturing industry is subject, in respect of one of its essentials, to the same law as agriculture. But the crude material generally forms so small a portion of the total cost that any tendency which may exist to a progressive increase in that single item is much overbalanced by the diminution continually taking place in all the other elements, to which diminution it is impossible at present to assign any limit. It follows that the exchange values of manufactured articles, compared with the products of agriculture and of mines, have as population and industry advance a certain and decided tendency to fall. Money being a product of mines, it may also be laid down as a rule that manufactured articles tend, as society advances, to fall in money price. The industrial history of modern nations, especially during the last hundred years, fully bears out this assertion. Comment. In regard to manufactures, as opposed to raw products, it is to be remarked that as the course of price in the field of raw products is on the whole upward, so in that of manufactured goods the course is, not less strikingly, in the opposite direction. The reasons of this are exceedingly plain. In the first place, the vision of labor, the first and most powerful of all cheapeners of production, but for which there is in extractive industry but very limited scope finds in manufacturing industry an almost unbounded range for its application. And secondly, it is in manufacturing industry also that machinery, the other great cheapener of production, admits of being employed on the largest scale, and has, in fact, been employed with the most signal success. It follows at once from these facts, taken in connection with the further fact that industrial invention does not take place per saltum, but gradually, one invention ever treading on the heels of another, and that its advance seems to be subject to no limitation, it follows, I say, from these considerations, 
that that portion of the cost of manufactured goods which properly belongs to the manufacturing process must with the progress of society undergo constant diminution in all the great branches of manufacturing industry the portion of the cost incurred in the manufacturing process bears in general a large proportion to that represented by the raw material while the influence of industrial invention in reducing this portion of the cost is as everyone knows great and unremitting in its action as has been said the two great cheapeners of production are division of labor and machinery and the degree in which these admit of being applied to manufacture is mainly dependent upon the scale on which the manufacturing process is carried on those manufacturers therefore that are produced upon a large scale are the sort of manufacturers in which we may expect the greatest reduction in cost in which therefore the fall in price with the progress of society will be most marked but the manufactures which are produced upon the largest scale are those for which there exists the largest demand that is to say are those which enter most extensively into the consumption of the great mass of people they are also i may add those in which a fall in price is apt to stimulate a great increase of demand all the common kinds of clothing furniture and utensils fall within the scope of this remark and it is in these rather than in the commodities consumed exclusively or mainly by the richer classes that we should accordingly expect to find the greatest marvels of cheapening but the articles of common consumption are those in which the amount of manufacture bestowed upon them bears a smaller proportion to the raw material than is the case with the more elaborate manufactures such coarser manufacturers therefore would feel the effects of the advancing cost of the raw material more sensibly than the refined sorts nevertheless it cannot be supposed to compensate the advantages due to the causes i have pointed out which fall to the share of the commoner sorts it is in this class of goods that the most remarkable reductions in price have been accomplished in the past and it is in them probably that we shall witness in the future the greatest results of the same kind End of comment section four that tendency from time to time counteracted by improvements in production whether agricultural produce increases in absolute as well as comparative cost of production depends on the conflict of the two antagonist agencies increase of population and improvement in agricultural skill in some perhaps in most states of society looking at the whole surface of the earth both agricultural skill and population are either stationary or increase very slowly and the cost of production of food therefore is nearly stationary in a society which is advancing in wealth population generally increases faster than agricultural skill and food consequently tends to become more costly but there are times when a strong impulse sets in toward agricultural improvement such an impulse has shown itself in great britain during the last fifteen or twenty years before eighteen forty seven in england and scotland agricultural skill has of late increased considerably faster than population in so much that food and other agricultural produce notwithstanding the increase of people can be grown at less cost than they were thirty years ago and the abolition of the corn laws has given an additional stimulus to the spirit of improvement in some other countries and particularly in france the improvement of agriculture gains ground still more decidedly upon population because though agriculture except in a few provinces advances slowly population advances still more slowly and even with increasing slowness its growth being kept down not by poverty 
which is diminishing, but by prudence. Comment. Moreover, the cheapened cost of transportation has admitted to England and the continent the wheat supplies of our western states at a low price even after having been carried to transatlantic markets. New methods of getting food supplies from foreign countries act equally with improvements at home. End of comment. Section 5. Effect of the progress of society in moderating fluctuations of value. Thus far, of the effect of the progress of society on the permanent or average values and prices of commodities, it remains to be considered in what manner the same progress affects their fluctuations. Concerning the answer to this question, there can be no doubt. It tends in a very high degree to diminish them. In poor and backward societies, as in the East and in Europe during the Middle Ages, extraordinary differences in the price of the same commodity might exist in places not very distant from each other, because the want of roads and canals, the imperfection of marine navigation, and the insecurity of communications generally prevented things from being transported from the places where they were cheap to those where they were dear. The things most liable to fluctuations in value, those directly influenced by the seasons, and especially food, were seldom carried to any great distances. In most years, accordingly, there was, in some part or other of any large country, a real dearth, while a deficiency at all considerable, extending to the whole world, is now a thing almost unknown. In modern times, therefore, there is only dearth where there formerly would have been famine, and sufficiency everywhere where anciently there would have been scarcity in some places and superfluity in others. The same change has taken place with respect to all other articles of commerce. The safety and cheapness of communications, which enable a deficiency in one place to be supplied from the surplus of another, at a moderate or even a small advance on the ordinary price, render the fluctuations of prices much less extreme than formerly. This effect is much promoted by the existence of large capitals, belonging to what are called speculative merchants, whose business it is to buy goods in order to resell them at a profit. These dealers naturally buying things when they are cheapest, and storing them up to be brought again into the market when the price has become unusually high, the tendency of their operations is to equalize price, or at least to moderate its inequalities. The prices of things are neither so much depressed at one time, nor so much raised at another, as they would be if speculative dealers did not exist. Comment Mr. Mill uses the term speculative in a different sense from that which is customary in this country. Merchants who buy outright and store up grain are not speculators in the sense in which the word is used with us. But those gamblers who purchase, for future delivery, grain which they never see, and which they sell in the same way, are here known as speculators. End of comment. It appears, then, that the fluctuations of values and prices arising from variations of supply or from alterations in real, as distinguished from speculative, demand, may be expected to become more moderate as society advances. With regard to those which arise from miscalculation, and especially from the alternations of undue expansion and excessive contraction of credit, which occupy so conspicuous a place among commercial phenomena, the same thing cannot be affirmed with equal confidence. Such vicissitudes, beginning with irrational speculation and ending with a commercial crisis, have not hitherto become either less frequent or less violent with the growth of capital and extension of industry. Rather, they may be said to have become more so, in consequence, as is often said, of increased competition, but, as I prefer to say, of a lower rate of profits and interest, which makes capitalists dissatisfied with the ordinary course of safe mercantile gains. 
The connection of this low rate of profit with the advance of population and accumulation is one of the points to be illustrated in the ensuing chapters. Comment Mr. Cairns also adds some investigations as to the fluctuations of value. Hitherto I have examined the derivative laws of value in so far only as they are exemplified in the movements of normal prices. It'll be interesting now to consider whether it is possible to discover in the movements of market prices any corresponding phenomena. Taking manufacturers first, it is evident at once that, as regards conditions of protection, the circumstances of the case are such as to secure, in general, 1. Great rapidity and great certainty in bringing commodities to market. A deal table may be made in a few hours a piece of cloth in a few weeks, and a moderate-sized house in a month or little more. Tables, cloth, and houses may be produced with certainty in any quantity required. It results from this that it is scarcely possible that, under ordinary circumstances, the selling price of a product of manufacture should for any long time much exceed its normal price. 2. The nature of manufacturers is, in general, such as to fit them admirably for distant transport. Any considerable elevation of price, therefore, is pretty certain to attract supplies from remote sources. 3. Further, considered in their relation to human needs, I think it may be said of manufactured goods that either the need for them is not very urgent, or, where it happens to be so, substitutes may easily be found. From all these circumstances it results that an advance in the price either attracts supplies or deters purchasers, preventing any great departure from the usual terms of the market. Turning now to the products of agricultural, pastoral or, more generally, extractive industry, we find the circumstances under which this class of goods is brought to market in all respects extremely different from those which we have just examined, and such as to permit a much wider margin of deviation for the market from the normal price. Here the period of production is longer, the result of the process much more uncertain, the commodity at once more perishable and less portable, and human requirements in relation to it are mostly of a more urgent kind. 1. The shortest period within which additions can be made to the supply of food and raw material of the vegetable kind is in general a year, and, if the commodity be of animal origin, the minimum is considerably larger. 2. Again, the farmer may decide upon the breadth of ground to be devoted to a particular crop, or upon the number of cattle he will maintain. But the usual returns will vary according to the season and may prove far in excess or far in defect of his calculations. These circumstances all present obstacles to the adjustment of supply and demand, and consequently tend to produce frequent and extensive deviations of the market from the normal price. Nor are the other conditions of the case such as to neutralize the influence of such disturbing agencies. 3. The nature, indeed, of some of the principal agricultural products fits them sufficiently well for distant transport, and so far tends to correct fluctuations of price. But on the other hand, 4. The relation of these products of, to human wants is such as greatly to enhance their tendency to violent fluctuation incident to the conditions of their production. More especially is this the case with a commodity, whatever it may be, which forms the staple food of a people. For observe the peculiar nature of human requirements with reference to such a commodity. They are of this kind, that, given the number of a population, the quantity of a staple food required is nearly a fixed quantity, and this almost irrespective of price. Except among the poorest, increased cheapness will not stimulate a larger consumption, while, on the other hand, all, at any cost within the range of their means, will obtain their usual supply. 
The consequence is that when even a moderate deficiency or excess occurs in the supply of the staple food of a people, in the one case, a, the competition of consumers for their usual quantum of food rapidly forces up the price far out of proportion to the diminution in the supply. In the other, b, no one being inclined to increase his usual consumption, the competition of sellers in their eagerness to find a market for the superfluous portion of the supply is equally powerful to depress it. End of comment. End of Book 4, Chapter 1. Book 4, Chapter 2 of Principles of Political Economy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill, abridged by J. Lawrence Lachlan. Chapter 2. Influence of the Progress of Industry and Population on Rents, Profits, and Wages. Section 1. Characteristic Features of Industrial Progress. Continuing the inquiry into the nature of the economical changes taking place in a society which is in a state of industrial progress, we shall next consider what is the effect of that progress on the distribution of the produce among the various classes who share in it. We may confine our attention to the system of distribution which is the most complex and which virtually includes all others, that in which the produce of manufactures is shared between two classes, laborers and capitalists, and the produce of agriculture among three, laborers, capitalists, and landlords. The characteristic features of what is commonly meant by industrial progress resolve themselves mainly into three, increase of capital, increase of population, and improvements in production understanding the last expression in its widest sense, to include the process of procuring commodities from a distance, as well as that of producing them. It will be convenient to set out by considering each of the three causes as operating separately, after which we can suppose them combined in any manner we think fit. Section 2. First two cases, population and capital increasing, the arts of production stationary comment. For the sake of clearness, we will form two general groups of these causes. a. The influence of population and capital, improvements remaining stationary. b. The influence of improvements, population and capital remaining stationary. We will first take up a, and under this division, make for convenience two separate suppositions. Roman numeral 1. The first is that, while population is advancing, capital is stationary. By this means we can study separately the operation of one of the factors of societary progress, population, and see its influence on rents, profits, and wages. There being only the same given quantity of wealth in the form of capital to be now distributed among more laborers, one, real wages must fall whereupon, if the same capital purchases more labor and obtains more produce, too, profits rise. Now, if the laborers were so well off before as to suffer the reduction of wages to take place not in their food, but in their other comforts, then, if each laborer uses as much food as before, and if, as by the supposition, there are more laborers, an increased quantity of food will be required from the soil. This supply can be produced only at a greater cost, and, as inferior soils are called into cultivation, three, rents will rise. This last action, three, however, will have an influence on the rise of profits, too. For it was only by a reduction of real wages that profits rose. But if the cost of food, that is, the real wages, have since risen, then one of the elements entering into cost of labor has risen, and in so far will offset the fall of real wages, so that profits will not gain so much as if rents had not risen. The result of this first supposition, then, is that the landlord is the chief gainer. Roman numeral 1. 1. Wages fall. 2. Profits rise. 
less if rents rise, three rents rise. Roman numeral two. We will now take up the second supposition under A, that while capital is advancing, population remains stationary. Then, of course, one, wages will rise, and, as there is no improvement to cheapen the cost of their real wages, there will be an increase in cost of labor to the capitalist, and, two, profits will fall. If, now, the laborers, being better off, demand more food, the new food would cost more, as the margin of cultivation was pushed down, and, three, rents would inevitably rise. But not only have the laborers received more real wages, but since that change, the cost, as just described, of these real wages has increased. Therefore, two, profits would fall still more than by the rise of real wages. In this supposition, consequently, while the laborer gains, so does the landlord. Roman numeral two. One, wages rise. Two, profits fall. More if rents rise. Three, rents rise. A. It is easy for us now to take into our view the total effects under A and see what the combined action of Roman numeral one and two would be. That is, if both capital and population, improvements remaining stationary, increase, what will be the effect on wages, profits, and rent? Of course, we must suppose that capital and population just keep pace with each other. And in that case, one, real wages remain the same, each laborer receiving the same quantity and same quality of commodities as before. Hence, if each laborer receives the same quantity as before, and there are many more laborers, there will be an increased demand put upon the soil for food, poorer soils will be cultivated, and the cost of the products will rise. So, three, rents rise. But if each laborer receives the same quantity of real wages as before, and the cost of them has risen, as just explained, an increased cost of labor will result, which must come out of profits. Two, profits will fall. So that the results of A upon distribution, taken separately from B, are that the owner of capital loses, but the owner of land again gains. A. 1. Wages the same. 2. Profits fall. 3. Rents rise. End comment. Section 3. The Arts of Production Advancing, Capital and Population Stationary. Comment. Now let us go back to our first general group of causes, B, an advance in the arts of production while capital and population remain stationary. We can now study by themselves the effect of improvements on wages, profits, and rent. The general effects arising from an extended introduction of machinery into agriculture and manufactures, the lowered cost of transportation by steam, have been to lessen the value of articles consumed chiefly by the laboring classes. For the sake of clearness, Imagine that the improvement comes suddenly. The first effect will be to lower the value and price of articles entering into the real wages of the laborers, and if these consist mostly of food, there will be a rise in the margin of cultivation and a fall in rents. 3. It has been previously shown that improvements retard, or put back, the law of diminishing returns from land, or in manufactures compensate for it, and so lower rents. The poorest soil cultivated is now of a better grade than before, and the produce is yielded at a less cost and value, so that the land with which the best grades are compared, to determine the rent, is not separated from the best grades by so wide a gap. It would be at first blush seen, then, that the interests of the landlord were antagonistic to improvements, since they lower rents but in practice it is not so, as we shall soon see. We have seen that improvements cheapen the price of articles entering into the real wages of the laborer, having had a given sum as money wages before the change, then, when the sudden change of improvements came, it lowered prices to the laborer, and the same money wages brought more, one, real wages. If nothing more happened, we could see that improvements raised real wages, without lowering, two, profits, 
because cost of labor remains the same since the lowered cost of the articles consumed was exactly in proportion to the increase of real wages. And if the laborers choose to retain this higher standard, this would be the situation. Sadly enough, however, in practice they are apt to be satisfied with the old standard, and the amount of real wages to give the old standard of living can be had now for less money wages while only the same number without any increase can live at the new higher standard a larger number can live at the old lower standard in short the obstacles to an increase of population will be removed by the possession of higher money wages after a generation it is very probable that a larger number of laborers will be in existence living at the same or possibly a slightly higher standard of real wages and money wages will have fallen now we can understand better than before what would be the practical result of the causes under b three rent has fallen money wages have fallen even if two real wages have not and since real wages have not fallen in the proportion that their cost has been reduced two profits will have risen the general result of the causes under b alone acting as just described will then be b one real wages remain the same money wages less two profits rise three rents fall and comment section four theoretical results if all three elements progressive comment we have considered on the one hand under a the manner in which the distribution of the produce into rent profits and wages is affected by the ordinary increase of population and capital and on the other under b how it is affected by improvements in production and more especially in agriculture as follows a one wages the same b one real wages the same money wages less a two profits fall b two profits rise a three rents rise b three rents fall the effects are clearly contrasted under a we see a tendency to a rise of rents three an increased cost of labor and a fall of profits two under b a fall of rents three a diminished cost of labor and a rise of profits two we have therefore analyzed the forces belonging to the progress of industry and found two distinct and antagonistic forces working against each other if at any period improvements b advance faster than the population and capital a rent and money wages will tend downward and profits upward if on the other hand population advances faster than improvements b either the laborers will submit to a reduction in the quantity or quality of their food or if not rent and money wages will progressively rise and profits will fall End comment. section five practical results comment this however is not the final and practical result we have hitherto supposed that improvements b come suddenly in point of fact agricultural skill is slowly diffused and inventions and discoveries are in general only occasional not continuous in their action as is the increase of capital and population inasmuch as it seldom happens that improvement has so much the start of population and capital as actually to lower rent or raise the rate of profits population almost everywhere quote, treads close on the heels of agricultural improvement end quote, and effaces its effects as fast as they are produced and comment the reason why agricultural improvement seldom lowers rent is that it seldom cheapens food but only prevents it from growing dearer and seldom if ever throws land out of cultivation but only enables worse and worse land to be taken in for the supply of an increasing demand what is sometimes called the natural state of a country which is but half cultivated namely that the land is highly productive and food obtained in great abundance by little labor is only true of unoccupied countries colonized by a civilized people in the united states 
the worst land in cultivation is of a high quality, except sometimes in the immediate vicinity of markets or means of conveyance, where a bad quality is compensated by a good situation. And even if no further improvements were made in agriculture or locomotion, cultivation would have many steps yet to descend before the increase of population and capital would be brought to a stand. But in Europe, five hundred years ago, though so thinly peopled in comparison to the present population, it is probable that the worst land under the plough was, from the rude state of agriculture, quite as unproductive as the worst land now cultivated, and that cultivation had approached as near to the ultimate limit of profitable tillage in those times as in the present. What the agricultural improvements since made have really done is, by increasing the capacity of production of land in general, to enable tillage to extend downward to a much worse natural quality of land than the worst which at that time would have admitted of cultivation by a capitalist for profit, thus rendering a much greater increase of capital and population possible, and removing always a little and a little further off the barrier which restrains them, population meanwhile always pressing so hard against the barrier that there is never any visible margin left for it to seize, every inch of ground made vacant for it by improvement being at once filled up by its advancing columns. Agricultural improvement may thus be considered to be not so much a counterforce conflicting with increase of population as a partial relaxation of the bonds which confine that increase. Comment. Now, since improvements enable a much poorer quality of land to be ultimately cultivated, under the constant pressure of the increase of population and capital, improvements enable rent, three, in the end, to rise gradually to a much higher limit than it could otherwise have attained. End comment. If a great agricultural improvement were suddenly introduced, it might throw back rent for a considerable space, leaving it to regain its lost ground by the progress of population and capital, and afterward to go on further. But taking place, as such improvement always does, very gradually, it causes no retrograde movement of either rent or cultivation. It merely enables the one to go on rising, and the other extending, long after they must otherwise have stopped. Comment Inasmuch as, in point of fact, B never gets the start of A, but follows along with A, the general result will be that which we found true under A, a rise of rents, 3, and increased cost of labor to the capitalist, arising from an increased cost of laborers' subsistence and a fall of profits, 2. The effect of a more rapid advance of improvements at any one time will temporarily better the condition of the laborers, and also raise profits. But, if it is followed immediately by an increase of population, the landowners will reap the benefits of the improvement in the rise of rent. The final result, then, is as follows. 1. Real wages probably higher. 2. Profits fall. 3. Rents rise. It is possible that a different combination from the above may sometimes occur in the causes which underlie the progress of society. 1. There may be a period in which capital is increasing more rapidly than population, and when there seems to be an era of industrial improvements also. Then both wages and profits will be high, and it will be a period of general satisfaction. 2. If capital goes on increasing, but improvements are few, wages will rise. But profits must suffer a fall. In this country, where population has not yet increased so as to press seriously against subsistence, and where capital increases with incredible swiftness, these cases are often exemplified. The extraordinary resources of the newer states have permitted an unlimited increase of population, and capital has found no difficulty in finding an investment. But yet, those states which have been burdened with the disabilities of the old slave regime are far behind the others. The changes in the rank of the states, in respect of population, at each decade, as seen in chart number 16, are suggestive. End comment. End of Book 4, Chapter 2
Book Four, Chapter Three of Principles of Political Economy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Principles of Political Economy by John Stuart Mill. Abridged by J. Lawrence Laughlin. Book Four, Chapter Three of the tendencies of profit to a minimum one different theories as to the fall of profits the tendency of profits to fall as society advances which has been brought to notice in the preceding chapter was early recognized by writers on industry and commerce but the laws which govern profits not being then understood the phenomenon was ascribed to a wrong cause Adam Smith considered profits to be determined by what he called the competition of capital. In Adam Smith's opinion, the manner in which the competition of capital lowers profits is by lowering prices, that being usually the mode in which an increased investment of capital in any particular trade lowers the profits of that trade. But if this was his meaning, he overlooked the circumstance that the fall of price, which if confined to one commodity really does lower the profits of the producer, ceases to have that effect as soon as it extends to all commodities because when all things have fallen nothing has really fallen except nominally and even computed in money the expenses of every producer have diminished as much as his returns unless indeed labor be the one commodity which has not fallen in money price when all other things have if so what has really taken place is a rise of wages and it is that and not the fall of prices which has lowered the profits of capital there is another thing which escaped the notice of adam smith that the supposed universal fall of prices through increased competition of capitals is a thing which cannot take place prices are not determined by the competition of the sellers only but also by that of the buyers by demand as well as supply the demand which affects money prices consists of all the money in the hands of the community destined to be laid out in commodities and as long as the proportion of this to the commodities is not diminished there is no fall of general prices now howsoever capital may increase and give rise to an increased production of commodities a full share of the capital will be drawn to the business of producing or importing money and the quantity of money will be augmented in an equal ratio with the quantity of commodities for if this were not the case and if money therefore were as the theory supposes perpetually acquiring increased purchasing power those who produced or imported it would obtain constantly increasing profits and this could not happen without attracting labor and capital to that occupation from other employments if a general fall of prices and increased value of money were really to occur it could only be as a consequence of increased cost of a production from the gradual exhaustion of the mines it is not tenable therefore in theory that the increase of capital produces or tends to produce a general decline of money prices neither is it true that any general decline of prices as capital increased has manifested itself in fact the only things observed to fall in price with the progress of society are those in which there have been improvements in production greater than have taken place in the production of the precious metals as for example all spun and woven fabrics other things again instead of falling have risen in price because their cost of production compared with that of gold and silver has increased among these are all kinds of food comparison being made with a much earlier period of history the doctrine therefore that competition of capital lowers profits by lowering prices is incorrect in fact as well as unsound in principle mr wakefield in his commentary on adam smith and his important writings on colonization takes a much clearer view of the subject and arrives through a substantially correct series of deductions at practical conclusions which appear to me just and important mr wakefield's explanation of the fall of profits is briefly this Production is limited not solely by the quantity of capital and labor, but also by the extent of the field of employment. The field of employment for capital is twofold, the land of the country and the capacity of foreign markets to take its manufactured commodities. On a limited extent of land, only a limited quantity of capital can find employment at a profit. As the quantity of capital approaches this limit, profit falls. 
when the limit is attained profit is annihilated and can only be restored through an extension of the field of employment either by the acquisition of fertile land or by opening new markets in foreign countries from which food and materials can be purchased with the products of domestic capital footnote mr mill commended as the most scientific treatment of the subject with which he had met an essay on the effects of machinery by william ellis westminster review january eighteen twenty six and footnote two what determines the minimum rate of profit there is at every time and place some particular rate of profit which is the lowest that will induce the people of that country and time to accumulate savings and to employ those savings productively this minimum rate of profit varies according to the circumstances it depends on two elements one is the strength of the effective desire of accumulation the comparative estimate, made by the people of that place and era, of future interests when weighed against the present. This element chiefly affects the inclination to save. The other element, which affects not so much the willingness to save as the disposition to employ savings productively, is the degree of security of capital engaged in industrial operations. In employing any funds which a person may possess as capital on his own account, or in lending it to others to be so employed, there is always some additional risk over and above that incurred by keeping it idle in his own custody. This extra risk is great in proportion as the general state of society is insecure. It may be equivalent to 20, 30, or 50 percent, or to no more than one or two. Something, however, it must always be, and for this the expectation of profit must be sufficient to compensate. There would be adequate motives for a certain amount of saving, even if capital yielded no profit. There would be an inducement to lay by in good times a provision for bad, to reserve something for sickness and infirmity, or as a means of leisure and independence in the latter part of life, or a help to children in the outset of it. Savings, however, which have only these ends in view, have not much tendency to increase the amount of capital permanently in existence. The savings by which an addition is made to the national capital usually emanate from the desire of persons to improve what is termed their condition in life or to make a provision for children or others independent of their exertions now to the strength of these inclinations it makes a very material difference how much of the desired object can be affected by a given amount and duration of self-denial which again depends on the rate of profit and there is in every country some rate of profit below which persons in general will not find sufficient motive to save for the mere purpose of growing richer or of leaving others better off than themselves any accumulation, therefore, by which the general capital is increased, requires as its necessary condition a certain rate of profit, a rate which an average person will deem to be an equivalent for abstinence, with the addition of a sufficient insurance against risk. I have already observed that this minimum rate of profit, less than which is not consistent with the further increase of capital, is lower in some states of society than in others. And I may add that the kind of social progress characteristic of our present civilization tends to diminish it. 1. In the first place, one of the acknowledged effects of that progress is an increase of general security. Destruction by wars and spoliation by private or public violence are less and less to be apprehended. The risks attending the investment of savings in productive employment require, therefore, a smaller rate of profit to compensate for them than was required a century ago and will hereafter require less than at present. In the second place, it is also one of the consequences of civilization that mankind become less the slaves of the movement and more habituated to carry their desires and purposes forward into a distant future. This increase of providence is a natural result of the increased assurance with which futurity can be looked forward to, and is, besides, favored by most of the influences which an industrial life exercises over the passions and inclinations of human nature. In proportion as life has fewer vicissitudes, as habits become more fixed, and great prizes are less and less to be hoped for by any other means than long perseverance, mankind become more willing to sacrifice present indulgence for future objects. But though the minimum rate of profit is liable to vary, and though to specify exactly what it is would at any given time be impossible, such a minimum always exists. And whether it be high or low, when once it is reached, no further increase of capital can for the present take place.
the country has then attained what is known to political economists under the name of the stationary state. 3. In old and opulent countries, profits habitually near to the minimum. We now arrive at the fundamental proposition which this chapter is intended to inculcate. When a country has long possessed a large production and a large net income to make savings from, and when, therefore, the means have long existed of making a great annual addition to capital, the country not having, like America, a large reserve of fertile land still unused, it is one of the characteristics of such a country that the rate of profit is habitually within, as it were, a hand's breadth of the minimum, and the country, therefore, on the very verge of the stationary state. My meaning is that it would require but a short time to reduce profits to the minimum. If capital continued to increase at its present rate, and no circumstances having a tendency to raise the rate of profit occurred in the meantime. In England, the ordinary rate of interest on government securities, in which the risk is next to nothing, may be estimated at a little more than 3%. In all other investments, therefore, the interest or profit calculated upon, exclusive of what is properly a remuneration for talent or exertion, must be as much more than this amount as is equivalent to the degree of risk to which the capital is thought to be exposed. Let us suppose that in England even so small a net profit as 1%, exclusive of insurance against risk, would constitute a sufficient inducement to save, but that less than this would not be a sufficient inducement. I now say that the mere continuance of the present annual increase of capital, if no circumstance occurred to counteract its effect, would suffice in a small number of years to reduce the rate of net profit to 1%. To fulfill the conditions of the hypothesis, we must suppose an entire cessation of exportation of capital for foreign investment. We must suppose the entire savings of the community to be annually invested in really productive employment within the country itself, and no new channels opened by industrial inventions, or by a more extensive substitution of the best-known processes for inferior ones. The difficulty in finding remunerative employment every year for so much new capital would not consist in any want of a market. If the new capital were duly shared among many varieties of employment, it would raise up a demand for its own produce, and there would be no cause why any part of that produce should remain longer on hand than formerly. What would really be, not merely difficult, but impossible, would be to employ this capital without submitting to a rapid reduction of the rate of profit. As capital increased, population either would also increase or it would not. If it did not, wages would rise, and a greater capital would be distributed in wages among the same number of laborers. There being no more labor than before, and no improvements to render the labor more efficient, there would not be any increase of the produce, and, as the capital, however largely increased, would only obtain the same gross return, the whole savings of each year would be exactly so much subtracted from the profits of the next and of every following year. Reader's Note What follows is a diagram of a drinking glass, three-quarters of the way full, with the letter A at the top rim, the letter D one-quarter of the way down, the letter B directly below the letter D, and the letter C at the base of the glass. This diagram is used for the comment that follows. And readers note. Comment. This can be illustrated by supposing that the whole capital is handed out to the producers in a vessel which is returned full at the end of the period of production with the original outlay, plus an advance called profit. BC represents the total outlay, AC the total produce, and AB the profit on BC. Now, since the conditions of production remain the same, the same number of laborers can produce, as before, no more than AC, even though in the second year some of last year's profit, represented by DB, is saved and added to the outlay by the capitalist. If DC is now the outlay of capital, the profit can only be AC minus DC, or AD. That is, the profit of the second year is diminished by DB, exactly the amount of savings of the year before, and this would be repeated each successive year, each saving added to BC being exactly so much subtracted from the profits of the next and of every following year. End comment.
it is hardly necessary to say that in such circumstances profit would very soon fall to the point at which further increase of capital would cease an augmentation of capital much more rapid than that of population must soon reach its extreme limit unless accompanied by increased efficiency of labor through inventions and discoveries or improved mental and physical education or unless some of the idle people or of the unproductive laborers become productive if population did increase with the increase of capital and in proportion to it the fall of profits would still be inevitable increased population implies increased demand for agricultural produce in the absence of industrial improvements this demand can only be supplied at an increased cost of production either by cultivating worse land or by a more elaborate and costly cultivation of the land already under tillage the cost of the laborer's subsistence is therefore increased and unless the laborer submits to a deterioration of his condition profits must fall in an old country like england if in addition to supposing all improvement in domestic agriculture suspended we suppose that there is no increased production in foreign countries for the english market the fall of profits would be very rapid if both these avenues to an increased supply of food were closed and population continued to increase as it is said to do at the rate of a thousand a day all waste land which admits of cultivation in the existing state of knowledge would soon be cultivated and the cost of production and the price of food would be so increased that if the laborers received the increased money wages necessary to compensate for their increased expenses profits would very soon reach the minimum the fall of profits would be retarded if money wages did not rise or rose in a less degree but the margin which can be gained by a deterioration of the laborers condition is a very narrow one in general they cannot bear much reduction when they can they have also a higher standard of necessary requirements and will not on the whole therefore we may assume that in such a country as england if the present annual amount of savings were to continue without any of the counteracting circumstances which now keep in check the natural influence of those savings in reducing profit the rate of profit would speedily attain the minimum and all further accumulation of capital would for the present cease comment mr carey on the other hand asserts the existence of a law of increasing returns from land and that while wages are constantly increasing with the progress of society there is a diminution in the rate of profit although the increasing returns permit an increase of absolute if not proportional profit that is although wages increase more in proportion than profit there is still a larger gross amount to be divided among capitalists as profit out of a larger product End comment. Four, prevented from reaching it by commercial revulsions what then are these counteracting circumstances which in the existing state of things maintain a tolerably equal struggle against the downward tendency of profits and prevent the greatest annual savings which take place in this country from depressing the rate of profit much nearer to that lowest point to which it is always tending and which left to itself it would so promptly attain the resisting agencies are of several kinds first among them is the waste of capital in periods of over trading and rash speculation and in the commercial revulsions by which such times are always followed mines are opened railways or bridges made and many other works of uncertain profit commenced and in these enterprises much capital is sunk which yields either no return or none adequate to the outlay factories are built and machinery erected beyond what the market requires or can keep in employment even if they are kept in employment the capital is no less sunk it has been converted from circulating into fixed capital and has ceased to have any influence on wages or profits besides this there is a great unproductive consumption of capital during the stagnation which follows a period of general overtrading. establishments are shut up or kept working without any profit such are the effects of a commercial revulsion and that such revulsions are almost periodical is a consequence of the very tendency of profits which we are considering by the time a few years have passed over without a crisis so much additional capital has been accumulated that it is no longer possible to invest it at the accustomed profit all public securities rise to a high price the rate of interest on the best mercantile security falls very low and the complaint is general among persons in business that no money is to be made 
but the diminished scale of all safe gains inclines persons to give a ready ear to any projects which hold out though at the risk of loss the hope of a higher rate of profit and speculations ensue which with the subsequent revulsions destroy or transfer to foreigners a considerable amount of capital produce a temporary rise of interest and profit make room for fresh accommodations and the same round is recommenced this doubtless is one considerable cause which arrests profits in their descent to the minimum by sweeping away from time to time a part of the accumulated mass by which they are forced down but this is not as might be inferred from the language of some writers the principal cause if it were the capital of the country would not increase but in england it does increase greatly and rapidly this is shown by the increasing productiveness of almost all taxes by the continual growth of all the signs of national wealth and by the rapid increase of population while the condition of the laborers certainly is not on the whole declining footnote although their needs now attract more attention through the extension of newspapers and cheap books the condition of the laboring class is certainly better than it was fifty years ago see mr robert giffen's progress of the working class in the last half century eighteen eighty four referred to in book four chapter five section one and footnote five by improvements in production this brings us to the second of the counter agencies namely improvements in production these evidently have the effect of extending what mr wakefield terms the field of employment that is they enable a greater amount of capital to be accumulated and employed without depressing the rate of profit provided always that they do not raise to a proportional extent the habits and requirements of the laborer if the laboring class gain the full advantage of the increased cheapness in other words if money wages do not fall profits are not raised nor their fall retarded but if the laborers people up to the improvement in their condition and so relapse to their previous state profits will rise all inventions which cheapen any of the things consumed by the laborers unless their requirements are raised in an equivalent degree in time lower money wages and by doing so enable a greater capital to be accumulated and employed before profits fall back to what they were previously improvements which only affect things consumed exclusively by the richer classes do not operate precisely in the same manner the cheapening of lace or velvet has no effect in diminishing the cost of labor and no mode can be pointed out in which it can raise the rate of profit so as to make room for a larger capital before the minimum is attained it however produces an effect which is virtually equivalent it lowers or tends to lower the minimum itself in the first place increased cheapness of articles of consumption promote the inclination to save by affording to all consumers a surplus which they may lay by consistently with their accustomed manner of living in the next place whatever enables people to live equally well on a smaller income inclines them to lay by capital for a lower rate of profit if people can live on an independence of one thousand dollars a year in the same manner as they formerly could on one of two thousand dollars some persons will be induced to save in hopes of the one who would have been deterred by the more remote prospect of the other all improvements therefore in the production of almost any commodity tend in some degree to widen the interval which has to be passed before arriving at the stationary state six by the importation of cheap necessaries and implements equivalent in effect to improvements in production is the acquisition of any new power of obtaining cheap commodities from foreign countries if necessaries are cheapened whether they are so by improvements at home or importation from abroad is exactly the same thing to wages and profits unless the laborer obtains and by an improvement of his habitual standard keeps the whole benefit the cost of labor is lowered and the rate of profit is raised as long as food can continue to be imported for an increasing population without any diminution of cheapness so long the declension of profits through the increase of population and capital is arrested an accumulation may go on without making the rate of profit draw nearer to the minimum and on this ground it is believed by some that the repeal of the corn laws has opened to england a long era of rapid increase of capital with an undiminished rate of profit before inquiring whether this expectation is reasonable one remark must be made which is much at variance with commonly received notions 
foreign trade does not necessarily increase the field of employment for capital when foreign trade makes room for more capital at the same profit it is by enabling the necessaries of life or the habitual articles of the laborers consumption to be obtained at a smaller cost it may do this in two ways by the importation either of those commodities themselves or of the means and appliances for producing them cheap iron has in a certain measure the same effect on profits and the cost of labor as cheap corn because cheap iron makes cheap tools for agriculture and cheap machinery for clothing but a foreign trade which neither directly nor by any indirect consequence increases the cheapness of anything consumed by the laborers does not any more than an invention or discovery in the like case tend to raise profits or retard their fall it merely substitutes the production of goods for foreign markets in the room of the home production of luxuries leaving the employment for capital neither greater nor less than before it must of course be supposed that with the increase of capital population also increases for if it did not the consequent rise of wages would bring down profits in spite of any cheapness of food suppose then that the population of great britain goes on increasing at its present rate and demands every year a supply of imported food considerably beyond that of the year preceding this annual increase in the food demanded from the exporting countries can only be obtained either by great improvements in their agriculture or by the application of a great additional capital to the growth of food the former is likely to be a very slow process from the rudeness and ignorance of the agricultural classes in the food exporting countries of europe while the british colonies and the united states are already in possession of most of the improvements yet made so far as suitable to their circumstances there remains as a resource the extension of cultivation and on this it is to be remarked that the capital by which any such extension can take place is mostly still to be created in poland russia hungary spain the increase of capital is extremely slow in america it is rapid but not more rapid than the population the principal fund at present available for supplying this country with a yearly increasing importation of food is that portion of the annual savings of america which has heretofore been applied to increasing the manufacturing establishments of the united states and which free trade in corn may possibly divert from that purpose to growing food for our market this limited source of supply unless great improvements take place in agriculture cannot be expected to keep pace with the growing demand of so rapidly increasing a population as that of great britain and if our population and capital continue to increase with their present rapidity the only mode in which food can continue to be supplied cheaply to the one is by sending the other abroad to produce it chart seventeen grain crops of the united states year eighteen sixty five one billion one hundred twenty seven million four hundred ninety nine thousand one hundred eighty seven bushels eighteen sixty six one billion three hundred forty three million twenty seven thousand eight hundred sixty eight bushels eighteen sixty seven one billion three hundred twenty nine million seven hundred twenty nine thousand four hundred bushels eighteen sixty eight one billion four hundred fifty million seven hundred eighty nine thousand bushels eighteen sixty nine one billion four hundred ninety one million four hundred twelve thousand one hundred bushels eighteen seventy one billion six hundred twenty nine million twenty seven thousand six hundred bushels eighteen seventy one one billion five hundred twenty eight million seven hundred seventy six thousand one hundred bushels eighteen seventy two one billion six hundred sixty four million three hundred thirty one thousand six hundred bushels eighteen seventy three one billion five hundred thirty eight million eight hundred ninety two thousand eight hundred ninety one bushels eighteen seventy four one billion four hundred fifty five million one hundred eighty thousand two hundred bushels eighteen seventy five two billion thirty two million two hundred thirty five thousand three hundred bushels eighteen seventy six one billion nine hundred sixty two million eight hundred twenty one thousand six hundred bushels eighteen seventy seven two billion one hundred seventy eight million nine hundred thirty four thousand six hundred forty six bushels eighteen seventy eight 
two billion three hundred two million two hundred fifty four thousand nine hundred fifty bushels eighteen seventy nine two billion four hundred thirty four million eight hundred eighty four thousand five hundred forty one bushels eighteen eighty two billion four hundred forty eight million seventy nine thousand one hundred eighty one bushels eighteen eighty one two billion six hundred ninety nine million three hundred ninety four thousand four hundred ninety six bushels eighteen eighty two two billion six hundred ninety nine million three hundred ninety four thousand four hundred ninety six bushels eighteen eighty three two billion six hundred twenty three million three hundred nineteen thousand eighty nine bushels comment not even americans have any adequate knowledge of the productive capacity of the united states the grain fields are not yet all occupied and we can easily produce the total cotton consumption of the world on that quantity of land in texas alone by which the whole cultivable area of that state exceeds the corresponding area of the empire of austria hungary see chart number eighteen which shows the remarkable proportion of land possessed by the united states as compared with european countries and the exports of agricultural food from the united states are now six times what they were in eighteen fifty about the time when mr mill made the above statements immense areas of our soil have not yet been broken by the plough and the quantities of cereals grown in the united states seem to be steadily increasing in fact the greatest grain crop yet grown in this country was that of eighteen eighty two the comparison of the crops of late years with those just succeeding the war as seen in chart number seventeen shows a very suggestive increase since it indicates where employment has been given to vast numbers of laborer and where investment has been found for our rapidly growing capital footnote a comparison of chart number seventeen with chart number six will furnish some means of learning whether the building of railways has gone on faster than is warranted by the increase of our crops see supra page one thirty eight and footnote and comment seven by the emigration of capital this brings us to the last of the counter forces which check the downward tendency of profits in a country whose capital increases faster than that of its neighbors and whose profits are therefore nearer to the minimum this is the perpetual overflow of capital into colonies or foreign countries to seek higher profits that can be obtained at home i believe this to have been for many years one of the principal causes by which the decline of profits in england has been arrested it has a twofold operation in the first place it does what a fire or an inundation or a commercial crisis would have done it carries off a part of the increase of capital from which the reduction of profits proceeds secondly the capital so carried off is not lost but is chiefly employed either in founding colonies which become large exporters of cheap agricultural produce or in extending and perhaps improving the agriculture of older communities in countries which are further advanced in industry and population and have therefore a lower rate of profit than others there is always long before the actual minimum is reached a practical minimum viz when profits have fallen so much below what they are elsewhere that were they to fall lower all further accumulations would go abroad as long as there are old countries where capital increases very rapidly and new countries where profit is still high profits in the old countries will not sink to the rate which would put a stop to accumulation the fall is stopped at the point which sends capital abroad. End of Book 4, Chapter 4book four, Chapter 4 of Principles of Political Economy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia principles of political economy by john stuart mill abridged by j lawrence laughlin book four chapter four consequences of the tendency of profits to a minimum and the stationary state paragraph one abstraction of capital not necessarily a national loss the theory of the effect of accumulation on profits must greatly abate or rather altogether destroy in countries where profits are low the immense importance which used to be attached by political economists 
to the effects which an event or measure of government might have in adding to or subtracting from the capital of the country we have now seen that the lowness of profits is a proof that the spirit of accumulation is so active and that the increase of capital has proceeded at so rapid a rate as to outstrip the two counter agencies improvements in production and increased supply of cheap necessaries from abroad a sudden abstraction of capital unless of inordinate amount would not have any real effect in impoverishing the country after a few months or years there would exist in the country just as much capital as if none had been taken away the abstraction by raising profits and interest would give a fresh stimulus to the accumulative principle which would speedily fill up the vacuum probably indeed the only effect that would ensue would be that for some time afterward less capital would be exported and less thrown away in hazardous speculation in the first place then this view of things greatly weakens in a wealthy and industrious country the force of the economical argument against the expenditure of public money for really valuable even though industriously unproductive purposes in poor countries the capital of the country requires the legislator's sedulous care he is bound to be most cautious of encroaching upon it and should favour to the utmost its accumulation at home and its introduction from abroad but in rich populous and highly cultivated countries it is not capital which is the deficient element but fertile land and what a legislator should desire and promote is not the greater aggregate saving but a greater return to savings either by improved cultivation or by access to the produce of more fertile lands in other parts of the globe the same considerations enable us to throw aside as unworthy of regard one of the common arguments against emigration as a means of relief for the laboring class emigration it is said can do no good to the laborers if in order to defray the cost as much must be taken away from the capital of the country as from its population if one-tenth of the laboring people of england were transferred to the colonies and along with them one-tenth of the circulating capital of the country either wages or profits or both would be greatly benefited by the diminished pressure of capital and population upon the fertility of the land the landlords alone would sustain some loss of income and even they only if colonization went to the length of actually diminishing capital and population but not if it merely carried off the annual increase paragraph two in opulent countries the extension of machinery not detrimental but beneficial to laborers from the same principles we are now able to arrive at a final conclusion respecting the effects which machinery and generally the sinking of capital for a productive purpose produce upon the immediate and ultimate interests of the laboring class the characteristic property of this class of industrial improvements is the conversion of circulating capital into fixed and it was shown in the first book that in a country where capital accumulates slowly the introduction of machinery permanent improvements of land and the like might be for the time extremely injurious since the capital so employed might be directly taken from the wages fund the subsistence of the people and the employment for labor curtailed and the gross annual produce of the country actually diminished but in a country of great annual savings and low profits no such effects need be apprehended it merely draws off at one orifice what was already flowing out at another or if not the greater vacant space left in the reservoir does but cause a greater quantity to flow in accordingly in spite of the mischievous derangements of the money market which have been occasioned by the great sums in process of being sunk in railways i cannot agree with those who apprehend any mischief from this source to the productive resources of the country not on the absurd ground which to any one acquainted with the elements of the subject needs no confutation that railway expenditure is a mere transfer of capital from hand to hand by which nothing is lost or destroyed this is true of what is spent in the purchase of the land a portion too of what is paid to agents councils engineers and surveyors 
is saved by those who receive it and becomes capital again but what is laid out in the bona fide construction of the railway itself is lost and gone when once expended it is incapable of ever being paid in wages or applied to the maintenance of laborers again as a matter of account the result is that so much food and clothing and tools have been consumed and the country has got a railway instead it already appears from these considerations that the conversion of circulating capital into fixed whether by railways or manufactories or ships or machinery or canals or mines or works of drainage and irrigation is not likely in any rich country to diminish the gross produce or the amount of employment for labor there is hardly any increase of fixed capital which does not enable the country to contain eventually a larger circulating capital than it otherwise could possess and employ within its own limits for there is hardly any creation of fixed capital which when it proves successful does not cheapen the articles on which wages are habitually expended comment as regards the effects upon the material condition of the wages receiving class since it seems clear that capital increases faster than improvements and probably faster even than population it follows that in countries where the laboring classes are evidently growing in intelligence they gain in wages with the progress of society such certainly seems to be the teaching of mr giffen's late studies see book four chapter three paragraph five end of comment paragraph three stationary state of wealth and population dreaded by some writers but not in itself undesirable toward what ultimate point is society tending by its industrial progress when the progress ceases in what condition are we to expect that it will leave mankind it must always have been seen more or less distinctly by political economists that the increase of wealth is not boundless that at the end of what they term the progressive state lies the stationary state that all progress in wealth is but a postponement of this and that each step in advance is an approach to it we have now been led to recognize that this ultimate goal is at all times near enough to be fully in view that we are always on the verge of it and that if we have not reached it long ago it is because the goal itself lies before us the richest and most prosperous countries would very soon attain the stationary state if no further improvements were made in the productive arts and if there were a suspension of the overflow of capital from those countries into the uncultivated or ill-cultivated regions of the earth adam smith always assumes that the condition of the mass of the people though it may not be positively distressed must be pinched and stinted in a stationary condition of wealth and can only be satisfactory in a progressive state the doctrine that to however distant a time incessant struggling may put off our doom the progress of society must end in shallows and in miseries far from being as many people still believe a wicked invention of mr malthus was either expressly or tacitly affirmed by his most distinguished predecessors and can only be successfully combated on his principles even in a progressive state of capital in old countries a conscientious and prudential restraint on population is indispensable to prevent the increase of numbers from outstripping the increase of capital and the condition of the classes who are at the bottom of society from being deteriorated where there is not in the people or in some very large proportion of them a resolute resistance to this deterioration a determination to preserve an established standard of comfort the condition of the poorest class sinks even in a progressive state to the lowest point which they will consent to endure the same determination would be equally effectual to keep up their condition in the stationary state and would be quite as likely to exist i cannot therefore regard the stationary state of capital and wealth with the unaffected aversion so generally manifested toward it by political economists of the old school i am inclined to believe that it would be on the whole a very considerable improvement on our present condition it is only in the backward countries of the world that increased production is still an important object 
in those most advanced what is economically needed is a better distribution of which one indispensable means is a stricter restraint on population on the other hand we may suppose this better distribution of property attained by the joint effect of the prudence and frugality of individuals and of a system of legislation favouring equality of fortunes so far as is consistent with the just claim of the individual to the fruits whether great or small of his or her industry we may suppose for instance according to the suggestion thrown out in a former chapter a limitation of the sum which any one person may acquire by gift or inheritance to the amount sufficient to constitute a moderate independence under this twofold influence society would exhibit these leading features a well-paid and affluent body of labourers no enormous fortunes except what were earned and accumulated during a single lifetime but a much larger body of persons than at present not only exempt from the coarser toils but with sufficient leisure both physical and mental from mechanical details to cultivate freely the graces of life and afford examples of them to the classes less favourably circumstanced for their growth this condition of society so greatly preferable to the present is not only perfectly compatible with the stationary state but it would seem more naturally allied with that state than with any other there is room in the world no doubt and even in old countries for a great increase of population supposing the arts of life to go on improving and capital to increase but even if innocuous i confess i see very little reason for desiring it the density of population necessary to enable mankind to obtain in the greatest degree all the advantages both of cooperation and of social intercourse has in all the most populous countries been attained if the earth must lose that great portion of its pleasantness which it owes to things that the unlimited increase of wealth and population would extirpate from it for the mere purpose of enabling it to support a larger but not a better or happier population i sincerely hope for the sake of posterity that they will be content to be stationary long before necessity compels them to it it is scarcely necessary to remark that a stationary condition of capital and population implies no stationary state of human improvement even the industrial arts might be as earnestly and as successfully cultivated with this sole difference that instead of serving no purpose but the increase of wealth industrial improvements would produce their legitimate effect that of abridging labour hitherto it is questionable if all the mechanical inventions yet made have lightened the day's toil of any human being they have enabled the greater population to live the same life of drudgery and imprisonment and an increased number of manufacturers and others to make fortunes they have increased the comforts of the middle classes comment the statement that inventions have not lightened the day's toil of any human being has been persistently misquoted by many persons and has been taken out of its connection mr mill distinctly holds that the labourer's lot could have been improved had there been any limitation of population that it is the constant growth of population as society progresses which destroys the gains afforded to the labouring classes by improvements but it is quite certain that the material facts of mr mill's statement are no longer true in the united states wages have risen with an additional gain in lower prices and mr giffen shows the same progress in england moreover travellers on the continent speak of a similar movement already noticeable there mr giffen's statement in his comparison with fifty years ago is as follows while the money wages have increased as we have seen the hours of labour have diminished it is difficult to estimate what the extent of this diminution has been but collecting one or two scattered notices i should be inclined to say very nearly twenty per cent there has been at least this reduction in the textile engineering and house-building trades the workman gets from fifty to one hundred per cent more money for twenty per cent less work in round figures he has gained from seventy to one hundred and twenty per cent in fifty years in money return it is just possible of course 
that the workman may do as much or nearly as much in the shorter period as he did in his longer hours still there is the positive gain in his being less time at his task which many of the classes still tugging lengthily day by day at the oar would appreciate end of comment end of book four chapter four book four chapter five of principles of political economy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org principles of political economy by john stuart mill abridged by j lawrence laughlin section forty eight on the possible futurity of the laboring classes section one the possibility of improvement while laborers remain merely receivers of wages there has probably never been a time when more attention has been called to the material and social conditions of the working classes than in the last few years the great increase of literature and the extension of the newspaper has brought to every reader even when public and private charities have not sent eye-witnesses into direct contact with distress a more explicit knowledge of the working classes than ever before the revelation of existing poverty and misery is often wrongly taken to be a proof of the increasing degradation of the working men and the cause has been ascribed to the grasping cruelty of capitalists instances of injustice arising from the relations of employers and employed will occur so long as human nature remains imperfect but the world hopes that some other relation than that of master and workman may be evolved in which not only many admitted wrongs may be avoided but also new forces may be applied to raise the laborer out of his dependence on other classes in the community we are at present living under a regime of private property and competition but certainly the progress of the laborer is not that which can excite enthusiastic hopes for the future so long as he remains a mere receiver of wages the progress of industrial improvements has resulted says mr cairns in a temporary improvement of the laborer's condition followed by an increase of population and an enlarged demand for the cheapened commodity laborers commodities however are for the most part commodities of raw produce or in which the raw material constitutes the chief element of the value clothing is in truth the only important exception and of all such commodities it is the well-known law that an augmentation of quantity can only be obtained other things being the same at an increasing proportional cost thus it has happened that the gain in productiveness obtained by improved processes has after a generation to a great extent been lost lost that is to say for any benefit that can be derived from it in favor of wages and profits the large addition to the wealth of the country has gone neither to profits nor to wages nor yet to the public at large as consumers but to swell a fund ever growing even while its proprietors sleep the rent roll of the owners of the soil the aggregate return from the land has immensely increased but the cost of the costliest portion of the produce which is that which determines the price of the whole remains pretty nearly as it was profits therefore have not risen at all and the real remuneration of the laborer taking the whole field of labor in but a slight degree at all events in a degree very far from commensurate with the general progress of industry under these conditions it seems that the only hope of an improvement for the laboring classes lies in the limitation of population or at least in an increase of numbers less than the increase of capital and improvements it is possible however that mr cairns with many others has failed to recognize the full extent of the improvement which is taking place in the wages of the laborer 
under the existing social order. Although we hear much of the wrongs of the working men, and they no doubt exist, yet it is unquestionable that their condition has vastly improved within the last fifty years, largely, in my opinion, because improvements have outstripped population, and because wide areas of fertile land in new and peaceful countries have drawn off the surplus population in the older countries, and because the available spots in the newer countries like the United States have not yet been covered over with a population sufficiently dense to keep real wages anything below a relatively high standard. The facts to substantiate this opinion, so far as regards Great Britain, are to be found in a recent investigation by Mr. Giffen, the statistician of the English Board of Trade, for a very considerable reduction in hours of daily labor, the workman now receives wages on an average of about 70% higher than 50 years ago, as may be seen by the following table. The table's columns show occupation, place, wages 50 years ago per week, wages at the present time per week, and an increase or decrease of the amount and the percent. The carpenters of Manchester and Glasgow, 50 years ago, May 24 and 14. At the present, their weekly wages are 34 and 26, an increase of 10 and 12, or 42% and 85%. The bricklayers of Manchester and Glasgow, 50 years ago per week, earned 24 or 15. At the present time, their wages per week are 36 and 27, an increase of 12 for each, but 50% for the Manchester and 80% for the Glasgow bricklayers. The Masons of Manchester and Glasgow had an increase of 24 and 69% respectively. Miners of Staffordshire, 50 years ago, weekly wages was 2.8, present wages per week is 4, an increase of 1.4, which is 50%. Pattern weavers of Huddersfeld had an increase of 55% from 16 a week 50 years ago to 25 a week presently. Wool scourers, mule spinners, weavers, warpers and beamers, winders and reelers of Huddersfield have an increase of wages of 55%, 30%, 20%, 115% for the weavers. 58% and 83% for the winders and reelers. Weavers of Bradford, 50 years ago, their wages were 8.3. At the present time, it's 20.6 per week, an increase of 12.3, 150%. Reeling and warping in Bradford increased 100%. And spinning, children, they used to earn 4.5 50 years ago. Present time, weekly wages are 11.6, an increase of 7.1, 160%. With increased wages, prices are not much higher than 50 years ago, but the clearest evidence as to their bettered material condition is to be found in the following table, which shows the amount of food consumed per head by the total population of Great Britain. Bacon and hams in pounds in 1840 was 0 0.01, in 1881, 13.93. Butter was 1 pound in 1840, 6.36 in 1881. Cheese in pounds, 0 0.92 in 1840, in 1881, consumption is 5.77 pounds. Currants and raisins, 1.45 to 4.34. Eggs, the number in 1840 was 3.63, in 1881, the food consumed per head is now 21.65 eggs. Potatoes, rice, cocoa in 1840 were 0 0.01, 0 0.9, 0 0.08, increased to 12.5, 16.3, or 0 0.31. Coffee decreased from 1.08 to 0 0.89. Corn, wheat, and wheat flowers in pounds in 1840 was 42.47, in 1881, 216.92. Raw sugar consumption in 1840, 15.2 pounds, in 1881, 58.92 pounds. Refined sugar, 
was zero in 1840, 8.44 pounds in 1881. Tea went from 1.22 to 4.58. Tobacco went from 0.86 to 1.41. Wine was 0.25 to 0.45. Spirits from 0.97 to 1.8. Malt in bushels in 1840. The consumption was 1.59. In 1881, it was 1.9. The question then arises whether capital has been shown by the statistics to have gained accordingly, or whether there has been a proportionally less increase than in wages. Says Mr. Giffen, if the return to capital had doubled, as the wages of the working classes appear to have doubled, the aggregate income of the capitalist classes returned to the income tax would now be eight hundred million pounds instead of four hundred million pounds capitalist as such gets a low interest for his money, and the aggregate returns to capital is not a third part of the aggregate income of the country, which may be put at not less than one billion two hundred million pounds. It is found, moreover, as a suggestion that property is more generally diffused, that while there were 25,368 estates entered to probate in 1838 of an average value of 2,160 pounds each, there were 55,359 estates in 1882 of an average value of 2,500 each. But yet the vast increase of wealth made possible by improvements and the growth of capital would have bettered the condition of all still more had population been somewhat more limited. As it is, the material gain has been large in spite of an increase in the population from 16,500,000 in 1831 to nearly 30 million in 1881. In other words, the landlords have been great gainers, while the laborers have intercepted much more than Mr. Cairns supposed. There are at hand some very striking data relating to the United States, which point in the same direction as those of Mr. Giffen. Charts number 19 and 20 show vividly how far the increased productiveness of an industry, arising from greater skill and greater efficiency of labor in the connection of improved machinery, has enabled manufacturers to steadily lower the price of their goods, and yet increase the wages paid to their operatives. What was true of these two cotton mills was true of others within New England, for the rate of wages paid by these mills was the rate current in the country in 1830 and in 1884, while each spindle and loom has become vastly more effective, we see by chart number 19 that the average production of each operative constantly increased from 4,321 yards per year in 1830 to 28,032 yards in 1884. And this it was which made possible the corresponding increase in the rate of wages from $164 in 1830 to $290 in 1884. The sum of $290 a year, as an average for each operative, is a stipend too small to cause any general satisfaction, but he must be gloomy indeed who does not see that $290 is a cheerful possession as compared with $164. There is then abundant ground for believing that in the past 50 years the condition of the working classes in the United States has been materially improved. The diminishing proportion of the price which goes to the capital is a significant fact and illustrates the tendency of profits to fall with the increase of capital. The same truth seems to be seen in the table given in a previous chapter where the wages have been increased, but the hours have fallen per day from 13 to 11 since 1840. Section 2. Through small holdings by which the landlord's gain is shared. So far we have considered the chances for improvement in an industrial order in which the present separation of capitalists from laborers is maintained. 
but this does not take into account that future time when cultivation in the united states shall be forced down upon inferior land and no more remains to be occupied and when the capital may no longer increase as fast as population what must be the ultimate outlook for wages receivers or more practically what is the outlook now for those who are wages receivers and for whom a more equitable distribution of the product seems desirable how can they escape the thraldom of dependence on the accumulations of others in this connection and of primary importance is the avenue opened to all holders of small properties to share in the increase which goes to owners of land it has been seen that owners of the soil constantly gain from the inevitable tendencies of industrial progress if one large owner gains why should not the increment be the same if ten owners held the property instead of one the more the land is subdivided the more the vast increase arising from rent will be shared by a larger number this in my opinion is the strongest reason for the encouragement of small holdings in every country the greater the extension of small properties among the working class the more they will gain a share of that part of the product which goes to the owner of land by the persistent increase of population if then the gain arising from improvements is largely passed to the credit of land owners as mr cairns believes it should be absolutely necessary to spread among the working classes the doctrine that if they own their own homes and buy the land they live on to that extent will they grow rich while they sleep independently of their other exertions land worth five hundred dollars today when bought by the savings of a laborer besides the self-respect it gives him will increase in value with the density of population and become worth six hundred or more without other sacrifice of his section three through cooperation by which the manager's wages are shared it will be found however that of the various industrial rewards profits tend to diminish meaning by profits only the interest and insurance given for abstinence and risk in the use of capital but that the manager's wages wages of superintendence are larger than is commonly supposed in relation to other industrial rewards owing to the position of monopoly practically held by such executive ability as is competent to successfully manage large business interests to the laborer this large payment to the manager seems to be paid for the possession of capital this we know now to be wrong the manager's wages are payments of exactly the same nature as any laborer's wages it makes no difference whether wages are paid for manual or mental labor the payment to capital purely as such known as interest with insurance for risk is unmistakably decreasing even in the united states and yet we see men gain by industrial operations enormous rewards but these returns are in their essence solely manager's wages for in many instances as hitherto discussed we have seen that the manager is not the owner of the capital he employs to what does this lead us inevitably to the conclusion that the laborer if he would become something more of a receiver of wages in the ordinary sense must himself move up in the scale of laborers until he reaches the skill and power also to command managers wages the importance of this principle to the working man cannot be exaggerated and there flows from it important consequences to the whole social condition of the lower classes it leads us directly to the means by which the lower classes may raise themselves to a higher position the actual details of which of course are difficult but as they are not included in political economy they must be left to sociology and forms the essential basis of hope for any proper extension of productive cooperation in short cooperation owes its existence to the possibility of dividing the manager's wages to a greater or lesser degree among the so-called wages receivers or the laboring class and it is from this point of view that cooperation is seen more truly and fitly than in any other way 
for it is to be said that in some of its forms cooperation gives the most promising economic results as regards to the condition of the laborer which have yet been reached in the long discussion upon the relations of labor and capital section four distributive cooperation it will be my object then to describe the chief forms in which the cooperative principle has manifested itself these may be said in general to be four one distributive cooperation by which goods already produced are bought and sold to members without the aid of retail dealers two productive cooperation by which associations are formed for producing and manufacturing goods for the market three partial productive cooperation in the form of industrial partnerships between laborers and employers without dispensing with the latter and four cooperative or people's banks there are of course many other forms in which the principle of cooperation has been applied but these four are probably the most characteristic distributive cooperation is at once the simplest and the most successful form not merely because it requires less for capital than any other for its inception but also because it calls for less business and executive capacity the number of persons capable of managing a small retail store is vastly greater than the class fit to assume control of the very complex duties involved in the care of wholesale houses or at all events of mills and factories distributive cooperation has its origin in the fact that the expenses of a middleman between the producer and consumer may be entirely dispensed with and in the fact that more capital had collected in the business of distribution than could economically be so employed its educating power on the men concerned in teaching them to save in showing the needs of business methods and in instilling the elements of industrial management is of no little importance it is therefore the best gateway to any further or more difficult cooperative experiments such experiments as can be attempted only after the proper capital is saved and the necessary executive capacity is discovered or developed by training in england cooperation began its history in distributive stores and has finally led to such a stimulus of self-help in the laborer that now cooperative gymnasiums libraries gardens and other results have proved the wisdom of calling upon the laborers for their own exertions under the system which separates employers and the employed high wages are not found to be the only boon which the receivers could wish for it is sometimes found that the best paid workmen are the most unwise and intemperate for the most ignorant and unskilled of the workmen in the lowest strata the object would seem to be to give not merely more wages but give more in such a way as might excite new and better motives a desire as well as a possibility of improvement self-help must be stimulated not deadened by stifling dependence on a class of superiors or on the state the extraordinary growth of cooperation is one of the most cheering signs of modern times distributive cooperation originated in rochdale in england about eighteen forty four with a few laborers desirous of saving themselves from the high prices paid for poor provisions by uniting they purchased tea by the chest sugar by the hogshead which they sold to each member at market prices they were surprised to find a large profit by the operation which they divided proportionally to the capital subscribed others soon joined them they took a storeroom and in eighteen eighty two there were ten thousand eight hundred and ninety four members with a share capital of one million five hundred and seventy six thousand two hundred and fifteen dollars and with realized profits in that year of a hundred and sixty two thousand eight hundred and eighty five dollars they have erected expensive steam flour mills and the society occupies eighteen branch establishments in rochdale 
libraries containing more than 15,000 volumes and classes in science, language, and the technical arts, attended by 500 students, have been maintained. The extension of the Rochdale store led to the necessity of a wholesale establishment of their own. It is now a large institution with branches in London and Newcastle. It owns manufactories in London, Manchester, Newcastle, Leicester, Durham, and Crumpsall, and it has depots in Cork, Limerick, Kilmallock, Waterford, Tipperary, Tralee, and Armagh for the purchase of butter, potatoes, and eggs. It has buyers in New York and Copenhagen, and it owns two steamships. It has a banking department with a turnover of more than 12 million annually. The following figures for England and Wales tell their own story as to the progress of cooperation. The table shows the number of members in 1862 as 90,000 and in 1881 as 525,000. The capital share in 1862 was 428,000 and in 1881, 5,881,000. Capital loan was 55,000 in 1862 and 1,267,000 in 1881. Sales in 1862 was 2,333,000 and sales in 1881 were 20,901,000. The net profit for 1862 was 165,000. The net profit for 1881 was 1,617,000. Several persons each subscribe a sum to make up the share capital of a store, and a person is selected to take charge of the purchase and care of the goods. The advantages of the plan are, one, a division among the cooperators of all the net profits of the retail trade, two, a saving in advertisements, since members are always purchasers without solicitation, three, no loss by bad debts, since only cash sales are permitted, and four, Security against fraud is to the character of the goods, because there is no inducement to make gains by adulterations. It is often found that the capital is turned over ten times in the course of a year, while the cost of management in the wholesale Rochdale stores does not amount to one per cent on the returns. The arrangement of obligations in due order of their priority, which has been recommended by Mr. Holyoke, is as follows. Of funds in the store, payments should be made, one, of the expenses of management, two, of interest due on all loans, three, of an amount equal to 10% of the value of the fixed stock to cover the annual depreciation from wear and tear, four, of dividends on the subscribed capital of the members, five, of such a sum as may be necessary for an extension of the business, six of two and a half percent of the remaining profit after all the above items are provided for for educational purposes and seven of the residue and that only among all the persons employed and members of the store in proportion to the amount of their wages or of their respective purchases during the quarter the payments of dividends to customers on their purchases seems now to be considered an essential element of success Section 5. Productive Cooperation Productive cooperation presents many serious difficulties, the chief of which is the need of managing ability. Some one in the association must know the wholesale markets well, the expectation of crops connected with his materials used, the proper time to buy. He must know the processes of the special production thoroughly, the best machinery, the best adaptation of labor to the given end. He must know the whims of purchasers and be ready to change his products accordingly. In short, a man eminently fitted for success in his own factory is essential to the profitable management of one belonging to a body of co-operators. It has been already seen how large a variation in profit is due to managers' wages and it is very often only his skill, prudence, and experience that make the difference between a failure and a success in business. 
unless co-operators are willing to pay as large a sum for the services of a good manager as he can get in his own establishment, they cannot secure the talent which will make their venture succeed. In France, the national workshops of Louis Blanc, established in 1848, were a failure. Nowhere has it been more clearly seen that state help has been disastrous than in France, where the Constituent Assembly voted three million francs for cooperative experiments, all of which failed. Curiously enough, distributive cooperation has not succeeded in France because, owing to a widespread dislike of the wages system, workmen will try nothing less than productive schemes. And their success in this has been no greater than might be expected when inexperience is put to a task beyond its powers. In Great Britain and the United States there have been some successful experiments in production, and Mr. Holyoke holds that, although workmen certainly do begrudge the manager's salary, productive associations are possible when managed by a board of elected directors. He urges, moreover, that, as in distributive cooperation, if profits are shared with customers, there will be ensured both popularity and continuity of custom without the cost of advertising, and such expenses as those of travelers and commissions. The plan of actual operations upon which successes have been reached in England seems to be briefly this. 1. To save capital, chiefly through cooperative associations. 2. To purchase or lease premises. 3. To engage managers, accountants, and officers at the ordinary salaries which such men can command in the market according to their ability. 4. To borrow capital on the credit of the association. 5. To pay upon capital subscribed by members the same rate of interest as that upon borrowed capital. 6. To regard as profit only that which remains after making payment for rent, materials, wages, all business outlays, and interest on the capital. And 7. To divide the profits according to the salaries of all officers, wages of workmen, and purchases of customers. Those mills and factories which have sprung out of the extension of distributive associations, as at Rochdale, seem, and naturally so, to have been most successful. They have gradually trained themselves somewhat for the work, and their customers were beforehand secured. That is, where the difficulties of the manager's functions have been lessened, they have a better chance of success. And yet, it must be said, that productive associations will gain largely from the efficiency of the labor when working for its own interest. And this is an important consideration to be urged in favor of such associations. The Sun Mill at Oldham, England, was established for spinning cotton in 1861 by the exertions of some cooperative bodies. Beginning with a share capital of $250,000 and a loan capital of a like amount, it set 80,000 spindles into operation. In 1874, they had a share capital of $375,000, all subscribed except $1,000, and an equal amount of loan capital, while the whole plant was estimated as worth $615,000. 2.5% per annum has been set apart for the depreciation in the value of the mill, and 7.5% for the machinery, so that in the first 10 years, a total sum of $160,000 was set aside for depreciation of the property. The profits have varied from 2 to 40%, and while only 5% interest was paid on the loan capital, large dividends were made on the share capital. During the last few years, the Sun Mill has, on an average, realized a profit of 12.5%, although it is known that the cotton trade has suffered during this time from a serious depression. Many experiments, however, have proved failures, and sometimes when they are successful, as in the case of the Hatters Association in Newark, New Jersey, the workmen have no desire to share their benefits with others and practically form a corporation by themselves. The mere fact that they do sometimes succeed is an important thing. Then, too, they have an opportunity of securing by salaries that executive ability in the community which exists separate from the possession of capital. 
and in these days in large corporations the manager is not necessarily although he often is a large owner of capital the last annual report of the cooperative congress eighteen eighty two shows the existence in england and scotland of productive associations for the manufacture of cloth fannel faustian hosiery quilts worsted nails watches linen and silk as well as those for engineering printing and quarrying and these were but a few of them in the united states there have been some successes as well as failures in january eighteen seventy two a number of machinists and other working men organized in the town of beaver falls pennsylvania a cooperative foundry association for the manufacture of stoves hollowware and fine castings on a small capital of only four thousand dollars they have steadily prospered, paid the market rate of wages, and also paid annual dividends, over and above all expenses and interest on the plant, of from 12 to 15 percent. In 1867, 30 workmen started a cooperative foundry in Somerset, Massachusetts, with a capital of about $14,000. In the year 1874 1875, the company spent $5,400 for new flasks and patterns, and yet showed a net gain of $11,914. In 1876, it had a capital of $30,000 and a surplus fund of $28,924. Section 6. Industrial Partnership The difficulties of productive cooperation arising from the need of skilled management, together with the existing unsatisfactory relation between employers and laborers, when wholly separate from each other, have led to a most promising plan of industrial partnership by which the manager retains the control of the business operations, but shares his profits with the workmen. The gain through increased efficiency, greater economy, and superior workmanship recoups the manager for the voluntary subtraction from his share, and yet the laborers receive an additional share. But more than this, it educates the laborer in industrial methods, discloses the difficulties of management, and stimulates him to saving habits and greater regularity of work. This system is particularly adapted to reaching those laborers who would not themselves rise to the demands of productive cooperation. The principle was tried on one of the Belgian railways. Ninety-five kilograms of coke were consumed for every league of distance run, but this was known to be more than necessary. But how to remedy the evil was the problem. A bonus of three and a half pennies on every hectoliter of coke saved on this average of ninety-five to the league was offered to the men concerned, and this trifling bonus worked the miracle. The work was done equally well or better with 48 kilograms of coke instead of 95, just one half, or nearly, saved by careful work, at an expense of probably less than one-tenth of the saving. The experiment which has attracted most attention in the past has been that of the Misters Briggs at their collieries in Yorkshire, England. The relations between the owners and the laborers were as bad as they could well be. All coal masters is devils, and Briggs is the prince of devils, ran the talk of the miners, when they did not choose to send letters threatening to shoot the owners. In 1865, Mr. Briggs tried the plan of an industrial partnership with their men purely from business considerations. Seventy percent of the cost of raising coal consisted of wages, and fully 15% of materials which were habitually wasted. The whole property was valued and divided into shares of $50 each, of which the owners retained two-thirds, together with the control of the business. The remaining one-third of the shares was offered to the employees. If any subscriber was too poor to pay $50 for a share, the subsequent dividends and payments were to be applied to purchasing the share, after reserving a fair allowance for expenses, like the redemption of capital, whenever the remaining profits exceeded 10% on the capital, the excess was to be divided into two equal parts, one of which was to be distributed among all persons employed by the company in proportion to their wages, and the other 
was to be retained by the capital. In previous years, but once had they made 10% profit on their capital, and twice only 5%. In the first year after the new system came into operation, the total profits were 14%, and the 4% of excess was divided, two to the laborer's bonus, and two to the capital, so that capital received 12%. In the second year, the profits were 16%. In the third year, 17%. The first year, the work people received, in addition to their wages, $9,000. In the second, $13,500. In the third, $15,750. The morale effect was striking. Work was done regularly. Forbearance was exercised habits improved, and the faces of the men were set toward improvement in life. The scheme worked successfully for years, but was finally ended by the pressure of the outside trades unions, who compelled the workmen to give up the arrangement. A similar experiment was tried by the Misters Brewster carriage manufacturers of New York. They offered to their workmen 10% of their profits, before any allowance was made for interest on the capital invested, or before any payment was made for the services of the firm as managers. In one year, as much as $11,000 was divided among the laborers. Again, as in the case of Briggs Colliery, the experiment was brought to an end by an unreasoning submission to the pressure of outside workmen during a strike. But all in all, Industrial partnership offers a great field for that kind of improvement which is worth more than a mere increase of wages and seems to make it possible to reach the heavy weight of sluggishness among the lower and more hopeless strata of society. And it is possible that it will stir in them the powers which may afterward find employment in the harder problems of productive cooperation. Section 7. People's Banks in Germany, the struggle between the two theories, self-help and state-help, was fought out by Schulze de Litsch, that is, Schulze of de Litsch, a town in Saxony, and La Salle, and the victory given to the former. Schulze de Litsch, as a consequence, was successful in directing the cooperative principle in Germany to giving workmen credit in purchasing tools, etc., when he had no security but his character. This form of cooperation works to give the energetic and industrious workmen a lever, by which, through the possession of credit, they can raise themselves to the position of small capitalists, and thus widen the field of possible improvement. While the former schemes of cooperation described above have given the wage receivers a share of the unearned increment from land, and tend to give them a share of the manager's wages, the plan of Schulze was to assist them to gain a share in the advantages belonging to the possession of capital. The capital was to be accumulated by their own exertions, and, in his scheme, depended on the principle of self-help. The following is the plan of banks adopted. Every member is obliged to make a certain weekly payment into the common stock, as soon as it reaches a certain sum, he is allowed to raise a loan exceeding his share, and the inverse ratio of the amount of his deposit. For instance, after he has deposited one dollar, he is allowed to borrow five or six, but if he had deposited twenty dollars, he is allowed only to borrow thirty. The security he is compelled to offer is his own, and that of two other members of the association, who become jointly and severally liable. He may have no assets whatever beyond the amount of his deposits, nor may his guarantors. The bank relies simply on the character of the three, and the two securities rely on the character of their principal. And the remarkable fact is that the security has been found sufficient, that the interest of the men in the institutions and the fear of the opinion of their fellows has produced a display of honesty and punctuality such as perhaps is not to be found in the history of any other banking institution. Such is the confidence inspired by these institutions, that they hold on deposit 
or as loans from third parties an amount exceeding by more than three-fourths the total amount of their own capital the monthly contributions of the members may be as low as ten cents but the amount which each member is allowed to have in some banks is not more than seven or eight dollars and none more than three hundred dollars he has a right to borrow to the full amount of his deposit without giving security if he desires to borrow a larger sum, he must furnish security in the manner we have described. The liability of the members is unlimited. The plan of limiting the liability to the amount of the capital deposited was tried at first, but it inspired no confidence, and the enterprise did not succeed till every member was made generally liable. Each member on entering is obliged to pay a small fee, which goes toward forming or maintaining a reserve fund, apart from the active capital. The profits are derived from the interest paid by borrowers, which amounts to from 8 to 10 percent, which may not sound very large in our ears, but in Germany is very high. Not over 5 percent is paid on capital borrowed from outsiders. All profits are distributed in dividends among the members of the association in the proportion of the amount of their deposits, after the payment of the expenses of management, of course, and an apportionment of a certain percentage to the reserve fund. Every member, as we have said, has a right to borrow to the extent of his deposit without security, but then if he seeks to borrow more, whether he shall obtain any loan, and if so, how large a one, is decided by the Board of Management, who are guided in making their decisions just as all bank officers are, by a consideration of the circumstances of the bank as well as those of the borrower. All the affairs of the association are discussed and decided in the last resort by a general assembly composed of all the members. The main part of the capital loaned by the banks is obtained from outside sources on the credit of the associations. In 1865, there were 961 of these institutions in Germany. In 1877, there were 1,827 with over a million members, owning $40 million of capital, with 100 million more on loan and doing a business of five hundred and fifty million dollars end of chapter five book four end of book four of principles of political economy end of section forty eight